Preface of Football Days This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Honored and beloved by hosts of friends, you represented the highest ideals of American football, not only in life, but in his death upon the battlefield in France. As I think of him, the stern lines of Henry Newbolt come to me as a fitting eulogy. Vida Lampada. There's a breath that's hurt in the close tonight, tend to make in the match to win, a bump in pitch and a binding light, an hour to play in the last man in. And it's not for the sake of a ribbon coat, or the selfish hope of a season's fame, but his captain's hand on his shoulder smoke, play up, play up and play the game. The sand of the desert is sun and red, red with the wreck of the square that broke, the gathering jammed and the colonel dead, and the regiment blind with dust and smoke. The river of death has brimmed its banks, and England's far in honor and name, but the voice of a schoolboy rises the ranks, play up, play up, and play the game. This is the word that year by year, one her place of school is set, Every one of the sons must hear, and none that hears it dare forget. Thus they all with a joyful mind, marry their life like a torch in flame, and failing fling to the host behind, play up, play up, and play the game. Greeting I value more highly than any other athletic gift I have ever received the Princeton Football Championship banner that hangs on my wall. It was given to me by a friend who sent three boys to Princeton. It's a duplicate of the one that hangs in the trophy room of the gymnasium there. How often have I gazed longingly at the names of my loyal teammates inscribed upon it. Many times have I run over in my mind the part that each member played on the memorable occasion when that banner was won. Memories clutch are about that token that are dear and sacred to me. I see before me not only the faces of the team, but the faces of the men of other years and other universities who have contributed so much to the great game of football. I recall the preparatory school days and the part that football played in our school and college careers. Again I see the athletic fields and the dressing rooms. I hear the earnest pleading of the coaches. I see the teams run out upon the field and hear the cheering throng. The coin is tossed in the air. The shrill brats of the referee's whistle signals the game to start. The ball is kicked off and the contest is on. The thousands of spectators watch breathlessly. For the time, the whole world is forgotten except for the issue being fought out there before them. But we are not dressed in football suits nowadays. We are on the sidelines. We have a different part to play. Years have compelled a change in spirit, however, we are still in the game. It is to share these memories with all true lovers of football and pay a tribute to the heroes of the gridiron who are no longer with us that have undertaken this volume. Let us together retrace the days in which we lived, days of preparation, days of victory, days of defeat. Let us also look into the faces of some of the football heroes of years ago and recall the achievements that made them famous. And let us recall, too, the men of the years just past who have so nobly upheld the traditions of the American game of football and helped to place it on its present high plane. William Edwards. Prologue. They say that no man ever made a successful football player who was lacking in any quantity of imagination. If this be true, in time and again it has been true, then there is no more fitting dedication to a book dealing with the gridiron heroes of the past than to a man like Johnny Poe. For football is the abandon of body and mind to the 
obsession of the spirit that knows no obstacle, counts no danger, and for the time being is dull and callous to physical pain or exhaustion. It is a something that makes one see visions as Johnny saw them. There is no sport in the world that brings out unselfishness as does this great gridiron game of ours. Every fall, second and scrub teams throughout the country sacrifice themselves only to let others enter the promised land of victory. It is a strange thing, but one almost never hears any real football player criticize another's making the team, either his own or an All-American. Although the player in this sport appreciates the loyal support of the thousands on the stands, every man realizes that his checks on the bank of cheers can never be cast unless there is a deposit of hard work and practice. Perhaps all this in an indistinct and indefinite way explains why football players, the country over, understand each other, that when the game is attacked for any reason they stand shoulder to shoulder in defense of what they know down in the bottom of their hearts as such an influence on character building. And there is no one better fitted to tell the story of this and of the gridiron heroes than Big Bill Edwards known not only as a player, but far and wide as one of the best officials that ever handled the game. A square deal and overruffing was his model, and every but one realized it and accepted every decision unquestionably. His association with players in so many angles has given him a particular insight into the sport, and it has enabled him to tell this story as no one else could. And what names to conjure with? The which a blows and a shadowy hoax springs into action before one's mitzy eyes. Alex Moffat, the star of Kickers, Etto Cohen, Heffinger, Gordon Brown, Mon Nell, Traxon Hare, Glass, Neil Snow, and Shelvin, Giants of Linemen. But I must stop before I trespass upon what Bill Edwards will do better. Here's to them, all forty years of heroes. Walter Camp. End of the preface of Football Days. Chapter One of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Rye Football Days by William Edwards Chapter 1 Prep School Days To every man there comes a moment that marks the turning point in his career. For me it was a certain Saturday morning in the autumn of 1891. As I look back upon it across the years, I feel something of the same thrill that stirred my boyish blood that day and opened a door through which I looked into a new world. I had just come to the city, a country boy, from my home in Lyle, New York, to attend the Horace Mann School. As I walked across Madison Square, I glanced toward the old Fifth Avenue Hotel, where my eyes fell upon the scene depicted in the accompanying picture. Almost before I was aware of it, my curiosity led me to mingle with the crowd surging in and out of the hotel, and I learned by questioning the bystanders that it was the headquarters of the Yale team, which that afternoon was to play Princeton at the Polo Grounds. The players were about to leave the hotel for the field, and I hurried inside to catch a glimpse of them. The air was charged with enthusiasm, and I soon caught the infection, although it was all new to me then, of the vital power of college spirit which later so completely dominated my life. I recall with vividness how I lingered and waited for something to happen. Men were standing in groups, and all eyes were centered upon the heroes of the team. Everyone was talking football. Some of the names heard then have never been forgotten by me. There was the giant Helfelfinger, whom everyone seemed anxious to meet. I was told that he was the crack Yale guard. I looked at him, and then and there, I joined the hero worshippers. I also remember Lee LeClung, the Yale captain, who seemed to realize the responsibilities that rested upon his shoulders. There was an air of restraint about him. In later years, he became treasurer of the United States, and his signature was upon the country's currency. 
My most vivid recollection of him will be, however, as he stood there that day in the corridor of the famous old hotel on the day of the great football conflict with Princeton. Then Sanford was pointed out to me, the Yale center rush. I recall his eagerness to get out to the bus and be on his way to the field. When the starting signal was given by the captain, Sanford's huge form was in the front rank of the crowd that poured out upon the sidewalk. The whole scene was intensely thrilling to me, and I did not leave until the last player had entered the bus and it drove off. Crowds of Yale men and spectators gave the players cheer after cheer as they rolled away. The flags with which the bus was decorated waved in the breeze, and I watched them with indescribable fascination until they were out of sight. The noise made by the Yale students I learned afterwards was college cheering, and college cheers, once heard by a boy, are never forgotten. Many in that throng were going to the game. I could not go, but the scene that I had just witnessed gave me an inspiration. It stirred something within me, and down deep in my soul there was born a desire to go to college. I made my way directly to the YMCA gymnasium, then at the corner of 4th Avenue and 23rd Street. Athletics had for me a greater attraction than ever before, and from that day I applied myself with increased enthusiasm to the work of the gymnasium. The following autumn I entered St. John's Military Academy at Manlius, New York, a short distance from my old home. I was only 17 years of age and weighed 217 pounds. Former Adjutant General William Verbeck, then Colonel Verbeck, was headmaster. Before I was fairly settled in my room, the colonel had drafted me as a candidate for the football team. I wanted to try for the team, and was as eager to make it as he evidently was to have me make it. But I did not have any football togs, and the supply at the school did not contain any large enough. So I had to have some built for me. The day they arrived, much to my disappointment, I found the trousers were made of white canvas. Their newness was appalling and I pictured myself in them with feelings of dismay. I robbed them of their whiteness that night by mopping up a lot of mud with them behind the gymnasium. When they had dried, by morning, they looked like a pair of real football trousers. George Reddington of Yale was our football coach. He was full of contagious fire. Reddington seemed interested in me and gave me much individual coaching. Colonel Verbeck matched him in love of the game. He not only believed in athletics, but he played at the end of the second team, and it was pretty difficult for the boys to get the best of him. They made an unusual effort to put the colonel out of the plays, but try as hard as they might, he generally came out on top. The result was a decided increase in the spirit of the game. We had one of the best preparatory schools in that locality, but owing to our distance from the larger preparatory schools, we were forced to play Syracuse, Hobart, Hamilton, Rochester, Colgate, and Casanova Seminary, all of whom we defeated. We also played against the Syracuse Athletic Association, whose team was composed of professional athletes as well as former college players. Bert Hansen, who had been a great center at Yale, was one of this team. Old Yale Heroes, Lee McClung's team. Recalling the men who played on our St. John's team, I am confident that if all of them had gone to college, most of them would have made the varsity. In fact, some did. It was decided that I should go to Lawrenceville School en route to Princeton. It was on the trip from Trenton to Lawrenceville in the big stagecoach loaded with boys I got my first dose of homesickness. The prospect of new surroundings made me yearn for St. John's. The blue hour of boyhood, however, is a brief one. I was soon engaged in conversation with a little fellow who was sitting beside me and who began discussing the ever popular subject of football. He was very inquisitive and wanted to know if I had ever played the game and if I was going to try for the team. He told me about the great game Lawrenceville played with the Princeton University the year before, when Lawrenceville scored six points before Princeton realized what they were really up against. He fascinated me by his graphic description. There was a glowing account of the playing of Gary Cochran, the great captain of the Lawrenceville team who had just graduated and gone to Princeton, together with Sport Armstrong, the giant tackle. These men were sure to live in Lawrenceville's history, if for nothing else than the part they played in that notable game, although Princeton rallied and won 8-6. to six. It was not long before I learned that my newly made friend was Billy McGibbon, a member of the Lawrenceville baseball team. Just wait until you see Charlie DeSalt and Billy Dibble play behind the line, he went on, and from that moment I began to be a part of the new life, the threshold of which I was crossing. Strangely enough, the memory of getting settled in my new quarters faded with the eventful moment when the call for candidates came, and I went out with the rest of the boys to try for the team. Competition was keen, and many candidates offered themselves. I was placed on the scrub team. 
One of my first attempts for supremacy was in the early part of the season when I was placed as right guard of the scrub against Perry Wentz, an old star player of the school and absolutely sure of his position. I recall how on several occasions the first team could not gain as much distance through the second as the men desired, and Wentz, who later on distinguished himself on the varsity at Princeton and still later as a crack player on Pennsylvania, seemed to have trouble in opening up my position. Max Rudder, the Lawrenceville captain, with the directness that usually characterizes such officers, called this fact to Wentz's attention. Wentz, who probably felt naturally his pride of football fame, became quite angry at Rudder's remark that he was being outplayed. He took off his nose guard, threw it on the ground, and left the field. Rudder moved me over to the first team in Wentz's place. That night there was a general upset on the team, which was settled amicably, however, and the next day Wentz continued playing in his old place. The position of guard was given to me on the other side of the line, George Cadwallader being moved out of the position of tackle. This was the same Cadwallader who subsequently went to Yale and made a great name for himself on the gridiron, in spite of the fact that he remained at New Haven but one year. It was here at Lawrenceville that this great player made his reputation as a goal kicker, a fame that was enhanced during his football days at Yale. Max Rudder, the captain of the Lawrenceville team, went to Williams and played on the varsity, eventually becoming captain there also. Ned Moffat, nephew of Princeton's great Alex Moffat, played end rush. About this time, I began to realize that Billy McGibbon had given me a correct line on Charlie DeSaw and Billy Dibble. These two players worked wonderfully well together and were an effective scoring machine with the assistance of Doc McNider and Dave Davis. During these days at Lawrenceville, Owen Johnson gathered the material for those interesting stories in which he used his old schoolmates for the characters. The thin disguise of Doc McNuder does not, however, conceal Doc McNider from his old schoolboy friends. The same is true of the slightly changed names of Gary Cochran, Turk Ryder, Charlie DeSaw, and Billy Dibble. Charlie DeSaw, after graduation, went to Yale and continued his wonderful, spectacular career on the gridiron. We will spend an afternoon with him on the Yale field later. Billy Dibble went to Williams and played a marvelous game until he was injured early in his freshman year. It was during those days that I met Gary Cochran, Sport Armstrong, and other Princeton coaches for the first time. They used to come over to assist in coaching our team. Our regular coaches at Lawrenceville were Walter B. Street, who had been a famous football star years before at Williams, and William J. George, renowned in Princeton football history as a center rush. I cannot praise the work of these men too highly. They are thoroughbreds in every sense of the word. It was one of the old traditions of Lawrenceville football to have a game every year with Pennington Seminary. What man is there who attended either school who does not recall the spirit of these old-time contests? The Hill School was another of our football rivals. The trip to Pottstown, Pennsylvania was an event eagerly looked forward to. So also was the Hill School's return game at Lawrenceville. The rivalry between the two schools was keen. Everything possible was done at the Hill School to make our visit a pleasant one. The score of 28-0, to 0, by which Lawrenceville won the game that year, made it especially pleasant. As I recall that trip, two men stand out in my memory. One was John Meigs, the headmaster. The other was Mike Sweeney, the trainer and athletic director. They were the two central figures of Hill School traditions. Interest in football was emphasized at that time by the approaching game with Andover at Lawrenceville. This was the first time that these two teams had ever played. Andover was probably more renowned in football annals than any school Lawrenceville had played up to this time. The Lawrenceville coaches realized that the game would be a strenuous one. After a conference, the two coaches decided that it would be wise to see Andover play at Andover the week before we were to play them. Accordingly, Mr. George went to Andover, and when he returned, he gathered the team around him in one of the recitation halls and described carefully the offense and defense of our coming opponents. He also demonstrated with checkers what each man did in every play and placed emphasis on the work of Eddie Holt, who was acting captain of the Andover team. To represent Holt's giant build, he placed one checker on top of another, saying, as I remember with great seriousness, This topped checker represents Holt. He must be taken care of, and it will require two Lawrenceville men to stop him on every play. I am certain of this, for Holt was a marvel last Saturday. During the week, we drilled secretly and most earnestly in anticipation of defeating Andover. The game attracted an unusually large number of spectators. Lawrenceville made it a gala day for its alumni, and all the old Andover and Lawrenceville boys who could get there witnessed the game. When the Andover team ran out upon the field, we were all anxious to see how Big Holt loomed up. 
He certainly was a giant and towered high above the other members of his team. Soon the whistle blew and the trouble was on. In memory now, I can see Billy Dibble circling Andover's end for 25 yards, scoring a touchdown amid tremendous excitement. This all transpired during the first minute and a half of play. Emerson once said, we live by moments, and the first minute and a half of that game must stand out as one of the eventful periods in the life of every man who recalls that day of play. No grown-up schoolboy can fail to appreciate the scene or miss the wave of boyish enthusiasm that rolled over the field at this unlooked-for beginning of a memorable game between schoolboys. We beat Andover. This wonderful start of the Lawrenceville team was a goading spur to its opponents. Johnny Barnes, an ex-Lawrenceville boy now quarterback on the Andover team, seemed fairly inspired as he urged his team on. Eddie Holt was called upon time and again. He was making strong advances aided by French, Hine, and Porter. Together they worked out a touchdown, but Lawrenceville rallied and for the rest of the game their teamwork was masterly. Bat Gear, who was later a Princeton varsity player, Charlie DeSaw and Billy Dibble each scored touchdowns, making three altogether for their school. Thus Lawrenceville, with a score of 20 to 6, stepped forth into a new era and entered the larger football world where she was to remain and increase her heroic accomplishments in after years. It is needless to say that the night following this victory was a crowning one in our preparatory football experiences. Bonfires were lighted, speeches were the order of the hour, and members of the team were the guests of honor at a banquet in the upper house. There was no rowdy revelry by night to spoil the memory of the occasion. It was just one simple, fine, and fitting celebration of a wholesome school victory on the field of football. Last year at Lawrenceville. It was up to Billy Dibble, the new captain, to bring about another championship. We were to play Andover a return game there. Captain Dibble was left with but three of last year's team as a foundation to build on. Dibble's team made a wonderful record. He was a splendid example for the team to follow, and his playing, his enthusiasm, and earnest efforts contributed much toward the winning of the Andover, Princeton, Freshman, and Hill School games. There appeared at Lawrenceville a new coach who assisted Street and George. He was none other than the famous Princeton halfback Douglas Ward, whose record as an honored man in the classroom, as well as on the football field, was well known to all of us, and had stood out among college athletes as a wonderful example. He was very modest. I recall that someone once asked him how he made the only touchdown against Yale in the 93 game. His reply was, oh, somebody just pushed me over. Fresh in my memory is the wonderful trip that we boys made to Andover. We were proud of the fact that the Colonial Express was especially ordered to stop at Trenton for us, and as we took our seats in the Pullman car, we realized that our long-looked-for expedition had really begun. We had a great deal of fun on the trip to Boston. Good old George Cadwallader was the center of most of the jokes. His 215 pounds added to the discomfort of a pair of pointed patent leather shoes, which were far too small for him. As soon as he was settled into the train, he removed them and dozed off to sleep. Turk Ryder and some of the other fun makers tied the shoestrings together and hung them out the window, where they blew noisily against the window pane. When we arrived in Jersey City, it was a big treat for us to see our train put aboard the ferry boat of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, and as we sailed down the bay, up the East River, and under the Brooklyn Bridge to the New Haven docks, it all seemed very big and wonderful. When the train stopped at New Haven, we were met by the Yale Lawrenceville men, who wished us the best of luck, some of them making the trip with us to Boston. When we arrived in Andover the next day, I had the satisfaction of seeing my brother and cousin, who were at the time attending Andover Academy. The hospitality that was accorded the Andover team while at Lawrenceville the year before was repaid in royal fashion. We had ample time to view the grounds and buildings and grow keen in anticipation and interest in the afternoon's contest. When the whistle blew, we were there for business. My personal opponent was a fellow named Hillebrand, who besides being a football player was Andover's star pitcher. Later on we became the best of friends and side partners on the Princeton team and often spoke of our first meeting when we played against each other. Hillebrand was one of the greatest athletes Andover ever turned out. Lawrenceville defeated Andover in one of the hardest and most exciting of all prep school contests, one that was uncertain from beginning to end. Billy Dibble played the star game of the day, and after eight minutes he scored a touchdown. Cadwallader booted the ball over the goal, and the score was 6-0. to zero. The Lawrenceville backfield, made up of Powell, Dave Davis, Cap Kafer, and Dibble, worked wonderfully well. 
Kafer did some excellent punting against his remarkable opponent, Barker, who seemed to be as expert as he. The efficient work of Hillebrand and of Chadwell, the colored inrush, stands out preeminently. The latter player developed into one of the best inrushes that ever played at Williams. Goodwin, Barker, and Greenway contributed much to Andover's good play. Jim Greenway is one of the famous Greenway boys whose athletic history at Yale is a matter of record. A few minutes later, the Andover crowd were aroused by Goodwin making the longest run of the game, 55 yards, scoring Andover's first touchdown and making the score 6-6. Six to six. There was great speculation as to which team would win the game, but Billy Dibble, aided by the wonderful interference on the part of Babe Eddy, who afterward played end on the Yale team, and Emerson, who, had he gone to college, would have been a wonder, made a touchdown. George Cadwallader, with his sure foot, made the score 12-6. to six. Enthusiasm was at its height. Andover rooters were calling upon their team to tie the score. A touchdown and goal would mean a tie. The Andover team seemed to answer the call, for soon Goodwin scored a touchdown, making the score 12-10. to 10. And Butterfield, Andover's right halfback, was put to the test amidst great excitement. The ball went just to the side of the goalpost, and Lawrenceville had won 12-10. to 10. Great is the thrill of a victory, won on an opponent's field. That night after dinner, as I was sitting in my brother's room with some of his Andover friends, there was a yell from outside and a loud knock on the door. In walked a big fellow wearing a blue sweater. Through his open coat, one could observe the big white letter A. It proved to be none other than Doc Hillebrand. Without one word of comment, he walked over to where I was sitting and said, Edwards, what was the score of the game today? I could not get the idea at all. I said, why, you ought to know. He replied, 12 to 10, and turning on his heel, left the room. This caused a good deal of amusement, but it was soon explained that Hillebrand was being initiated into a secret society and that this was one of the initiation stunts. It was a wonderfully happy trip back to Lawrenceville. The spirit ran high. It was then that Turk Ryder wrote the well-known Lawrenceville verse, which we sang again and again. Cap kicked, Barker kicked. Cap, he got the best of it. They both kicked together, but Cap kicked very hard. Bill ran, Dave ran, then Andover lost her grip. She also lost her championship. Sis, boom, ah. As we were about two miles outside of Lawrenceville, we saw a massive light in the roadway, and when we heard the boys yelling at the top of their voices, we realized that the school was having a torchlight procession and coming to welcome us. Great is that recollection. They took the horses off and dragged the stage back to Lawrenceville and in and about the campus. It was not long before the whole school was singing the song of success that Turk Ryder had written. A big celebration followed. We did not break training because we had still another game to play. When Lawrenceville had beaten the Hill School 20-0, to zero, many of us realized that we had played our last game for Lawrenceville. George Cadwallader was shortly afterward elected captain for the coming year. It was at this time that Lawrenceville was overjoyed to learn that Gary Cochran, a sophomore at Princeton, had been elected captain of the Princeton Varsity. This recalled former Lawrenceville boys Pop Warren and Doggy Trenchard, who had played at Lawrenceville, gone to Princeton, and become varsity captains there. Snake Ames also prepared at Lawrenceville. I might incidentally state that we stayed at Lawrenceville until June to get our diplomas. Realizing that there were many able fellows to continue the successful traditions of Lawrenceville football, George Mattis, Howard Richards, Jack DeSaw, Cliff Bucknam, John DeWitt, Bummy Ritter, Dana Kafer, John Dana, Charlie Dudley, Hef Herring, Charlie Raymond, Bigelow, the Waller Brothers, and others. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Football Days》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Rye. — Football Days by William Edwards — Chapter Two — Freshman Year I believe that every man who has had the privilege of going to college will agree with me that as a freshman lands in a college town, he is a very happy and interested individual. The newness of things and his freedom are very attractive. He comes to college fresh from his school day experiences, ready to conform himself to the traditions and customs of the new school, his college choice. The world will never again look quite so big to a boy as it did then. Entering as boys do in the fall of the year, 
The uppermost thing in mind, outside of the classroom, is football. Sometimes it is the uppermost thought in the classroom. What kind of a varsity football team are we going to have? This is the question heard on all sides. Every bit of available football material is eagerly sought by the coaches. I recall so well my freshman year at Princeton how Gary Cochran, captain of the football team, went about the college with Johnny Poe looking over the undergraduates and watching the incoming train for football possibilities. If a fellow looked as though he might have good material to work upon, he was asked to report to the varsity field the next day. All athletic interests are focused on the gridiron. The young undergraduate, who has no likelihood of making the team, fills himself with facts about the individuals who are trying to win a place. He starts out to be a loyal rooter, realizing that next to being a player, the natural thing is to attend practice and cheer the team in their work. He becomes interested in the individual progress each candidate is making. In this way, the members of the team know that they have the support of the college, and this makes them play harder. This builds up college spirit. Every college has its own freshman and sophomore traditions. One at Princeton is that shortly after college opens, there must be a rush about the cannon between the freshman and sophomore classes. All those who have witnessed this sight know that it is a vital part of Princeton undergraduate life. On that night in my freshman year, great care was taken by Cochran that none of the incoming football material engaged in the rush. No chances were taken of injuring a good football prospect among other freshmen or sophomores. Eddie Holt, Burt Wheeler, Arthur Poe, Doc Hillebrand, Bummy Booth, and I were in the front ranks of the class of 1900, stationed back at Witherspoon Hall, ready to rush upon the sophomores who were huddled together guarding the cannon. Cochran and his coterie of coaches ran out as we were approaching the cannon and forced us out of the contest. He ordered us to stand on the outside of the surging crowd. There we were allowed to do a little close work, but we were not permitted to get into the heat of the fray. Cochran knew all of us because we were among those who had been called to college before the opening to enter preliminary training. Every football player who has had the experience of being summoned ahead of time will understand my feeling. I was very happy when I received from Cochran during the summer before I entered Princeton a letter inviting me to report to football practice two weeks before college opened. When I arrived at Princeton on the appointed day, I found the candidates for the team at the training quarters. At that time, freshmen were not barred from varsity teams. There was a reunion of friends from Lawrenceville and other schools. There was Doc Hillebrand, against whom I had played in the Andover game the year before. Eddie Holt loomed up, and I recalled him as the big fellow who played on the Andover team against Lawrenceville two years before. He had gone from Andover to Harvard and had played on the Harvard team the year before, and had decided to leave Harvard and enter Princeton. There were Lou Palmer, Bummy Booth, Arthur Poe, Bert Wheeler, Eddie Burke, and many others whom I grew to know well later on. Trainer Jack McMasters was on the job and put us through some very severe preliminary training. It was warm in New Jersey early in September, and often in the middle of practice, Jack would occasionally play the hose on us. It did not take us long to learn that varsity football training was much more strenuous than that of preparatory school. The vigorous program, prepared especially for me, convinced me the McMasters and the coaches had decided that my 224 pounds were too much weight. Jack and I used to meet at the field house four mornings each week. He would array me in thick woolen things and top them off with a couple of sweaters so that I felt as big as a house. He would then take me out for an excursion of eight miles across country, running and walking. Sometimes other candidates kept us company, but only Jack and I survived. On these trips, I would lose anywhere from five to six pounds. I got accustomed to this jaunt and its discomforts after a while, but there was one thing that always aggravated me. While Jack made me suffer, he indulged himself. He would stop at a favorite spring of his, kneel down and take a refreshing drink right before my very eyes, and then, although my throat was parched, he would bar me even from wetting my tongue. He was decidedly unsociable, but from a training standpoint, he was entirely on to his job. As both captain and trainer soon found that I was being overworked, I had some let up of this strenuous system. The extra work in addition to the regular afternoon practice made my days pretty severe going, and when night came, I was not troubled with insomnia. It was during this time that Biffy Lee, one of Princeton's greatest tackles, was slowly but surely making a wonderful tackle out of Doc Hillebrand. Bert Wheeler was making rapid strides to attain the position of halfback. They were the only two freshmen who had made the team that year. I was one of those that failed. We were soon in shape for the first tryout of the season. 
Preliminary training was over, and the team was ready for its first game. We won the Rutgers game 44-0, and after we defeated the Navy, we went to play Lafayette at Easton. I had as my opponent in the Lafayette game, Reinhardt. I shall never forget this game. I was playing left guard alongside Jarvie Gear, who was a substitute for Bill Church, who had been injured in practice the week before and could not play. Just before the first half was over, Lafayette fainted on a kick, and instead of Bray, that star Lafayette fullback, boosting the ball, Barclay shot through the line between Gear and myself for 30 yards. And there was my downfall. Reinhardt had taken care of me beautifully, and finally Nett Poe saved the day by making a beautiful tackle of Barclay, who was fast approaching the Princeton goal line. There was no score made, but the fact that Barclay had made the distance through me made me feel mighty mean. I recall Cochran during intermission when he said, Holt, you take Edwards' place at left guard. The battle between those giants during the second half was a sight worth seeing, and an incident recalled by all those who witnessed the game. Neither side scored, and it was a hard-fought struggle. One day, one play often ruins a man's chances. I had played as a regular in the first three games of the season. I was being tried out and had been found wanting. I had proved a disappointment, and I knew Cocker knew it, and I knew the whole college would know it, but I made up my mind to give the very best I had in me, and hoped to square myself later and make the team. I knew what it was to be humiliated, taken out of the game, and to realize that I had not stood the test. I began to reason it out. Maybe I was carried away with the fact of having played on the varsity team. Maybe I did not give my best. Anyway, I learned much that day. It was my first big lesson of failure in football. That failure and its meaning lived with me. I have always had great respect for Reinhardt and his great teammates. Walbridge and Barclay were a great team in themselves, backed up by Bray at fullback. It was this same team that later in the fall beat Pennsylvania without the services of Captain Walbridge, who had been injured. It was not long after this that Princeton played Cornell at Princeton. I recall the day I first saw Joe Beecham, that popular son of Cornell who afterwards coached West Point. He is now in the regular army, stationed at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He was captain of the Cornell team in 96. He had on his team the famous players Dan Reed, on whom Cornell counts much in these years to assist Al Sharp in the coaching, Tom Fennell, Tausig, and Freeborn. With these stars assisting, Cornell could do nothing with Princeton's great team, and the score 37-0 tells the tale. I was not playing in this game, but recall the following incident. Joe Beecham was making a flying run through the Princeton team. A very pretty girl covered with furs, wearing the red and white of Cornell, was enthusiastically yelling at the top of her voice, Go it, Joe! Go it, Joe! Much to the delight and admiration of the Princeton undergraduates near her. Since then, Joe has told me that this was his sister. Maybe it was, but as Joe was rushing onward with Dan Reed and Tom Fennell interfering wonderfully for him, and urged on by his fond admirer in the grandstand, his progress was rudely halted by the huge form of Edwin Crowdis, which appeared like a cloud on the horizon and projected itself before the oncoming scoring machine of Cornell. When they met, great was the crash, for Crowdis spilled the player, ball and all. This was the time, the place, and the girl, and it meant that Edwin Crowdis had made the Princeton varsity team. I realized it at the moment, and although I knew it would probably put me in the substitute ranks for the rest of the season, I was wild with joy to see Edwin develop at this particular moment and perform his great play. His day had come, his was the reward, and Joe Beecham had been laid low. As for the girl, she subsided abruptly, and is said to have remarked as Crowder smashed the Cornell machine, Well, I never did like a fat man anyway. One day in a practice game against the scrub this year, Gary Cochran, who was standing on the sidelines resting from the result of an injury, became so frantic over the poor showing of the varsity pulled off his sweater and jumped into the game, in spite of the trainer's earnest entreaty not to. He tried to instill a new spirit into the game. It was one of those terrible Monday practice games of which every football player knows. The varsity could not make any substantial gains against the second team, which was unusually strong that year, as most of the varsity substitutes were playing. How frantic Bill Church was. He was playing tackle alongside Edwin Crowdis, against whom I was playing. My chances of making the varsity were getting slimmer. Very few practice days were left before the men would be selected for the final game. I was making the last earnest stand. The varsity linemen were not opening up the scrub as easily as they desired, and we were all stopping up the offensive play of the varsity. I was going through very low and tackling Crowdis around the legs, trying to carry him back into the play. 
Church was very angry at my doing this, and told Crowdis to hit me if I did it again, but Edwin was a good-natured, clean player. In fact, I doubt he ever rough-played any man. Finally, after several plays, Church said, If you don't hit him, I will, and he sure made good on his threat, for on the next play, when I was at the bottom of the heap in the scrimmage, Church handed me one of those stiff Bill Church blows, emphasizing the tribute with his leather thumb protector. There was a lively mix-up, and the scrub and varsity had an open fight. All was soon forgotten, but I still wear an ear, the lobe of which is a constant reminder of Bill Church's spirited play. Nothing ever stood in Church's way. He was a hard player and a powerful tackle. Slowly but surely, Cochran's great team was perfecting itself into a machine. The victory against Harvard at Cambridge was the team's worthy reward for faithful service and attention given to the details of the game. As a reward for service rendered, the second team with the varsity substitutes were taken on the trip, and as we saw the great Princeton team winning, every man was happy and proud of the joy and knowledge of giving something material towards their winning. Sore legs, injuries, and mistakes were at such a time forgotten. All that was felt was the keen sense of satisfaction that comes to men who have helped in the construction. Billy Bernard, aided by superb interference of Fred Smith, was able to make himself the hero of that game by a 45-yard run. Bill Church, the great tackle, broke through the Harvard line and blocked Brown's kick, and the ever-watchful inrush Howard Brokaw fell on the ball for a touchdown. Cochran had been injured and removed from the game, but he was frantic with joy as he walked up and down the Princeton sidelines, urging further touchdowns. A happy crowd of Princetonians wended their way back to Princeton to put the finishing touches on the team before the Yale game. Those of you who recall that 96 game in New York will remember that 6-0 to zero in favor of Yale was the score at the end of the first five minutes. Jim Rogers had blocked Johnny Baird's punt, and Bass, the alert in rush, had pounced on the ball and was over for a touchdown in a moment. Great groans went up from the Princeton grandstand. Could it be that this great acknowledged champion team of Princeton was conceited, overtrained, and about to be defeated? Certainly not, for there arose such a demonstration of team spirit and play as one seldom sees. On the next kickoff, Johnny Baird caught the ball, and when he was about to be tackled, in fact, was lying on the ground, he passed the ball to Fred Smith, that great all-round Princeton athlete who made the most spectacular run of the day. Who will ever forget the wonderful line plunging of Ad Kelly, the brilliant in-running of Bill Bernard, and the great part all the other men on the team contributed towards Princeton's success, and the score grew and grew by touchdown after touchdown, until someone recalled that in this game the team would say, well, we won't give any signals. We'll just try a play through Captain Murphy. Maybe this was the play that put Murphy out of the game. He played against Bill Church, and that was enough exercise for any one man to encounter in one afternoon. As Fred Murphy left the field, everyone realized that it was only his poor physical condition that caused him to give up the game. Yale men recall with great pride how the year before, Murphy had put it all over Bill Church. During that game, however, Church's physical condition was not what it should have been and these two giant tackles never had a chance to play against each other when they were both in prime condition. Both these men were All-American caliber. Johnny Baird, Ad Kelly, Bernard all made touchdowns, and the two successful freshmen who had made the team, Hillebrand and Wheeler, both registered touchdowns against Yale. As the Yale team left the field, they felt the sting of defeat, but there were men who were to have revenge at New Haven the next year against Princeton, among whom were Chadwick, Rogers, and Chamberlain. They were eager enough to get back at us, and the next year they surely did. But this was our year for victory and celebration, and laurels were bestowed upon the victors. Gary Cochran and his loyal teammates were the lions of the day and hour. End of chapter 2「All LibriVox Recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」Recording by Eugene Smith Football Days by William Edwards Chapter 3 Elbow to Elbow I wonder where my shoes are. Who's got my trousers on? I wonder if the tailor mended my jersey. What's become of my headgear? I wonder if the cobbler has put new cleats on my shoes. Somebody must have my stockings on. These are too small. What's become of my ankle brace? Can't seem to find it anywhere. 
I just laid it down here a minute ago. I think that freshman pinched my sweater. All of which is directed to no one in particular, and the trainer, who sits far off in a corner, blowing up a football for the afternoon practice, smiles as the players are fishing for their clothes. Just then the captain, who is dressed earlier than the rest, and has had two or three of the players out on the field for kicking practice, breaks in upon the scene with the remark, Don't you fellows all know you're late? You ought to be dressed long before this. Then follows the big scramble, and soon everybody is out on the field. The trainer is busy keeping his eye open for any man who's being handled too strenuously in the practice. Quick starts are practiced, individual training is indulged in. Kicking and receiving punts play an important part in the preliminary work. At Williams one afternoon, Fred Daly, former Yale captain and coach at Williams, in trying forward passes, instructed his ends to catch them at every angle and height. One man continually fumbled his attempt, just as he thought he had it sure. He was a new man to Daly, and the latter called out to him, "'What's your name?' Back came the reply, which almost broke up the football practice for the day. Ketchum is my name. Falling on the ball is one of the fundamentals in football. It's the groundwork that every player must learn. Frank Hinkey, that great Yale captain and player, was an artist in performing this fundamental. Playing so wonderfully well the end rush position, his alertness in falling on the ball often meant much distance for Yale. He had wonderful judgment in deciding whether to fall on the ball or pick it up. One of the most important things in football is knowing how to tackle properly. Some men take to it naturally, and others only learn after hard, strenuous practice. In the old days, men were taught to tackle by what is known as live tackling. I recall especially that earnest coach, Johnny Poe, whose main object in football coaching was to see that the men tackled hard and sure. Poe, without any padding on at all, would let the men dive into him, running at full speed, and the men would throw him in a way that seemed as though it would maim him for life. Some of the men weighed a hundred pounds more than he did, but he would get up and, with a smile, say, Come on, men, hit me harder. Knock me out next time. After the first two weeks of the season, Johnny Poe was a complete mass of black and blue marks, and yet how wonderful and how self-sacrificing he was in his eagerness to make the Princeton players good tacklers. But there are few men like Johnny Poe who are willing to sacrifice their own bodies for the instruction of others, and the next best method, and one which does not injure the players so much, is tackling the dummy. As we look at this picture of Howard Henry of Princeton tackling the dummy, we all remember when we were back in the game trying our very best to put our shoulder into our opponent's knees and hit him hard, throw him, and hold him. Henry always got his man. But the thrill of the game is not in tackling the dummy. The joy comes in a game when a man is coming through the line or making a long run, and you throw yourself at his knees and get your tackle. Then up and ready for another. I recall an experience I had at Princeton one year. When I went to the clubhouse to get my uniform, which I wanted to wear in coaching, I asked Keen Fitzpatrick, the trainer, where my suit was. He said, It's hanging outside. I went outside of the dressing room, but could see no suit anywhere. He came out wearing a broad smile. No, he said, it isn't out here. It's out there, hanging in the air. We made a dummy out of it. And there before me, I saw my old uniform stuffed with sawdust. I looked at myself in suspense. After the men have been given the other preliminary work, they are taking to the charging board. The one shown here is used at Yale. It teaches the men quick starting and the use of their hands. It trains them to keep their eyes on the ball and impresses them with the fact that if they start before the ball is put in play, a penalty will follow. A fast charging line has its great value, and every coach is keen to have the forwards move fast to clear the way. Then, after the individual coaching is over, the team runs through signals, and the practice is on. Before very long, the head coach announces that practice is over, and the trainer yells, 
Everybody in on the jump! And you soon find yourself back in the dressing room. It does not take you long to get your clothes off and ready for the bath. How well some of you will recall that after a hard practice, you were content to sit and rest a while on the bench in the dressing room. It may be that in removing your clothes, you favored an injured knee, looked at a sprained ankle, or helped some fellow off with his jersey. What's finer after a day's practice than to stand beneath a warm shower and gradually let the water grow cold? Everything is lovely until some rascal in the bunch throws a cold sponge on you and slaps you across the back, or turns the cold water on when you only want hot. Then comes the dry-off and the rub-down, which seems to soothe all your bruises. This picture of Pete Ballier standing on the end of a bench while Jack McMasters massages an injured knee may recall to many a football player the day when the trainer was his best friend. From his wonderful physique, it's easy to believe that Ballier must have been the great center rush whom the heroes of years ago tell about. Harry Brown, that great Princeton end rush, is on the other end of the bench, being taken care of by Bill Buss, a jovial old colored attendant, who was for so many years a rubber at Princeton. I know men who never enthuse about football, but just play from a sense of college loyalty and a fear of censure should they not play, who are sorry that they were ever big or showed any football ability. College sentiment will not allow a football man to remain idle. I knew a man in college who on his way to the football field said, Oh, how I hate to drag my body down to the varsity field today to have it battered and bruised. One does not always enthuse over the hard drudgery of practice. Those that witness only the final games of the year little realize the gruesome task of preparedness. Every football player will acknowledge that some day he has had these thoughts himself. But suddenly, the day comes when this discouraged player sees a light. Perhaps he has developed a hidden power, or it may be that he has broken through and made a clean tackle behind the line. Perhaps he has made a good run and received a compliment from the coach. It may be that his side partner has given him a word of encouragement, which may have instilled in him a new spirit, and as a result, he has turned out to be a real football player. He then forgets all the bruises and all the hard knocks. How true it is that in one play, or in a practice game, or in a contest against an opposing college, a player has found himself. Do you players of football remember the day you made the team, the day your chance came and you took advantage of it? At such a time, a player shows great possibilities. He's told by the captain to report at the training house for the varsity signals. Who that has experienced the thrill of that moment can ever forget it? He earns his seat at the varsity table. He is now on the varsity squad. He goes on, determined to play a better game, and realizes he must hold his place at the training table by hard, conscientious work. One is not unmindful of the traditions that are centered about the board, where so many heroes of the past have sat, you have a keen realization of the fact that you are filling the seat of men who have gone before you and that you must make good as they made good. Their spirit lives. The training table is a great school for team spirit. You have a successful team, any coach will tell you. There must be a brotherly feeling among the members of the team. The men must chum together on and off the field. Teamwork on the field is made much easier if there is teamwork off the field. I never hear the expression teammates used, but I recall a certain Princeton team, the captain of which was endowed with a wonderful power of leadership. There was nothing the men would not do for him. Every man on the team regarded him as a big brother. Yet there was one man on the squad who seemed inclined to be alone. He had little to say when his work was over on the field, he always went silently away to his room. He did not mingle with the other players in the clubhouse after dinner, and there did not seem to be much warmth in him. Gary Cochran, the captain, took some of us into his confidence, and we made it our business to draw this fellow out of his shell. It was not long before we found that he was an entirely different sort of person from what he had seemed to be. 
in a short time the fellow who was unconsciously retarding good fellowship among the members of the team was no longer a silent negative individual but was soon urging us on in a get-together spirit it will be impossible to relate all the good times had at a college training table i think that every football man will agree with me that we now have a great deal of sympathy for the trainer whereas in the old days we roasted him when it seemed that dinner would never be ready how the hungry mob awaited the signal the flag is down as old jim robinson would say and arthur poe would yell fellows the hash is ready then the hungry crowd would scramble in for the big event of the day there awaited them all the delicacies of a trainer's menu the food that made touchdowns if the service was slow the good-natured trainer was all at fault and he too joined in the spirit of their criticism if the steak was especially tender they would say it was tough there was much juggling of the portions distributed fred daly recalls the first week that he and johnny kirkpatrick were at the yale training table kill called for some chocolate and johnny mack the trainer yelled back what do you think this is anyway a hospital that started something for a while in the way of jollying daly recalls another incident that happened often at yale one year it's about bill goble who certainly could put the food away after disposing of about twelve plates of ice cream which he had begged borrowed or stolen he called one of the innocent waiters over to him and asked in a gentle voice say george what is the dessert for tonight and there comes the good-natured joshing of the fellow who has made a fine play during the practice or in the game of the day one or two of the fun makers rush around put their hands on him and hold him tight for fear he will not be able to contain himself on account of his success of the day this sort of jollification makes the fellow who has made a bad play forget what he might have done and he too becomes buoyant amidst the good fellowship about him we all realize what a modest individual the trainer is if in a reminiscent mood to change the subject from football to himself he tells his ever on to him admirers some of his achievements in the old days there is immediately evidence of preparedness among the players as the following salute is given with fists beating on the table in unison one two three oh what a gosh darn lie but deep in every man's heart is the keen realization of the trainer's value and his eager effort for their success his athletic achievements and his record are well known and appreciated by all he is the pulse of the team the scrub team at princeton during my last year was captained by pop jones who was a martyr to the game he was thoroughly reliable and the spirit he instilled into his teammates helped to make our year a successful one this picture will recall the long roll of silent heroes in the game whose joy seemed to be in giving men who worked their hearts out to see the varsity improve men who never got the great rewards that come to the varsity players but received only the thrill of doing something constructive their reward is in the victories of others for every man knows that it is a great scrub that makes a great varsity if as you gaze at this picture of the scrub team it stirs your memory of the fellows who used to play against you and if in your heart you pay them a silent tribute you will be giving them only their just due to the uncrowned heroes who found no fame the men whose hearts were strong but whose ambitions for a place on the varsity were never realized we take off our hats the fiercest knocks that john dewitt's team ever had at princeton were to practice against the scrub it was in this year on the last day of practice that the undergraduates marched in a body down the field singing and cheering led by a band of music preliminary practice being over the scrub team retired to the varsity field house to await the signal for the exhibition practice to be given on the varsity field before the undergraduates a surprise had been promised while the varsity team was awaiting the arrival of the scrub team it was officially announced that the Yale team would soon arrive upon the field, and shortly after this, the scrub team appeared with white Y's sewed on the front of their jerseys. The scrub players took the Yale players' names, just as they were to play against Princeton on the coming Saturday. 
There was much fun and enthusiasm when the assumed Hogan would be asked to gain through Cooney, or Bloomer would make a run, and the make-believe Foster Rockwell would urge the pseudo-Yale team on to victory. John DeWitt had more than one encounter that afternoon with Captain Rafferty of Yale. After the practice ended, all the players gathered around the dummy, which had been very helpful in tackling practice. This had been saturated with kerosene, awaiting the final event of the day. John DeWitt touched it off with a match, and the white Y, which illuminated the chest of the dummy, was soon enveloped in flames. A college tradition had been lived up to again, and when the team returned victorious from New Haven that year, John DeWitt and his loyal teammates never forgot those men and the events that helped to make victory possible. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter Four: Mistakes in the Game. Many a football player who reads this book will admit that there arises in all of us a keen desire to go back into the game. It is not so much a desire just to play in the game for the mere sake of playing as to remedy the mistakes we all know we made in the past. In our football recollections, the defeats we have experienced stand out the most vividly. Sometimes they live on as nightmares through the years. As we review the old days, we realize that we did not always give our best. If we could but go back and correct our faults, many a defeat might be turned into a victory. We reflect that if we had trained a little harder, if we had been more sincere in our work, paid better attention to the advice given us by the men who knew, if we had mastered our positions better, it would have been a different story on many occasions when defeat was our portion. But that is now all behind us. The games are over. The scores will always stand. Others have taken our places. We have had our day and opportunity. In the words of Longfellow, the world belongs to those who come the last. Our records will remain as we left them on the gridiron. Many a man is recalled in football circles as the one who lost his temper in the big games and caused his team to suffer by his being ruled out of the game. Men say, why, that is the fellow who muffed a punt at a critical moment, or recall him as the one who fumbled the ball when, if he had held it, the team would have been saved from defeat. You recall the man who gave the signals with poor judgment. Maybe you are thinking of the man who missed a great tackle or allowed a man to get through the line and block a kick. Perhaps a mistaken signal in the game caused the loss of a first down, maybe defeat. Who knows? Through our recollection of the things we should have done but failed to do for one reason or another, our defeats rise above us more vividly now than our victories. There is only one day to make good, and that is the day of the game. The next day is too late. Then there is the ever-present recollection of the fellow who let athletics be the big thing in his college life. He did not make good in the classroom. He was unfair to himself. He failed to realize that athletics was only a part of his college life, and that it should have been an aid to better endeavor in his studies. He may have earned his college letter or received a championship gold football, and now that he is out in the world he longs for the college degree that he has forfeited. His regrets are the deeper when he realizes that if he had given his best and been square with his college and himself, his presence might have meant further victories for his team. This is not confined to any one college. It is true of all of them, and probably always will be true, although it is encouraging to note that there is a higher standard of scholarship attained on the average by college athletes today than a decade or so ago. I wish I could impress this lesson indelibly upon the mind of every young football enthusiast that athletics should go hand in hand with college duties. After all, it is the same spirit of teamwork instilled into him on the football field that should inspire him in the classroom where his teacher becomes virtually his coach. When I was at Princeton, we beat Yale three years out of the four, but the defeat of 1897 at New Haven stands out most vividly of all in my memory. It was not so much what Yale did as what Princeton did not do that haunts me. One day in practice in 1897, Sport Armstrong, conceded to be one of the greatest guards playing, was severely injured in a scrimmage. It was found that his neck and head had become twisted, and for days he lay at death's door on his bed in the varsity clubhouse. 
After a long serious illness he got well, but never strong enough to play again. I took his place. Nearly all of the star players of the 96 Princeton Championship team were in the lineup. It was Cochran's last year and my first year on the varsity. Our team was heralded as a 3-1 to one winner. We had beaten Dartmouth 30-0 to zero and won a great 57-0 to zero victory over Lafayette. Yale had a good strong team that had not yet found itself, but there were several of us Princeton players who knew from old association and prep school the caliber of some of the men we were facing. Cochran and I have often recalled together that silent reunion with our old teammates of Lawrenceville. There in front of us on the Yale team were Charlie Desayes, George Cadwallader, and Charlie Dudley. We had not seen them since we all left prep school, they to go to New Haven and we to Princeton. When the teams lined up for combat there were no greetings of one old schoolmate to another. This was not the time nor place for exchange of amenities. As someone has once remarked, the town was full of strangers. The fact that Dudley was wearing one Lawrenceville stocking only urged us on to play harder. My opponent on the Yale team was Charlie Chadwick, Yale's strong man. Foster Stanford tells elsewhere in this book how he prepared him for the Harvard game the week before and for this game with Princeton. Our coaches had made, as they thought, a study of Chadwick's temperament and had instructed me accordingly. I delivered their message in the form of a straight-arm blow. The compliment was returned immediately by Chadwick, and the scrap was on. Dashiell, the umpire, was upon us in a moment. I had visions of being ruled out of the game and disgraced. "'You men are playing like schoolboys and ought to be ruled out of the game,' Dashiell exclaimed, but he decided to give us another chance. Chadwick played like a demon, and I realized before the game had progressed very far that I had been coached wrong, for instead of weakening his courage, my attack seemed to nerve him. He played a very wide, defensive guard, and it was almost impossible to gain through him. The play of the Princeton team at the outset was disappointing. Jim Rogers, the Yale captain, was driving his men hard, and they responded heartily. Some of them stood out conspicuously by their playing. De Salle's open field work was remarkable. I remember well the great run of fifty-five yards which he made. He was a wonderfully clever dodger, and used the stiff arm well. He evaded the Princeton tacklers successfully, until Billy Bannard made a tackle on Princeton's twenty-five yard line. Gary Cochran was one of the Princeton players who failed in his effort to tackle De Sales, although it was a remarkable attempt with a low diving tackle. De Sales hurtled over him, and Cochran struck the ground, breaking his right shoulder. That Cochran was so seriously injured did not become known until after de Sales had finished his long run. Then it was seen that Cochran was badly hurt. The trainer ran out and took him to the sidelines to fix up his injury. Time was being taken out, and as we waited for Cochran to return to the game, we discussed the situation and hoped that his injury would not prove serious. Every one of us realized the tremendous handicap we would be under without him. The tension showed in the faces of Alex Moffat and Johnny Poe, as they sat there on the sideline, trying to reach a solution of the problem that confronted them as coaches. They realized better than the players that the tide was against them. To conceal the true location of his injury from the Yale players, Cochran had his left shoulder bandaged and entered the scrimmage again, game though handicapped, remaining on the field until the trainer finally dragged him to the sideline. This was the last football contest in which Gary Cochran took part. He was game to the end. At New Haven that fall, Frank Butterworth and some of the other coaches had heard a rumor that when Cochran and de Sales parted at Lawrenceville, they had a strange understanding. Both had agreed, so the rumor went, that should they ever meet in a Yale-Princeton game, one would have to leave the game. Butterworth told de Sales what he had heard and cautioned him, reminding him that he wanted him to play a game that would escape criticism. De Sales put every ounce of himself into his game. Cochran did the same. To this day Frank Butterworth and the coaches believe that when de Sales was making his great run up the field, he kept his pledge to Cochran. De Sales and Cochran laugh at the suggestion that it was other than an accident, but they have never been able to convince their friends. The dramatic element in it was too strong for a mere chance affair. Princeton's handicap when Cochran had to go out was increased by the withdrawal because of injuries of Johnny Baird, the quarterback, that wonderful drop-kicker of previous games. He was out of condition and had to be carried from the field with a serious injury. Dudley, the ex Lawrence Villian, here began to get in his telling work. The Yale stands were wild with enthusiasm as they saw their team about to score against the much-heralded Princeton team. 
we were a three to one bet. On the next play Dudley went through the Princeton line. At the bottom of the heap, hugging the ball and happy in his success, was Charlie Dudley, Yale hero, Lawrenceville stocking and all. After George Cadwallader had kicked the goal, the score stood six to zero. One of the greatest problems that confronts a coach is to select the proper man to start in a game. Injuries often handicap a team. Ad Kelly, king of all line-plunging halfbacks, had been injured the week before at Princeton, and for that reason was not in the original lineup that day at New Haven. He was on the sidelines waiting for a chance to go in. His chance came. Kelly was Princeton's only hope. Herbert Reed, known among writers in football as right wing, thus describes this stage of the game. With almost certain defeat staring them in the face, the Tigers made one last desperate rally, and in doing so called repeatedly on Kelly, with the result that with this star carrying the ball in nearly every rush, the Princeton eleven carried the ball fifty-five yards up the field, only to lose it at the last on a fumble to Jim Rogers. Time and again in the course of this heroic advance, Kelly went into or slid outside of tackle practically unaided, bowling along more like a huge ball than a human being. It was one of the greatest exhibitions of a born runner, of a football genius, and much more to be lauded than his work the previous year, when he was aided by one of the greatest football machines ever sent into a big game. But Kelly's brilliant work was unavailing, and when the game ended, the score was still 6-0. to zero. Yale had won an unexpected victory. The Yale supporters descended like an avalanche upon the field and carried off their team. Groups of men paraded about, carrying aloft the victors. There were Captain Jim Rogers, Charlie Chadwick, George Cadwallader, Gordon Brown, Burr Chamberlain, John Hall, Charlie de Sales, Dudley, Benjamin, McBride, and Hazen. Many were the injuries in this game. It was a hard-fought contest. There were interesting encounters which were known only to the players themselves. As for myself, it may best be said that I spent three weeks in the University of Pennsylvania Hospital with water on the knee. I certainly had plenty of time to think about the sadness of defeat. The ever-present thought, wait until next year, was on my mind. Gary Cochran used to say in his talks to the team, We must win this year, make it two years straight against Yale. If you lose, Princeton will be a dreary old place for you. It will be a long, hard winter. The frost on the window pane will be an inch thick. And, in the sadness of our recollections, his words came back to us and to him. These words came back to me again in 1899. I had looked forward all the year to our playing Cornell at Ithaca. It was just the game we wanted on our schedule to give us the test before we met Yale. We surely got a test, and Cornell men to this day will tell you of their great victory in 1899 over Princeton, 5-0. to zero. There were many friends of mine in Ithaca, which was only 30 miles from my old home, and I was naturally happy over the fact that Princeton was going to play there but the loyal supporters who had expected a Princeton victory were as disappointed as I was. Bill Robinson, manager of the Princeton team, reserved seats for about thirty of my closest boyhood friends, who came over from Lizzle to see the game. The Princeton cheering section was rivaled in enthusiasm by the Lizzle section, and the disappointment of each one of my friends at the outcome of that memorable game was as keen as that of any man from Princeton. Our team was clearly outplayed. Unfortunately, we had changed our signals that week, and we did not play together. But all the honors were Cornell's, her sure-footed George Young in the second half made a goal from the field, fixing the score at 5-0. to zero. I remember the wonderful spirit of victory that came over the Cornell team, the brilliant playing of Starbuck, the Cornell captain, and of Bill Warner, Walbridge, Young, and the other men who contributed to the Cornell victory. Percy Field swarmed with Cornell students when the game ended, each one of them crazy to reach the members of their team and help to carry them victoriously off the field. Never will I forget the humiliation of the Princeton team. Trolley cars never seemed to move as slowly as those cars that carried us that day through the streets of Ithaca. Enthusiastic, yelling undergraduates grinned at us from the sidewalks as we crawled along to the hotel. Sadness reigned supreme in our company. We were glad to get to our rooms. Instead of leaving Ithaca at 9.30 as we planned, we hired a special engine to take our private cars to Owego, there to await the express for New York on the main line. My only pleasant recollection of that trip was a brief call I made at the home of a girl friend of mine, who had attended the game. My arm was in a sling, and sympathy was welcome. As our train rolled over the zigzag road out of Ithaca, 
we had a source of consolation in the fact that we had evaded the send-off which the Cornell men had planned in the expectation that we were to leave on the latter train. There were no outstretched hands at Princeton for our homecoming, but every man on that Princeton team was grimly determined to learn the lesson of the Cornell defeat, to correct faults and leave nothing undone that would ensure victory for Princeton in the coming game with Yale. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Football Days The Celebrivox Recording All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by John Escalante. Football Days by William Edwards, Chapter Five. Chapter Five, My Last Game. Every player knows the anxious anticipation and the nerve strain connected with the last game of the football season. In my last year, there were many men on the team who were to say goodbye to their playing days. Every player who reads these lines will agree with me that it was his keenest ambition to make his last game his best game. It was the fall of 1899. There are many of us who had played on a victorious team the year before. Princeton had never beaten Yale two years in succession. This was our opportunity. Our slogan during the entire season had been, On to New Haven. The dominating idea in the mind of everyone was to add another victory over Yale to the one of the year before. The Cornell game with its defeat was forgotten. We had learned our lesson. We had made a tremendous advance in two weeks. I recall so well the days before the Yale game, when we were leaving for New York en route to New Haven. We met at the varsity field house. I will never forget how strange the boys looked in their derby hats and overcoats. It was a striking contrast to the regular everyday football costumes and campus clothes. There were hundreds of undergraduates at the train station to cheer us off. As the train pulled out, the familiar strains of old Nassau floated after us, and we realized that the next time we would see that loyal crowd would be in the cheering section on the Princeton side at New Haven. We went directly to the Murray Hill Hotel, where Princeton has held its headquarters for years. After luncheon, Walter Christie, the trainer, took us up to Central Park. We walked about for a time and finally reached the obelisk. Biffy Lee, the head coach, suggested that we run through our signals. All of us doffed our overcoats and hats, and there on the expansive lawn, flanked by Cleopatra's Needle and the Metropolitan Art Museum, we ran through our signals. We then resumed our walk and returned to the hotel for dinner. The evening was spent in the hotel parlors where the team was entertained and had opportunity for relaxation from the mental strain that was necessarily a part of the situation. A general reception took place in the corridors. Players of old days came around to see the team, to revive old memories, and cheer the men of the team onto victory. Football writers from the daily papers mingled with the throng, and their accounts the following day reflected the optimistic spirit they encountered. The betting odds were quoted at 3-1 to one on Princeton. Betting odds is a way some people gauge the outcome of the football contest, but I have learned from experience that big odds are not justified on either side in a championship game. We were up bright and early in the morning and out for a walk before breakfast. Our team then took the 10 o'clock train for New Haven. Only those who have been through the experience can appreciate the difficulty encountered in getting on board a train for New Haven on the day of a football game. We were ushered to a side entrance, however, and were finally landed in the special cars provided for us. On the journey, there was a jolly good time. Good fellowship reigned supreme. That relieved the nervous tension. Arthur Poe and Bosey Ryder were the leading spirits of the jollification. A happier crowd never entered New Haven than the Princeton team that day. The cars pulled in on a siding near the station, and everybody realized that we were at last in the town where the coveted prize was. We were after the Yale ball. On to New Haven had been our watchword. We were there. Following a light lunch in our dining car, we soon got our football clothes and in short time the palatial Pullman car was transformed. It assumed the appearance of our dressing room at Princeton. Football togs hung everywhere. Nose guards, headgears, stockings, shin guards, jerseys, and other gridiron equipment were everywhere. Here and there the trainer or his assistants were limbering up joints that needed attention. Two big buses waited at the car platform. The team piled into them. We were off to the field. The team was made through a welcome of friendly salutes from Princeton men encountered on the way. Personal friends of individual players called to them from the sidewalks. Others shouted words of confidence. Old Nassau was out in overwhelming force. No team ever received more loyal support. They keyed the players up to the highest pitch of determination. Their spirits, naturally at a high mark, rose still higher under the warmth of the welcome. Repression was a thing of the past. Every player was jubilant and did not attempt to conceal the fact. The enthusiasm mounted as we neared the scene of the coming battle. As we entered the field, the air was rent by a mighty shout of welcome from the Princeton host. Our hearts palpitated in response to it. There was not a man on the team who did not feel himself repaid a thousandfold for a season's hard knocks. But this soon gave way to the sober thought of the work ahead of us. 
We were there for business. Falling on the ball, sprinting and limbering up, and running through a few signals, we spent the few minutes before the Yale team came through the corner of the field. The scenes of enthusiasm that had marked our arrival were repeated, the Yale stand being the center this time of the maelstrom of cheers. I shall not attempt to describe our own feelings as we got the first glimpse of our opponents in the coming fray. Who can describe the sensations of the contestants in the first moment of a championship game? But it was not long before the coin had been tossed and the game was on. Not a man who has played in the line will ever forget how he tried to block his man or get down the field and tackle the man with the ball. I recall most vividly those three strapping Yale centermen, Brown, Hale, and Alcott, flanked by Stillman and Francis. It was Al Sharp and McBride. Fink was at quarter. If there was any one play during the season that we had drilled into us, a play which we might have hoped to win the game, it was a long end run. It was Leah's pet play. I can recall the Herculean work we had performed to perfect this play. It was time well spent. The reward came within seven minutes after the game began. The end running ability of that great player, Bozy Ryder, showed. Every man was doing his part, and the play was made possible. Ryder scored a touchdown along the side of the field. I never saw a happier man than Bozy. But he was no happier than his ten teammates. They were leaping in the air with joy. The Princeton stand arose in solid body and sent an avalanche of cheers across the field. What proved to be one of the most important features of the game was a well-delivered punt by Bert Wheeler, who kicked the ball out to Hutchinson. Hutch heeled it in front of the goal, and Bert Wheeler boosted the ball straight over the crossbar, and Princeton scored an additional point. At that moment, we did not realize that this would be the decisive factor in the Princeton victory. As the Princeton team went back to the middle of the field to take their places for the next kickoff, the Princeton side of the field was a perfect bedlam of enthusiasm. Old grads were hugging each other on the sidelines, and every eye was strained for the next move in the game. At the same time, the Yale stand was cheering its side and urging the blue players to rally. McBride, the Yale captain, was rousing his men with the Yale spirit, and they realized what was demanded of them. The effect was evident. It showed how Yale could rise to an occasion. We felt that the old bulldog spirit of Yale was after us, as strong as ever. How wonderfully well McBride, the old captain, kicked that day. What a power he was on defense. I saw him do some wonderful work. It was after one of his long punts, which, with the wind in his favor, went about 70 yards, that Princeton caught the ball on the 10-yard line. Wheeler dropped back to kick. The old men were on their toes, ready to break through and block the kick. The old stand was cheering them on. Stillman was the first man through. It seemed as though he was offside. Wheeler delayed the kick, expecting that an offside penalty would be given. When he did kick, it was too late. The ball was blocked, and McBride fell on it behind the goal line, scoring a touchdown for Yale, making the score 6-5 to five in favor of Princeton. Believe me, the Yale spirit was running high. The men were playing like demons. Here was a team that was considered a defeated team before the game. There were 11 men who had risen to the occasion, and who were slowly but surely getting the best of the argument. Gloom hung over the Princeton stand. Defeat seemed inevitable. Of 11 players who started in the game on the Princeton side, 8 had been incapacitated by injuries of one kind or another. Doc Hillebrand, the ever-reliable All-American tackle, had been compelled to leave the game with a broken collarbone, just before McBride made his touchdown. I remember well the play in which he was injured. I have resurrected a photograph that was snapped of the game at the moment that he was lying on the ground, knocked out. Bummy Booth, who had stood the strain of the contest wonderfully well, had played a grand game against Hale, giving way to Horace Bannard, brother Bill Bannard, the famous Princeton halfback of 98. Just then, I saw a man in football togs come out from the sidelines wearing a blue visor cap. He was to kick for the goal. It was an unusual spectacle in the football field. I rushed up to the referee, Ed Ridington of Harvard, and called his attention to the man with the cap. I asked if that man was in the game. Why, well, he replied with a broad smile, you ought to know him. He is the man you've been playing against all along, Gordon Brown. He only ran into the sideline to get a cap to shade his eyes. I am frank to say that this one was on me. The chagrin wore off when Brown missed a goal, which would have tied the final score and robbed Princeton of the ultimate victory. The tide of the battle turned towards Yale. Al Sharp kicked a goal from the field from the 45-yard line. It was a wonderful achievement. It is true that circumstances later substituted Arthur Poe for him as the hero of the game, but those who witnessed his sharp performance will never forget it. The laurels that he won by it were snatched from him by Poe only in the last half minute of play. The score was changing by Sharp's goal from 6-5 to five in our favor to 10-6, to six, Yale leading. The half was over. The score was 10-6 to six against Princeton. Every Princeton player felt that there was still a real opportunity to win out. We were all optimistic. This optimism was increased by the appeals made to the men in the dressing room by the coaches. It was not long before the team was back on the field, more determined than ever to carry the Yale ball back to Princeton. The last half of the game is everlastingly impressed upon my memory. Every man that played for Princeton, although eight of them were substitutes, played like a veteran. 
I shall ever treasure the memory of the loyal support that those men gave me as captain and their response to my appeal to stand together and play not only for Princeton, but for the injured men on the sidelines whose places they had taken. The Yale team had also heard some words of football wisdom in their dress room. Previous encounters to Princeton had taught them that the Tiger could also rally. They came on the football field prepared to fight harder than ever. McBride and Brown were exhorting their men to do their utmost. Princeton was outrushing Yale, but not outkicking them. Yale knew that as well as we did. It was a Yale fumble that gave us a chance we were waiting for. Bill Roper, who had taken Lou Palmer's place at left end, had his eyes open. He found the ball. Through his vigilance, Princeton got the chance to score. Now was our chance. Time was passing quickly. We all knew that something extraordinary would have to be done to win the day. It remained for Arthur Poe to crystallize this idea into action. It seemed an inspiration. We've got to cook, he said to me, and I would like to try a goal from the field. We haven't got much time. Nobody appreciated the situation more than I did. I knew we would have to take a chance, and there was no one I would have selected for the job quicker than Arthur Poe. How we needed a touchdown or a goal from the field. Poe, Powell, and myself were the three members of the original team left. How the substitutes rallied with us and gave us the perfect defense that made Poe's feet possible is a matter of history. As I looked around for my position to see that the defensive formation was right, I recall how small Arthur Poe looked there in the fullback position. Here was a man doing something we had never rehearsed as a team, but safe and sure the pass went from Horace Bannard. And as Biffy Lee remarked after the game, when Arthur kicked the ball, it seemed to stay up in the air about 20 minutes. Some people have said that I turned a somersault and landed on my ear and collapsed. Anyhow, it all came our way at the end. The ball sailed over the crossbar. The score was 11-10, and, and the Princeton stand let out a roar of triumph that could be heard way down in New Jersey. There were but 36 seconds left for play. Yale made a splendid supreme effort to score further, but it was futile. Crowds had left the field before Poe made his great goal kick. They had accepted a Yale victory as inevitable. Some say the bets were paid on the strength of this conviction. The Yale News, which went to press five minutes before the game ended, got out an addition saying that Yale had won. They had to change that story. During the second preceding post kick for a goal, I had a queer obsession. It was a serious matter to me then. I can recall it now with amusement. Big was a prefix not on my own selection. I had never appreciated its justification, however, until that moment. Or his banner was plain center. I had my left hand clasped under his elastic in his trouser leg, ready to form a barrier against the Yale forwards. Brown, Hale, and McBride tried to break through to block the kick. I thought of a million things, but most of all I was afraid of a block kick. To be frank, I was afraid I would block it, that Poe couldn't clear me, that he would kick the ball into me. I crouched as low as I could go, and the more I worried, the larger I seemed to be, and I feared greatly for what might occur behind me. It seemed as though I was swelling up. But finally, as I realized the ball had gone over me and was on its way to the goal, I breathed a sigh of relief and said, Thank God it cleared. How eager we were to get that ball, the hard-earned prize, which now rests in the Princeton Gymnasium, a companion ball to the one of the 1898 victory. Yes, it had all been accomplished, and we were happy. New Haven looked different to us. It was many years since Princeton had sent Yale down to defeat on Yale Field. Victory made us forget the sadness of our former defeats. It was a joyous crowd that rode back to the private cars. Varsity players and substitutes shared alike in the joy, which was unrestrained. We soon had our clothes changed, and we were on our way to New York for the banquet and celebration of our victory. Arthur Poe was the line of the hour. No finer fellow ever received more just tribute. It would have taken a separate volume to describe the instance of that trip from New Haven to New York. Before it had ended, we realized, if we never had realized it before, how sweet was victory, and how worthwhile the striving that brought it to us. Suffice to say that the Yale football was the most popular passenger on the train. Over and over we played the game, and a million caresses were lavished upon the trophy. This may seem an excess of sentiment to some, but those who have played football understand. Looking back to the retrospect of 17 years, I realized that I not fully understand then the meaning of those happy moments. I now appreciate that it was simply the deep satisfaction that comes from having made good, the sense of real accomplishment. Enthusiastic Princeton men were waiting for us at the Grand Central Station. They escorted us to the Murray Hill Hotel and the wonderful banquet that awaited us. The spirit of the occasion will be understood by football players and enthusiasts who have enjoyed similar experiences. The members of the team just sat and listened to speeches by the alumni and coaches. It all seemed too good to be true. When the gathering broke up, the players became members of different groups who continued their celebration in the various ways provided by the hospitality of the great city. Hilly Brown and I ended the night together. When we woke in the morning, the old football was there between our pillows, the banded shoulder and the collarbone of Hilly Brown nestling close to it. Then came the home going of the team to Princeton and the huge bonfire that the whole university turned out to build. 
Some nearby woodyard was looking the next day for the 36 cords of wood that had served as a foundation for the victorious blaze. It was learned afterwards that the owner of the cordwood had backed the team, so he had no regret. The team was driven up in buses from the station. It was a proud privilege to light the bonfire. Every man on the Princeton team had to make a speech, and then we had a banquet at the Princeton Inn. Later in the year, the team was banqueted by the alumni organizations around the country. Every man had a pack of souvenirs, gold mat shapes, footballs, and other things. Nothing was too good for the victors. Well, well, to the victors belong the spoils. That is the verdict of history. End of chapter 5、Chapter Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter 6 Heroes of the Past. The Early Days. We treasure the memory of the good men who have gone before. This is true of the world's history, a nation's history, that of a state, and of a great university. Most true is it of memory of men of heroic mold. As schoolboys, our imaginations were fired by the records of the brilliant achievements of a Perry. A Decatur, or a Paul Jones. And, as we grow older, we look back to those heroes of our boyhood days, and our hearts beat fast again as we recall their daring deeds and pay them tribute anew for the stout hearts, the splendid fighting stamina, and the unswerving integrity that made them great men in history. In every college and university, there is a Hall of Fame. Where the heroes of the past are idolized by the younger generations. Trophies, portraits, old flags, and banners hang there. Threadbare though they may be, they are rich in memories. These are, however, only the material things, the trappings and the suits of fame. But in the hearts of university men, the memory of the heroes of the past is firmly and reverently enshrined. Their achievements are a distinguished part of the university's history, a part of our lives as university men, and we are ever ready now to burn incense in their honor, as we were in the old days to burn bonfires in celebration of their deeds. It is well now that we recall some of the men who have stood in the front line of football, and in the making and preservation of the great game. Many of them have not lived to see the results of their service to the sport which they deem to be manly and worth while. It is, however, because they stood there during the days, often full of stress and severe criticism of the game, staunch and resistless, that football occupies its present high plane in the athletic world. It may be that some of their names are not now associated with football, some of them are captains of industry. They are in the forefront of public affairs. Some of them are engaged in the world's work in faraway lands. But the spirit that these men apply to their life work is the same spirit that stirred them on the gridiron. Their football training has made them better able to fight the battle of life. Men who gave signals are now directing large industries. Players who carried the ball are now carrying trade to the ends of the world. Men who bucked the line are forging their way sturdily to the front. Men who were tackles are still meeting their opponents with the same intrepid zeal. The men who played at end in those days are today seeing that nothing gets around them in the business world. The public is the referee and umpire. It knows their achievements in the greater game of life. It is not my purpose to select an all star football team from the long list of heroes, past and present. It is not possible to select any one man whom we can all crown as king. We all have our football idols, our own heroes, men after whom we patterned, who were our inspiration. We can never line up in actual scrimmage the heroes of the past with those of more recent years. What a treat if this could be arranged! There are many men I have idolized in football, not only for their record as players, but for the loyalty and spirit for the game which they have inspired. Walter Camp. When I asked Walter Camp to write the introduction to this book, 
I told him that as he had written about football players for twenty years, it was up to someone to relate some of his achievements as a football player. We all know Walter Camp as a successful businessman, and as a football genius whose strategy has meant much to Yale. His untiring efforts, his contributions to the promotion of the best interest of the game, stand as a brilliant record in the history of football. To give him his just due would require a special volume. The football world knows Walter Camp is a thoroughbred, a man who has played the game fairly, and sees to it that the game is being played fairly today. We have read his books, enjoyed his football stories, and kept in touch with the game through his newspaper articles. He is the loyal, ever-present critic on the sidelines, and the helpful adviser in every emergency, and he has helped to safeguard the good name of football and kept pace with the game until today he is known as the father of football. Let us go back into football history, where, in the recollection of others, we shall see freshman camp make the team, score touchdowns, kick goals, and captain Yale teams to victory. F. R. Vernon, who was a freshman at Yale when camp was a sophomore, draws a vivid world picture of camp in his active football days. Vernon played on the Yale team with camp. Walter Camp, in his football playing days, says Vernon, was physically built on field running lines, quick on his legs and with his arms. His action was easy all over and seemed to be in thorough control from a well balanced head, from which looked a pair of exceptionally keen, piercing, expressive brown eyes. Camp was always alert and seemed to sense developments before they occurred. One of my chief recollections of Camp's play was his great confidence with the ball. In his room, on the campus, in the gym, wherever he was, if possible, he would have a football with him. He seemed to know every inch of its surface, and it seemed almost as if the ball knew him. It would stick to his palm like iron to a magnet. In one of his plays, Camp would run down the side of the field, the ball held far out with one arm while the other arm was performing yeoman service and warding off the oncoming tacklers. Frequently he would pass the ball from one hand to the other, while still running, depending on which arm he saw he would need for defense. Smiling and confidently, Camp would run the gauntlet of opposing players for many consecutive gains. I do not recall one instance in which he lost the ball through these tactics. It was a pretty game to play, and a pretty game to look at, would the rules could be so worded as to make the football of Camp's time the football of today. Walter Camp's natural ability as a football player was recognized as soon as he entered Yale in 1876. He made the varsity at once and played halfback. It was in the first Harvard football game at Hamilton Park that the Harvard captain, who was a huge man with a full bushy beard, saw Walter Camp, then a stripling freshman in uniform, and remarked to the Yale captain, you don't mean to let that child play. He is too light. He will get hurt. Walter made a mental note of that remark, and during the game the Harvard captain had occasion to remember it also, and in one of the plays Camp tackled him, and the two went to the ground with a heavy thud. As the Harvard captain gradually came to, he remarked to one of his teammates, Well, that little fellow nearly put me out. Camp's brilliant playing earned him the captaincy of the team in 1878 and 1879. He had full command of his men and was extremely popular with them, but this did not prevent his being a stickler for discipline. In my day on the Yale team with Camp, Vernon states, Princeton was our dire opponent. For a week or so before a Princeton game, we all agreed to stay on the campus and to be in bed every night by eleven o'clock. Johnny Moorhead, who was one of our best runners, decided one night to go to the theater, however, and was caught by Captain Camp, whereupon we were all summoned out of bed to Camp's room shortly before midnight. After the roundup, we learned the reason for our unexpected meeting. There was some discussion in which Camp took very little part. No one expected that Johnny would receive more than a severe reprimand, and this feeling was due largely to the fact that we needed him in the game. Imagine our surprise, therefore, when Camp, who had left us for a moment, returned to the room and handed in his resignation as captain of the team. We revolted at this. Johnny, who sized up the situation rather than have the team lose Camp, 
decided to quit the team himself. What occurred the next day between Camp and Johnny Moorhead we never knew, but Johnny played in the game and squared himself. Walter Camp's name is coupled with that of Chummy Eaton in football history. Eaton was on the left end rush line, says Vernon, and played a great game with Camp down the sideline. When one was nearly caught for a down, the other would receive the ball and from him an overhead throw and proceed with the run. Camp and Eaton would repeat this play, sending the ball back and forth down the side of the field for great gains. In one of the big games in the fall of 1879, Eaton had a large muscle in one of his legs torn and had to quit playing for that season. Vernon was put in Chummy's place. But I couldn't fill Chummy's shoes, Vernon acknowledges, for he and Camp had practiced their beautiful sideline play all the fall. The next year Chummy's parents wouldn't let him play, but Chummy was game. He simply couldn't resist. It was a case of love before duty with him. He played on the Yale team the next fall, however, but not as Eaton and everyone who followed football was wondering who that star player Adams was and where he came from. But those on the inside knew it was chummy. Frederick Remington, says Vernon, was a member of our team. We were close friends and spent many Sunday afternoons on long walks. I can see him now with his India ink pencil sketching as we went along, and I must laugh now at the nerve I had to joke him about his efforts. Remy was a good football player and one of the best boxers in college. Dear old Remy is gone, but he left his mark. Other men, equally prominent old Yale men, tell me, who were on the team that year were Hull, Jack Harding, Ben Lamb, Bob Watson, Pete Peters, and many others. Walter Camp, as Yale gridiron stories go, was not only captain of his team, but in reality also its coach. Perhaps he can be called the pioneer coach of Yale football. It is most interesting to listen to old-time Yale players relate incidents of the days when they played under Walter Camp as their captain, how they came to his room by invitation at night, sat on the floor with their backs to the wall, with nothing in the center of the room but a regulation football. There they got together, talked things over, made suggestions and comparisons, and it is said of Camp that he would do more listening by far than talking. This was characteristic. For although he knew so much of the game, he was willing to get every point of view and profit by every suggestion. In 1880, Camp relinquished the captaincy to R. W. Watson. Yale again defeated Harvard, Camp kicking a goal from placement. Following this, R. W. Watson ran through the entire Harvard team for a touchdown. Harvard men were greatly pained when Walter Camp played again in 1981. He should have graduated in 1880. This game was also won by Yale, thus making the fourth victorious Yale team that Camp had played on. This record has never been equaled. Camp played six years at Yale. John Harding was another of the famous old Yale stars who played on Walter Camp's teams. It is now more than 35 years since my days on the football gridiron, writes Harding. What little elementary training I got in football. I attribute to the old game of theory for which two years on spring and summer evenings after supper we used to play at St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire, on the athletic grounds near the middle school. One fellow would be it, as we dashed from one side of the grounds to the other, and when one was trapped, he joined the its until everybody was caught. I learned there how to dodge as well as the rudiments of the necessary football accomplishment of how to fall down without getting hurt. As a result of this experience with my chum, W.A. Peters, when we got down to Yale in the fall of 76, we offered ourselves as willing victims for the university football team, and with the result that we both made the freshman team and had our first experience in a match of football against the Harvard freshman at Boston. I don't remember who won that contest, but I do remember the University 11 under Eugene Baker's careful training beating Harvard that fall at New Haven, and my football enthusiasm being fired up to a desire to make the team, if it were possible. Of course, Walter Camp has for many years, and deservedly so, been regarded as the father of football at Yale, but in my day, and at least until Baker left college, he was only an ordinary mortal and a good halfback. Baker was the unquestioned star, and I cannot disabuse my mind that he was the original football man of Yale, 
and at least entitled to the title of grandfather of the game there, and it was from him that my tuition mainly came. My impression is that Baker was always for the open running and passing game, and that mass playing and flying wedges and the various refinements of the game that depended largely on beef were of a later day. For four years I played in the rush line with Walter Camp as a halfback, and for two years at least with Hull and Ben Lamb on either side of me, all of us somehow understanding each other's game and all being ready and willing to help each other out. Whatever ability and dexterity I may have developed seemed to show itself at its best when playing with them and to prove that good teamwork and knowing your man wins. I got to know Walter Camp's method and plays of playing so that somehow or other I could judge pretty well where the ball was going to drop when he kicked and could navigate myself about so that I was, more often than anyone else on our side, near the ball when it dropped to the ground, and if, perchance, it happened to be muffled by an opposing player, which put me on side, the chances of a touchdown if I got the ball were excellent, and Hull and Lamb were somehow on hand to back me up and were ready to follow me in any direction. During my last two years of football, the rushers were unanimously of the opinion that the kicking, dodging, and passing open game was the game we should strive for, and that it was the duty of the halfback and backs to end their runs with a good, long punt, wherever possible, and give us a chance to get under the ball when it came down, while the rest of the team behind the line were in favor of a running mass play game particularly in wet and slippery weather. I remember once in my senior year our divergence of views on this question, about three weeks before the final game nearly split our team, and that, as a result, I nearly received the doubtful honor of becoming the captain of a defeated Yale team. Camp, fearful of wet weather, and possible snow at the Thanksgiving game, and with Channing, Eaton, and Fred Remington as the heavy Yale ends and everybody big in the rush line excepting myself, was trying to develop us with as little kicking as possible, and was sensitive because of the protest from the rush line that there was no kicking. We were all summoned one evening to his room in Durfay, the situation explained, together with his unwillingness to assume the responsibility of captain unless his ideas were followed his fear of defeat if they were not followed, his willingness to continue on the team as a halfback and to do his best and his resignation as captain with the suggestion of my taking the responsibility of the position. Things looked blue for Yale when Walter walked out of the door, but after some ten minutes' discussion we decided that the open game was the better, despite Camp's opinion to the contrary, but that we could not play the open game without Camp as captain. Someone was set out to bring Walter back. Matters were smoothed out. We played the open game and never lost a touchdown during the season. But during the four years I was on the Yale varsity, we never lost but one touchdown, from which a goal was kicked, and there were no goals kicked from the field. This goal was lost to Princeton, and I think was in the fall of 78, the year that Princeton won the championship. The two men that were more than anybody else responsible for the record were Eugene Baker and Walter Camp, but behind it all was the old Yale spirit, which seems to show itself better on the football field than in any other branch of athletics. Theodore M. McNair On December 19, 1915, there appeared in the newspapers a notice of the death of old Princeton athlete in Japan, Theodore M. McNair who, while unknown to the younger football enthusiast, was considered a famous player in his day. To those who saw him play, the news brought back many thrills of his adventures upon the football field. The following is what an old fellow player has to say about his teammate. Princeton has lost one of their most remarkable old-time athletes in the death of Theodore M. McNair of the class of 1879. McNair was a classmate of Woodrow Wilson. After his graduation, he became a Presbyterian missionary, a professor in a Tokyo college, and a head of the committee that introduced the Christian hymnal into Japan. To old Princeton graduates, however, McNair is known best as a great football player who was halfback on the varsity three years and was regarded as a phenomenal dodger, runner, and kicker. In the three years of his varsity experience, McNair went down to his defeat only once 
the first game in which he appeared as a regular player. The contest was with Harvard and was played between the seasons, April 28, 1877, at Cambridge. Harvard won the game by two touchdowns to one for the Tigers. McNair made the touchdown for his team. This match is interesting in that it marked the first appearance of the canvas jacket on the football field. Smock, one of the Princeton halfbacks, designed such a jacket for himself, and thereafter for many seasons football players of the leading eastern colleges adopted the garment because it made tackling more difficult under the conditions of those days. McNair was of a large frame and fleet of foot. He was especially clever in handling and passing the ball, which in those days was more of an art than at present. It was not unusual for the ball to be passed from player to player after a scrimmage until a touchdown or a field goal was made. Walter Camp was one of McNair's Yale adversaries. They had many punting duels in the big games at St. George's Cricket Grounds, Hoboken, but Camp never had the satisfaction of sending McNair off the field with a beaten team. Alexander Moffat Every football enthusiast who saw Alex Moffat play had the highest respect for his ability in the game. Alex Moffat was typically Princetonian. His interest in the game was great, and he was always ready to give as much time as was needed to the coaching of the Princeton teams. His hard, efficient work developed remarkable kickers. He loved the game and was a cheerful, encouraging, and sympathetic coach. From a man of his day, I have learned something about his playing and together we can read of this great all-round athlete. Alex Moffat was so small when he was a boy that he was called Teeny Bits. He was still small in the bone and bulk when he entered Princeton. Alex had always been active in sports as a boy. Small as he was, he played a good game of baseball and tennis, and he distinguished himself by his kicking in football before he was twelve years of age. The game was then called Association Football and kicking formed a large part of it. At an early age he became proficient in kicking with right or left foot. When he was fifteen he created a sensation over at the old seminary by kicking the Black Rubber Association football clear over Brown Hall. That was kick enough for a boy of fifteen with an old Black Rubber football. If anyone doubts it, let him try to do the trick. The varsity team of Princeton in the fall of 79 was captained by Bland Ballard of the class of 80. He had a bunch of giants back of him. There were 15 on the team in those days, and among them were such as Devereux, Brotherland, Bryan, Irv Withington, and the mighty McNair. The scrub team player at that time was pretty nearly any chap that was willing to take his life in his hands by going down to the field and letting those ruthless giants step on his face and generally mess up his physical architecture. When Alex announced one day that he was going to take a chance on the scrub team, his friends were inclined to say tenderly and regretfully, Good night, sweet prince. But Alex knew he was there with the kick, whether it came on the left or right, and he made up his mind to have a go with the canvas-backed titans of the varsity team. One fond friend watching Alex go out on the field drew a sort of consolation from the observation that perhaps Alex was so small the varsity men wouldn't notice him. But Alex soon showed them that he was there, and he got in a punt that made Bland Ballard gasp. The big captain looked first at the ball way up in the air, then looked at Alex and he seemed to say, as the Scotman said when he compared the small hen and the huge egg, I have me doots. It cannot be. After that, the varsity men took notice of Alex. When the ball was passed back to him next, the regulars got through the scrub line so fast that Alex had to try for a run. Bland Ballard caught him up in his arms, and finding him so light and small, spared himself the trouble of throwing him down. Ballard simply sank down on the ground with Alex in his arms, and began rolling it over and over with him toward the scrub goal. Alex cried, Down, down, in a shrill treble voice. That brought an exclamation from the sideline. It's a shame to do it. Bland Ballard is robbing the cradle. Such was Alex Moffat in the fall of 79. Still something of the teeny bits that he was in early boyhood. In two years, Alex's name was on the lips of every gridiron man in the country, and in his senior year as captain, he performed an exploit in goal-kicking that has never been equaled. In the game with Harvard in the fall of 83, he kicked five goals 
four being drop kicks and one from a touchdown. His drop kicks were all of them long, and two of them were made with the left foot. Alex grew in stature and in stanima, and when he was captain, he was regarded as one of the most brilliant fullbacks that the game had ever known. He never was a heavy man, but he was swift and slippery in running, a deadly tackler, and a kicker that had not his equal in his time. Alex remained prominent in football activity until his death in 1914. He served in many capacities, as member of committees, as coach, as a referee, and as umpire. He was a man of happy and sunny nature who made many friends. He loved life, made life joyous for those who were with him. He was idolized at Princeton, and his memory is treasured there now. Willis Terry One of the greatest halfbacks that ever played for Yale is Willis Terry, and it is most interesting to hear this player of many years ago tell of some of his experience, Terry says. It has been asked of me who were the great players of my time. I can only say, judging from their work, that they were all great. But if I were compelled to particularize, I should mention the names of Tompkins, Peters, Hall, Beck, Twombly, Richards. In fact, I would have to mention each team year by year. To them I attribute the success of Yale's football in my time, and for many years after that to the unfailing zeal and devotion of Walter Camp. There were no trainers, coaches, or rubbers at that time. The period of practice was almost continuous for forty-five minutes. It was the idea in those days that by practice of this kind, staying power and the ability would be brought out. The principal points that were impressed upon the players were for the rushers to tackle low and follow their man. This to them was practically a golden text. The fact that a man was injured, unless it was a broken bone or the customarily badly sprained ankle, did not relieve a man from playing every day. It was the spirit though possibly a crude one, that only those men were wanted on the team who could go through the battering of the game from start to finish. The discipline of the team was rigorous. Men were forced to do as they were told. If a man did not think he was in any condition to play, he reported to the captain. These reports were very infrequent, though, for I know in my own case, the first time I reported I was so lame I could hardly put one foot before the other but was told to take a football and run around the track, which was half a mile long and encircled the football field. On my return, I was told to get back in my position and play. As a result, there were very few players who reported injuries to the captain. This, when you figure the manner in which teams are coached today, may appear brutal and a waste of good material, but as a matter of fact, it was not. It made the teams what they were in those days, strong, hard, fast. As to actual results under this policy, I can only say that during my period in college, we never lost a game. Training today is quite different. I think more men are injured nowadays than in my time under our severe training. I think further that this softer training is carried to an extreme, and that football player of today has too much attention paid to his injury, and what he has to say, and the trainer, doctors, and attendants are mostly responsible for having the players incapacitated by their attention. The spirit of Yale in my day, a spirit which was inoculated in our minds in playing games, was never to let a member of the opposing team think that he could beat you. If you experienced a shock or were injured, and it was still possible to get back there to your position, either in the line or backfield, get there at once. If you felt that your injury was so severe that you could not get back, Report to your captain immediately and abide by his decision, which was either to leave the field or to go to your position. It may be said by some of the players today that the punts in those days were more easily caught than those of today. There is nothing to a remark like that. The spiral kick was developed in the fall of 82, and I know that both Richards and myself knew the fellow who developed it. From my experience in the Princeton game, I can testify that Alex Moffat was a past master at it. One rather amusing thing I remember hearing years ago while standing there on old football player watching a Princeton game. The ball was thrown forward by the quarterback, which was a foul. The halfback, who was playing well out, dashed in and caught the ball on the run, evaded the opposing end, 
pushed the halfback aside, and ran half the length of the field, scoring a touchdown. The applause was tremendous, but the umpire who had seen the foul called the ball back. A fair spectator who was standing in front of me asked my friend why the ball was called back. My friend remarked, The Princeton player has just received an encore, that's all. While the game was hard and rough in the early days, yet I consider that the discipline and the training which the men went through were of great assistance to them, physically, morally, and intellectually, in after years, some of the pleasantest friendships that I hold today were made in connection with my football days, among the graduates of my own and other colleges. When fond parents ask the advisability of letting their sons play football, I always tell them of an incident at the Penn Harvard game at Philadelphia one year, which I witnessed from the top of a coach, a young girl who was asked the question, If you were a mother and had a son, would you allow him to play football? The young lady thought for a moment, and then answered in the spirited if somewhat devious fashion, If I were a son and had a mother, you bet I'd play. Memories of John C. Bell In my association with football, among the many friendships I formed, I prize none more highly than that of John C. Bell, whose activity in Pennsylvania football has kept him alive along since his playing day. Let us go back and talk the game over with him. I played football at my prep school days, he says, and on the varsity team of the University of Pennsylvania in the years 82, 83, 84. After graduation, following a sort of nominating mass meeting of the students, I was elected to the football committee of the university about 1886, and served as chairman of that committee until 1901, retiring that season when George Woodruff, after a term of ten years, terminated his relationship as coach of our team. I also served, as you know, as a representative of the university on the football rules committee from about 1886 until the time I was appointed attorney general in 1911. More pleasant associations and relationships I have never had than those with my fellow members of that committee in the late 80s and the 90s, including Camp of Yale, Billy Brooks, Burt Waters, Bob Warren, and Percy Houghton of Harvard, Paul Daschle of Annapolis, Tracy Harris, Alex Moffat, and John Fine of Princeton, and Professor Dennis of Cornell. Later the committee, as you know, was enlarged by the admission of representatives from the West, and among them were Alonzo Stagg of Chicago University and Harry Williams of Minnesota. Finer fellows I have never known, they were one and all nature's noblemen. Some of them, alas, like Alex Moffat, have gone to the great beyond representing rival universities between those student bodies and some of whose alumni partisan feeling ran high in the nineties nothing however save good fellowship and good cheer ever existed between alex and me i am generally glad that i played the game with my teammates witnessed for many years nearly all the big games of the eastern colleges mingled season after season with the players and the enthusiastic alumni of the competing universities in attendance at the annual matches, sat and deliberated each recurring year, as I have said, with those fine fellows who made and amended the rules, and in this way helped to develop the game, the manliest of all our sports, and that I have thus breathed and recreated and been invigorated in a football atmosphere every autumn for more than a third of a century. Growing older every year, one still remains young, as young in heart and spirit as when he donned the moleskins, and caught and kicked and carried the ball himself. And all these football experiences make one a happier, stronger, and more loyal man. I remember in my prep school days, playing upon a team made up of largely of high school boys. One game stands out in my recollection. It was against the freshman team of the University of Pennsylvania captained by Johnny Thayer, who went down with the Titanic. Arriving after the game had started, I came out to the sidelines and called to the captain asking whether I was to play. He glowered at me and made no answer. A few minutes later our second captain called me to come into the game, saying that Smith was only to play until I arrived. Quick as a flash, I stepped into the field to play, and almost instantly Thayer kicked the ball over the rush line, 
and it came bounding down right into my arm. Off I went like a flash through the line, past the backs and full backs, only to be overtaken within a few yards of the goal. The teams lined up, and thereupon Thayer, with his eagle eye looking us over, called out to our captain, How many fellows are you playing, anyways? Instantly our captain ordered Smith off the field, saying, You were only to play until Bell came, and poor Smith left without any audible murmur. This is what might be called one of the accidents of the game. Perhaps the most memorable game in which I played was against Harvard in 1884, when Pennsylvania won upon Forbes Field by the score of 4-0. to It was our first victory over the Crimson, not to be repeated again till the memorable game of 1894, which triumph was again repeated after still another decade in our victory of 1904. This last victory came after five years of continuing defeats, and I remember that we were all jubilant when we heard the news from Cambridge. I recall that Dr. J. William White, C.S. Packard, and I were playing golf at the country club, and when someone brought out the score to us, we dropped our clubs, clasped our hands, and executed an Indian dance, shouting, Ra, 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 Pennsylvania! Why, old staid philosopher, should the leading surgeon of the city the president of his oldest and largest trust company, and the district attorney of Philadelphia, thus jump for joy and become boys once more? Recurring to the game of 1884, I can hear the cheers of the university still ringing in my ears, and when we returned from Harvard a few weeks later, our team went up to Princeton to see the Harvard-Princeton match, and I recall, as though it were yesterday, Alex Moffat, kicking five goals against Appleton's team, three of them with the right foot, two with the left foot. No other player I ever knew or heard of was so ambidextrous, if I may use the word, as Alex Moffat. I remember walking in from the field with Harvard's captain, and he said to me, Moffat is a phenomenon. Truly he was. End of chapter. Recording by CalmDragon.net Chapter 7 of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter 7. Heroes of the Past, George Woodruff's Story. Enthusiastic George Woodruff tells of his football experiences in the following words. I went to Yale, a green farmer boy who had never heard of the college game of football until I arrived at New Haven to take my examinations in the fall of 85. Incidentally, I made the team permanently the second day I was on the field, having scored against the varsity from the middle of the field in three successive runs, whereas the varsity was not able to score against the scrub. I was used perhaps more times than any other man in running with the ball up to a very severe injury to my knee in the fall of 87, just a week and a day before the Princeton game, from which time, until I left college, although I played in all of the championship games, I was not able to run with the ball, actually being on the field only two days after my injury in 87, until the end of the 88 season, outside of the days on which I played the games. I tried not to play in the fall of 88, because of the condition of my knee, and because I was captain of the crew, but Pa Corbin insisted that I must play in the championship games, or he would not row and of course I acceded to his wishes, thereby secretly gratifying my own. And now about the men with whom I played. Kid Wallace played end the entire four years. Wallace was a great amusement and comfort to his fellow players on account of his general desire to put on the appearance of a tough of the worst description, whereas he was at heart a very fine and gallant gentleman. Pudge Heffelfinger played the other guard from me in my last year, and when he first appeared on the Yale field, he was a ridiculous example of a raw-boned westerner, being six foot four inches tall and weighing only about 178 pounds. During the season, however, the exercise and good food at the training table caused Heffelfinger to gain 25 pounds of solid bone, sinew, and muscle. The green days of his first year in 1888 were remembered against him in an affectionate way by the use of Yale for several years of Pa Corbin's oft-reiterated expression brought, brought forth by Pudge's greenness, which would cause Pa to exclaim, Darn you, Heffelfinger! 
with great emphasis on the darn. Billy Graves played on the team during most of these years, he being the most graceful football runner I have ever seen, unless it were Stevenson of Pennsylvania. Lee McClung was a harder worker on his running than most of the men named above, but tremendously effective. He is accredited with being the first man who intentionally started as though to make an end run, and then turned diagonally back through the line, in order to open up the field through which he then ran with incredible speed and determination. This was one of the first premeditated plays of a trick nature, which ultimately led to my invention of the delayed pass, which works upon the same principle, only with incalculably greater ease and effect. The game with Princeton in the fall of 1885 clings to my memory beyond any other game I ever played in, because it was the first real championship game of my career, and I had not as yet fully developed into an actual player. The loss of this game to Princeton in the last of six minutes of playing, because of the Lamar run, Yale had Princeton 5-0, to zero, had been a nightmare to most of the Yale players ever since. I attribute the fact that Yale only had five points to two hard luck facts. Through my own intensity at the beginning of the game, I overran Harry Beecher on my first signal, causing the signal giver to think that I was rattled so that, although I afterward ran with the ball some twenty-five or thirty times with consistent gains of from two to five yards under the almost impossible conditions known as the punt rush, the signal for my regular play was not given again in spite of the fact that my ground gaining had been one of the steadiest features of the Yale play throughout the year, and because Watkinson was allowed to try five times in succession for goals from the field, close up, only one of which he made, whereas Billy Bull could probably have made at least three out of the five. But of course Bull's ability was not so well known then. The direct cause of the Lamar run was due to the fact that all of the fast runners and good tacklers of the Yale line were down the field under a kick, so close to Toller, the other half-back from Lamar, that when Toller muffed the ball so egregiously that it bounded over our heads some fifteen yards, Lamar, who had not come across the field to back Toller up, had been able to get the ball on the ground and on the dead run, thus having in front of him all the Princeton team except Toller, whereas the Yale team was depleted by the fact that Wallace, Corwin, Gill, who had come on as a substitute, myself and even Harry Beecher from quarterback, had run down the field to within a few yards of Toller before he muffed the ball. We all turned and watched Lamar run, being so petrified that not one of us took a step, and although the scene is photographed in my memory, I cannot see one of all the Yale players making a tackle at Lamar. Hodge, the Princeton quarterback, kicked the goal, thus making the score 6-5 to five and winning the game. The outburst from the Princeton contingent at the end of the game was one of the most heartfelt and spontaneous I have ever heard or seen. I understand that practically all of Lamar's uniform was torn into pieces and handed out to the various Princeton girls and their escorts who had come to New Haven to see the game. The Yale-Princeton game in the fall of 1886 was a remarkable as well as a disagreeable one. We played at Princeton when the field at that time combined the elements of stickiness and slipperiness to an unbelievable extent. It rained heavily throughout the game, and the proverbial hog on ice could not have slipped and slathered around worse than all the players on both sides. There was a long controversy about who should act as referee. In those days we had only one official, and after a delay of about an hour from the time the game should have begun, Harris, a Princeton man, was allowed to do the officiating. Bob Corwin, who was end rush, only second to Wallace in his ability, was captain of the team. Yale made one touchdown which seemed to be perfectly fair but which was disallowed, and later, in the second half, Watkinson for Yale kicked the ball so that it rolled across the goal line, whereupon a crowd, which was standing around the ropes, in those days there was practically no grandstand, crowded onto the field where Savage, the Princeton fullback, had fallen on the ball. The general report is that Kid Wallace held Savage while Corwin pulled the slippery ball away from him, and that when Harris, the referee, was able to dig his way through the crowd, he found Corwin on the ball, and in view of the great fuss that had been made about his previous decision, was not able to credit Savage's statement that he, Savage, had said down long before the Yale ends had been able to pull the ball away from him. The result was that the touchdown was allowed. Thereupon the crowd all came onto the field, and we were not able to clear it for some ten or fifteen minutes, so that there was not time enough to finish the full forty-five minutes of the second half of the game before dark. This led to some bitter discussion between Yale and Princeton as to whether the game had been played. This discussion was settled by the intercollegiate committee, 
in declaring that Yale had won the game 4-0, to zero, but that no championship should be awarded. It is interesting to note, however, that all the gold footballs worn by the Yale players of this time are marked champions 1886. A word about the Princeton men who were playing during my four years at college. Irvine was a fine steady player, and his success at Mercersburg is in keeping with the promise shown in his football days. Hector Cohen played against me three years at guard, and he fully deserved the great reputation he had at that time in every particular of the game, including running with the ball. George was one of the very best center rushes I have ever seen, and probably would have made a great player elsewhere along the line if he had been relieved from the obscuring effect of playing center at the time a center had no particular opportunity to show his ability. Snake Ames, for some reason, was never able to do anything against the Yale team during the time I was playing, but his work in some later games that I saw, and in which I officiated, convinced me that he was worthy of his nickname, because there are only a few men who are able to wind their way through an entire field of opponents with as much celerity and effect as Ames would display time after time. In the fall of 86, Yale beat Harvard 29-4, to with great ease, and if it had not been for injuries to Yale players, could probably have made it 50 or 60-0. to zero. Most of the Yale players came out of the game with very disgraceful marks of the roughness of the Harvard men. I had a badly broken nose from an intentional blow. George Carter had a cut requiring eight stitches above his eye. The tackle next to me had a face which was pounded black and blue all over. To the credit of the Harvard men, I will say that they came to the box at the theater that night, occupied by the Yale team, and apologized for what they had done, stating that they had been coached to play in that way, and that they would never again allow anybody to coach who would try to have the Harvard players use intentionally unfair roughness. When I entered Pennsylvania, I found a more or less happy-go-lucky brilliant man, Arthur Knipe, who was not considered fully worthy of being on even the Pennsylvania teams of those days, namely, teams that were being beaten 60 or 70 to 0 by Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. I succeeded in arousing the interest of Knipe, and although in my mind he never, during his active membership of the Pennsylvania team, came up to 75% of his true playing value, he was, even so, undoubtedly the peer of any man that ever played football. Knipe was brilliant but careless, and was at once the joy and despair of any coach who took an interest in his men. He captained the 1894 Pennsylvania team, with which I sprung the guards back and short end defense. Jack Mines I remember seeing, in 1893, standing around on the field as a member of the second or third scrub teams. I suppose he would not have been invited to preliminary training except for his own courage and pertinacity, which caused him to demand to be taken. With no thought that he could possibly make the team, I gradually found myself using him in 1894, until he was a fixture at tackle, although he dodged the scales throughout the entire fall, in order that I might not know that he weighed only 162 pounds. I will not enlarge upon the ability of men like George Brooke, Wiley Woodruff, Buck Wharton, Joe McCracken, John Outland, and others, but anybody speaking of Pennsylvania players during the late 90s cannot pass by Truxton Hare, who stands forth as a Chevalier Bayard among the ranks of college football players. Hare entered Pennsylvania in 97 from St. Paul without any thought that he was likely to be even a mediocre player. He weighed only about 178 pounds at the time, and was immature. Although his wonderfully symmetrical build, in which he looked like a magnified Billy Graves, kept him from looking as large as Heffelfinger at his greatest development at Yale, Hare was certainly ten pounds heavier in fine condition than Heffelfinger was before the latter left Yale. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eugene Smith. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter 8. Anecdotes and Recollections. In the latter 80s, the signal from the quarterback to the center for putting the ball in play was a pressure of the fingers and thumb on the hips of the center. In the 89 championship game between Yale and Princeton, Yale had been steadily advancing the ball, and it looked as if they had started out for a march up the field for a touchdown. In those days, 
signals were not rattled off with the speed that they are given now and the quarterback often took some time to consider his next play during which time he might stand in any position back of the line playing right guard on the princeton team was j r thomas more familiarly known as long tommy he was six feet six or seven inches tall and built more longitudinally than otherwise it occurred to Janeway, who was playing left guard, that Long Tommy's great length and reach might be used to great advantage when occasion offered. He therefore took occasion to say to Thomas, during a lull in the game, If you get a chance, reach over when Wurtenberg, the Yale quarter, isn't looking, and pinch the Yale center so that he will put the ball in play when the backs are not expecting it. The Yale center, by the way, was Bert Hansen. Yale continued to advance the ball on two or three successive plays and finally had a third down with two yards to gain. At this critical moment, the looked-for opportunity arrived. Wurtenberg called a consultation of the other backs to decide on the next play. While the consultation was going on, Long Tommy reached over and gently nipped Hansen where he was expecting the signal. Hansen immediately put the ball in play and as a result, Janeway broke through and fell on the ball for a ten yards gain and first down for Princeton. To say that the Yale team were frantic with surprise and rage would be putting it mildly. Poor Hansen came in for some pretty rough flagging. He swore by all that was good and holy that he had received the signal to put the ball in play, which was true, but Wurtenberg insisted that he had not given the signal. There was no time for wrangling at that moment as the referee ordered the game to proceed. Yale did not learn how that ball came to be put in play until some time after the game, which was the last of the season, when Long Tommy, happening to meet up with Hanson and several other Yale players in a New York restaurant, told with great glee how he gave the signal that stopped Yale's triumphant advance. Numerals and combinations of numbers were not used as signals until 1889. Prior to that, phrases, catchwords, and gestures were the only modes of indicating the plays to be used. For instance, the signal for Hector Cowan of Princeton to run with the ball was an entreaty by the captain, who in those days usually gave the signals, addressed to the team to gain an uneven number of yards. Therefore, the expression, Let's gain three, five, or seven yards, would indicate to the team that Cowan was to take the ball, and an effort was made to open up the line for him at the point at which he usually bucked it. Irvine, the other tackle, ran with the ball when an even number of yards was called for. For a kick, the signal was any phrase which asked a question, as, for instance, how many yards to gain? One of the signals used by Corbin, captain of Yale, to indicate a certain play, was the removal of his cap. They wore caps in those days. A variation of this play was indicated if, in addition to removing his cap, he expectorated emphatically. Hodge, the Princeton quarterback, noticing the cap signals, determined that he would handicap the captain's strategy by stealing his cap. He called the team back and very earnestly impressed upon them the advantage that would accrue if any of them could surreptitiously get possession of Captain Corbin's head covering. Corbin, however, kept such good watch on his property that no one was able to purloin it. Sport Donnelly, who played left end on Princeton's 89 team, was perhaps one of the roughest players that ever went into a game, and at the same time one of the best ends that ever went down the field under a kick. Donnelly was one of the few men that could play his game up to the top notch, and at the same time keep his opponent harassed to the point of frenzy by a continual line of conversation in a sarcastic vein, which invariably got the opposing player rattled. He would say or do something to the man opposite him, which would goad that individual to fury, and then, when retaliation was about to come in the shape of a blow, he would yell, Mr. Umpire! and in many instances the player would be ruled off the field. Donnelly's line of conversation in a Yale game, addressed to Billy Rhodes, who played opposite him, would be somewhat as follows. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, I see Mr. Gill is about to run with the ball. Just then Gill would come tearing around from his position at tackle, and Donnelly would remark, Well, excuse me, Mr. Rhodes, for a moment. I've got to tackle Mr. Gill. 
he would then sidestep in such a manner as to elude rose's manoeuvres to prevent him breaking through and stop gill for a loss hector cowan who was captain of the princeton eighty eight team was another rough player in those days the men in the heat of playing would indulge in exclamations hardly fit for a drawing-room in fact most of the time the words used would have been more in place among a lot of pirates cowan was no exception to the rule so far as giving vent to his feelings was concerned but he invariably used one phrase to do so he was a fellow of sterling character and was studying for the ministry not even the excitement of the moment could make him forget himself to the extent of the other players and where their language would have had to be represented in print by a lot of dashes cowan's could be printed in the blackest face type without offending anyone it was amusing to see this big fellow worked up to the point of explosion wave his arms and exclaim oh sugar it would bring a roar of mock protest from the other players and threats to report him for his rough talk while the men made joke of hector's talk they had a thorough respect for his sterling principles victorious days at yale during the early days of football yale's record was an enviable one the schedules included yale harvard princeton university of pennsylvania rutgers columbia stevens institute of technology dartmouth amherst and university of michigan it is interesting to note that since the formation of the football association in eighteen seventy nine to eighteen eighty nine yale had been awarded the championship flag five times princeton won harvard none yale had won ninety five out of ninety eight games having lost three to princeton one to harvard and one to columbia since eighteen seventy eight yale had lost but one game and that by one point this was the tilly lamar game which princeton won in points yale had scored since points began to be counted three thousand one to her opponents fifty six in goals five hundred thirty to nineteen and in touchdowns two hundred nineteen to nine which is truly a unique record it was during this period that pa corbin a country boy entered yale and in his senior year became captain of the famous eighty eight team this brilliant eleven had a wonderfully successful season and yale men now began to take stock and really appreciate the remarkable record that was hers upon the field of football in commemoration of these victories yale men gathered from far and near crowding delmonico's banquet hall to the limit to pay tribute to yale athletic successes Quote, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout they took the city End quote. in a room beautifully decorated with yale banners and trophies four hundred elis sat down to enjoy the bulldog feast and there honored and cheered to the echo the great football traditions of yale and the men who made her famous by so vast a margin chauncey m depew in his address that evening stated that for the only time in one hundred and eighty-eight years the alumni of yale met solely to celebrate her athletic triumphs pa corbin captain of the victorious eighty eight football team responded as follows quote, again we have met the enemy and he is ours in fact we have been successful so many times there is something of a sameness about it it's a good deal like what the old man said about leading a good life it is monotonous but satisfactory there are perhaps a few special reasons why we won the championship this year but the general principles are the same which have always made us win first by following out certain traditions which are handed down to us year by year from former team captains and coaches the necessity of advancing each year beyond the point attained the year before the mastering of the play of our opponents and planning our game to meet it second by the hard conscientious work such as only a yale team knows how to do third by going on to the field with that high courage and determination which has always been characteristic of the yale eleven something like the spirit of the ancient greeks who went into battle with the decision to return with their shields or on them 
Sometimes they even animated with the spirit which knows no defeat, like the little drummer boy, who was ordered by Napoleon in a crisis in the battle to beat a retreat. The boy did not move. Boy, beat a retreat! He did not stir. But at the third command, he straightened up and said, Sire, I know not how, but I can beat a charge that will wake the dead. He did so, and the troops moved forward and were victorious. It is the same spirit which in many cases has seemed to animate our men. But our victory is due in a great measure this year to a man who knows more about football than any man in this country, who gave much of his valuable time in continually advising and in actual coaching on the field. I refer to Walter Camp, and as long as his spirit hovers over the Yale campus and our tradition for football playing are religiously followed out, there is no reason why Yale should not remain, as she has always been, at the head of American football. Those were Corbin's recollections the year of that great victory. Time has not dimmed them, nor has his memory faded. Rather the opposite. From what follows, you will note that a woman now enters the camp of the Eli coaching staff, mention of whom was not made in Corbin's speech of 88. Pa Corbin prides himself in the fact that 25 years afterward, he brought his old teammates together and gave them a dinner. The menu card tells of the traditional coaching system of Corbin's great team of 88, and beneath the picture of Mr. and Mrs. Walter Camp appears in headlines, Head Coaches of the Yale Football Team of 1888. The head coaches of the Yale team, says Corbin, were really Mr. and Mrs. Walter Camp. They had been married in the summer of 1888 and were staying with relatives in New Haven. Mr. Camp had just begun his connection with a New Haven concern which occupied most of his time. Mrs. Camp was present at Yale Field every day at the football practice and made careful note of the plays, the players, and anything that should be observed in connection with the style of play and the individual weakness or strength. She gave her observations in detail to her husband at supper every night, and when I arrived, Mr. Camp would be thoroughly familiar with that day's practice and would be ready for suggestions as to plays and players to be put in operation the next day. This method was pursued during the entire season and was practically the only systematic coaching that the team received. Of course, there were several old players like Tompkins, 84, Terry, 85, and Knapp, 82, who came to the field frequently. At that time, it was customary for me to snap the ball back to the quarter with my foot. By standing the ball on end and exercising a certain pressure on the same, it was possible to have it bound into the quarterback's hands. It was necessary, therefore, for me to attend to this detail as well as to block my opponent and make holes through the line for the backs. While the rules of the game at that time provided for an umpire as well as a referee, the fact that there was no neutral zone and players were in close contact with each other on the line of scrimmage gave opportunity for more roughness than is customary at the present time. Neither were the officials so strict about their rulings. Prior to this time, it had been customary to give word signals for the different plays, these being certain words which were used in various sentences relating to football and the progress of the game. As center, I was so tall that a system of sign signals was devised, which I used entirely in the Princeton game, and the opponents, from the talk, which continued as usual, supposed that word signals were being used and were entirely ignorant of the sign signals during the progress of the game. The pulling of the visor of my cap was a kick signal. Everything that I did with my left hand and touching different parts of my uniform on the left side, from collar to shoelace, meant a signal for a play at different points on the left side of the line. Similar signals with my right hand meant similar plays on the right side of the line. The system worked perfectly, and there was no case of missed signal. The next year, the use of numbers for signals began, and has continued until the present date. The work of the Yale team during the season was very much retarded by injuries to their best players. The papers were so filled with these accounts that the general opinion of the public was that the team would be in poor physical condition to meet Princeton. As luck would have it, however, 
the invalids reached a convalescing stage in time to enter the wesleyan game on the saturday before the one to be played with princeton in fairly good condition head coach camp and i attended the princeton harvard game at princeton on that day upon our return to new york we received a telegram from mrs camp to the effect that the score made by yale against wesleyan was one hundred five to nothing one of the graduate coaches was much impressed with the opportunity to turn a few pennies and he requested that information to be kept quiet until he could see a few princeton men the result was that he negotiated the small end of several stakes at long odds against yale when the news of the wesleyan score was made public the next morning the opinion of the public changed somewhat as to the merit of the team it nevertheless went into the princeton game as not being the favorite and in the opinion of disinterested persons it was expected that princeton would win handsomely cowan the great has this to say i happened to be down on the grounds to watch the practice just a few days before the yale game they did not have enough scrub to make a good defense jim robinson happened to see me there and asked me to play he had asked me before and i had always refused but this time for some reason i accepted and he took me to the clubhouse i got into my clothes the shoes were about three sizes too small that day i played guard opposite tracy harris i played well enough so that they wanted me to come down the next day as they said they wanted good practice the next day i was put against captain bird who had been out of town the first day i played he had the reputation of being not at all delicate in the way he handled the scrub men who played against him so that they had learned to keep away from him as i had not played before i did not know enough to be afraid of him so when the ball was put in play i simply charged forward at the quarterback and was able to spoil a good many of his plays i heard afterward that bird asked jim robinson who that damn freshman was that played against him next year i was put in bird's place at left guard as he had graduated and fought all comers for the place i was never put on the scrub again my condition when in princeton was the best having been raised in the country i knew what hard work was and in the five years that i played football i never left the field on account of injury either in practice or in games with other teams it is a great thing to play the game of football as hard as you can i never deliberately went to do a man up if he played a rough game i simply played him the harder i never struck a man with my fist in the game i do not remember ever losing my temper perhaps i did not have temper enough when we speak of a football man's nerve i would say that any man who stopped to think of himself is not worthy of the game but there is one man who seemed to me had a little more nerve than the average i think that he played for two years on our scrub and the reason that he was kept there so long was on account of his size he only weighed about 138 pounds but for all the time he played on the scrub he played half back and no one ever saw him hesitate to make every inch he could even though he knew he had to suffer for it in the fall of eighty eight i think yup cook played right tackle on the varsity he was very strong in his shoulders and arms and had the grip of a blacksmith channing this nervy little hundred thirty eight pounder played left halfback on the scrub when he went into the line cook would take him by the shoulders and slam him into the ground our playing field at the time was very dry and the ground was like a rock i used to feel very sorry for the little fellow on his elbows and hips and knees he had raw sores as big as silver dollars yet he never hesitated to make the attempt and he never called down to save himself from punishment the next year he made the team everybody admired him football men must never forget tilly lamar who played halfback i think he was one of the greatest halfbacks and one who would have made a record in any age of football I've seen him go through a line with nearly every man on the opposing team holding him. He would break loose from one after the other. Lamar was a short, chunky fellow and ran close to the ground with his back level, and about the only place one could get hold of him was his shoulders. He would always turn toward the tackler instead of away, and it had the effect of throwing him over his head. The only way that the Yale men could stop him at all was to dive clear under and get him by the legs. You've always heard a lot about Snake Ames. Snake was a very spectacular player, but one very hard to stop. 
especially in an open field. He was very fast, and during the last year of his playing, he developed a duck and would go clear under the man trying to tackle him. This he did by putting one hand flat on the ground so that his body would just miss the ground. Even the good tacklers that Yale always had were not able to stop him. One of Princeton's old reliables was our center, George, 89. He may not have got much out of the plaudits from the grandstand, but those of us who knew what he was doing appreciated his work. We always felt safe as to our center. He was steady and brilliant. It was during this time that Yale developed a wedge play on center. There were no restrictions as to how the line would be formed, and Yale would put all our guards and tackles and ends back, forming a big V with the man with the ball in the center. Yale had been able to knock the opposing center out of the way till they struck George. How well I remember this giant, who was able to hold a whole wedge until he could knock the sides in and pile them up in a bunch. Yale soon gave him up and tried to gain elsewhere. I must tell you about one more of Princeton's football players, not so much for his playing, but for his head work. During the years that I was captain, in the fall of 88, the rules were changed so that one was allowed to block an opponent only by the body. In other words, not allowed to use hands or arms in blocking. It was Sam Hodge who played end and worked out what is known today as boxing the tackle. You can understand what effect it would have on a man who was not used to it. The end would knock the opposing tackle and send him clear out of the play, and the half would keep the end out. I once asked Cowan to tell something about his experiences and men he played against. The Yale team was the great game in my days, he said. Harvard did not have the football instinct as well developed as Yale, and it is one of the Yale players that I have more in mind. One man I will always remember is Gill, who played left tackle for Yale and was captain during his senior year. I remember him because we had a great deal to do with each other. When I ran with the ball, I had to get around him if I made any advance, and I must say that I found it no easy thing to do, as he was a sure tackler. When he ran with the ball, I had the good pleasure of cutting his run short. Another man whom I consider one of the greatest punters of the past is Bull of Yale. I've stopped a good many punts and drop kicks in my play, but I do not remember stopping a single kick of his, and it was not because I did not try. He kicked with his left foot and with his back partially towards the line, would kick a very high ball, and when you jumped into him, on the principle that if you cannot get the ball, get the man, you had the sensation of striking something hard. After Cowan had stopped playing and graduated, he acted as an official in a good many of the big games. He states as follows, You ask about my own experiences as an official, and for experience with other officials. I always got along pretty well as a referee. There was very little kicking on my decisions, but I was good for nothing as an umpire. I could not keep my eyes off the ball, so did not see the fouls as much as I should. You boys have probably heard how I was ruled off the field in a Harvard-Princeton game in 88. I remember Terry of Yale, who refereed that game, above all others. There was a rule at that time that intentional tackling below the knees was a foul, and the penalty was disqualification. Our game had just started. We had only two or three plays. Harvard having the ball, I broke through the line and tackled the man as soon as he had the ball. I had him around the legs, about the knees, but in his efforts to get away, my hand slipped down. But at the moment, remembering the rule, I let him go, and for this, I was disqualified. I might say that we lost the game, for we did not have anyone to take my place. I had always been in my place, and no one ever thought that I would not be there. My being disqualified was probably the reason for the Princeton defeat. I do not think that Terry intended to be unfair. The game had just started, and he was trying to be strict, and without stopping to think whether it was intentional or not. He saw the rule being broken, and acted on the impulse of the moment. I have since heard that Terry felt very bad about it afterwards. I never felt right towards him until I had a chance to get even with him, and it came in this way. The Crescent Club of Brooklyn played the Cleveland Athletic Club at Cleveland. 
George and myself were invited to play with the Cleveland Club, and on the Crescent team were Alex Moffat and Terry. Terry played left halfback, and right here was where I got in my work. When Terry ran with the ball, I generally had a chance to help him meet the earth. I had one chance in particular. Terry got the ball and got around our end, and on a long end run, I took after him, caught him from the side, threw him over my head, out of bounds. As we were both running at the top of our speed, he hit the ground with considerable force. I felt better towards him after this game. In such vivid phrases as these, a great hero of the past tells of things well worth recording. Football competition is very strong. There is the keenest sort of rivalry among college teams. There is very little love on the part of the men who play against each other on the day of the contest. But after the game is all over, and these men meet in after years, very strong friendships are often formed. Sometimes these opponents never meet again, but deep down in their heart, they have a most wholesome regard for each other. And so in my recollections of the old heroes, it will be most interesting to hear in their own words something about their own achievements and experiences in the games they played thirty years ago. Hector Cowan, who captained the 88 team at Princeton, played three years against George Woodruff of Yale. It has been twenty-eight years since that wonderful battle took place between these two men. It is still talked about by people who saw the game. And now let us read what these two contestants say about each other. Of the three years that I played guard, I met George Woodruff as my opponent, says Cowan, and I always felt that he was the strongest man I had to meet and one who was always on the square. He played the game for what it was worth, and he showed later that he could teach it to others by the way he taught the pen team. Says George Woodruff, delving into the old days. Hector Cowan played against me three years at guard, and he fully deserves the reputation he had at that time in every particular of the game, including running with the ball. I doubt whether any other Princeton man was ever more able to make ground whenever he tried, although Cowan was not in any particular a showy player. For some reason or other, Cowan seems to have had a reputation for rough play, which shows how untrue traditions can be handed down. I never played against or with a finer and steadier player, or one more free from the remotest desire to play roughly for the sake of roughness itself. When Heffelfinger's last game had been played, there appeared in a newspaper of November 26, 1888, a farewell to Heffelfinger. Goodbye, Heff, the boys will miss you, and the old men too, and the girls. You tossed the other side about as if they were ten pins. You took little Bliss under your wing, and he ran with the ball like a pilot boat by the Teutonic. You used eyes, ears, shoulders, legs, arms, and head, and took it all in. You're the best football rusher America or the world has shown. And best of all, you've never slugged, lost your temper, or did anything mean. Oh, come, thou mighty one, go not away, the team thou must not fail. Stay where thou art, please, Heffelfinger, stay, and still be true to Yale. Linger, yet linger, Heffelfinger, a truly civil engineer. His trust would ne'er surrender. Unstrap thy trunks, excuse this scalding tear. Still be Yale's best defender. Linger, oh, linger, Heffelfinger. Princeton and Harvard, there is cause to fear, will dance joy's double shuffle when of thy western flight they come to hear. Stay in their tempers ruffle. Linger, oh, linger, Heffelfinger. John Cranston My inspiration for the game came when my country cousin returned from Exeter and told me he believed I had the making of a football player, says John Cranston who was Harvard's famous old setter and former coach. At once I pestered him with all kinds of questions about the requirements and believed that some day I would do something. I shall always remember my first day on the field at Exeter. Lacking the wherewithal to buy the regulation suit, 
I appeared in the none too strong blue shirt and overalls used on the farm. I remember, too, that it was not long before Harding said, Take that young countryman to the gymnasium before he's injured for life. He doesn't know which way to run when he gets the ball. He doesn't know the game, and he looks too thick-headed to play the game anyway. As boys on neighboring farms in western New York, three of us, who were later to play on different college teams, hunted skunks and rabbits together. Had we been on the same team, we would have been side by side. Cook was a great tackle at Princeton, Reed, one of the best guards Cornell ever had, and I, owing to some good teammates, played as center on the first Harvard eleven to defeat Yale. It is said that Cook in his first game at Exeter grabbed the ball and started for his own goal for a touchdown, and that Reed, after playing the long afternoon in the game which Cornell won, asked the referee which side was victorious. I well remember that at Exeter we were planning how to celebrate our victory over Andover, even to the most minute detail. We knew who was to ring the academy and church bells of the town, and where we were to have the bonfire at night. We were deprived of that pleasure on account of the great playing and better spirit of the Andover team. A few of our Exeter men, then and there, made a silent compact that Exeter would feel a little better after another contest with Andover. The following three years, we defeated Andover by large scores. Anyone who has played the game can recall some amusing situations. I recall the first year at Harvard, when we were playing against the Andover team, that suddenly the whole Andover school gave the Yale cheer. Dud Dean, who was behind me, fired up and said it was the freshest thing he had ever heard. At Springfield, I remember one Yale-Harvard game started with ten men of my own school, Exeter, in the game. In another Yale game, we were told to look ugly and defiant as we lined up to face Yale, but I was forced to laugh long and hard when I found myself facing Frankie Barber, the little Yale quarter, who lived with me in the same dormitory at Exeter for three years. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter 9A. The 90s and After. Men of today who never had an opportunity of seeing Foster Sanford play will be interested in some anecdotes of his playing days and to read in another chapter of this book some of his coaching experiences. As a boy, says Sandy, I lived in New Haven. I chalked the lines on the football field for the game in which Tilly Lamar made his famous run for Princeton. I played on the college team two years before I entered Yale. I learned a lot of football playing against Billy Rhodes, that great Yale tackle. I'll tell you about the day I made the Yale team in my freshman year. Pa Corbin took me in hand. I think he wanted to see if I had lots of nerve. He told me to report at nine o'clock for practice. He put me through a hard, grueling workout, showing me how to snap the ball, how to charge and body check. All this took place in a driving rain, and he kept me out until one o'clock when he said, You can change your jersey now, that is, put on a dry one. I went over to the training table then to see if I couldn't get some dinner. Believe me, I was hungry, but everyone had finished his meal and all I could pick up was the things that were left. Here I ran into a fellow named Brennan who said, they're trying to do you up. This is the day they are deciding whether you will be center rush or not. I then went out to Yale Field and joined the rest of the players, and the stunts they put me through that afternoon I will never forget. But I remember what Brennan had told me, and it made me play all the harder. To tell the truth, after practice I realized that I was so sore I could hardly put one foot ahead of the other. To make matters worse, the coaches told me to run into town, a distance of two miles, while they drove off in a bus. I didn't catch the bus until they were on Park Street, but I pegged along just the same and beat them into the gate. Billy Rhodes and Pa Corbin took care of me and rubbed me down. It seems as though they rubbed every bit of skin off me. I was like fire. That's the day I made the Yale team. I was twenty years old, six feet tall, and weighed about two hundred pounds. When I asked Sandy who gave him the hardest game of his life, he replied promptly, Wharton of Pennsylvania. He got through me. Park Davis's enthusiasm for football is known the country over.
from his experience as a player, as a coach, and writer, he has become an authority. Let us read some of his recollections. Years ago there was a high-spirited young player at Princeton serving his novitiate upon the scrub. One day an emergency transferred him for the first time in his career to the varsity. The game was against a small college. This sudden promotion was possible through his fortunate knowledge of the varsity signals. Upon the first play a fumble occurred. Our hero seized the ball. A long service upon the scrub had ingrained him to regard the Princeton varsity men always as opponents. In the excitement of the play he became confused when, lo, he leaped into flight toward the wrong goal. Dashing around Princeton's left end, he reversed his field and crossed over to the right. Phil King, Princeton's quarterback, was so amazed at the performance that he was too spellbound to tackle his comrade. Down the backfield the player sped towards his own goal. Shep Homans, his fullback, took in the impending catastrophe at a glance and dashed forward, laid the halfback low with a sharp tackle, thereby preventing a safety. The game was unimportant, the Princeton score was large, so the unfortunate player, although the butt of many a jest, soon survived all jokes and jibes and became in time a famous player. The first Princeton-Yale game in 1873, being played under the old association rules, was waged with a round ball. In the first scrimmage, a terrific report sounded across the field. When the contending players had been separated, the poor football was found upon the field a flattened sheet of rubber. Two toes had struck it simultaneously, or someone's huge chest had crushed it, and the ball had exploded. Whenever men are discussing the frantic enthusiasm of some fellows of the game, I always recall the following episode as a standard of measurement. The Rules Committee met one night at the Martinique in New York for their annual winter session. Just as the members were going upstairs to convene, I had the pleasure of introducing George Foster Sanford to Fielding H. Yost. The introduction was made in the middle of the lobby, directly in the way of the traffic passing in and out of the main door. The Rules Committee had gone into its regular session. The hour was eight o'clock in the evening. When they came down at midnight, these two great football heroes were standing in the very spot where they were introduced four hours before, and they were talking, as they had been every minute throughout the four hours, about football. Members of the committee joked with the two enthusiasts, and then retired. When they came downstairs the next morning at eight o'clock, they found the two fanatics seated upon a bench nearby, still talking football, and that afternoon, when the committee had finished its labors and had adjourned scene D.A., they left Sanford and Yost still in the lobby, still on the bench, hungry and sleepy, and still talking football. This anecdote will be a good one for Park Davis's friends to read, for how he ever stayed out of that talk fest is a mystery. Maybe he did. Now that Yost and Sanford have retired, we will let Park continue. A few years ago, everybody except Dartmouth men laughed at the football which, bounding along the ground at Princeton, suddenly jumped over the crossbar and gave to Princeton a goal from the field which carried with it the victory. But did you ever hear that in the preceding season, in a game between two southern Pennsylvania colleges, a ball went awry from a drop kick, striking in the chest a policeman who had strayed upon the field? The ball rebounded and clearly caromed between the goal-post for a goal from the field. Years ago, Lafayette and Pennsylvania State College were waging a close game at Easton. Suddenly, and without being noticed, Morton F. Jones, Lafayette's famous center rush in those days, left the field of play to change his headgear. The ball was snapped in play, and a fleet Penn State halfback broke through Lafayette's line, and, armed with the ball, dodged the second barriers and threatened, by a dashing sprint, to score in the extreme corner of the field. As he reached the ten-yard line, to the amazement of all, Jones dashed out of the sideline crowd upon the field between the ten-yard line and his goal, thereby intercepting the state halfback, tackling him so sharply that the latter dropped the ball. Jones picked it up and ran back forty yards. There was no rule at that time which prevented the play, and so Penn State ultimately was defeated. Jones not only was a hero, but his exploit long remained a mystery to many who endeavored to figure out how he could have been twenty-five yards ahead of the ball and between the runner and his own goal line. A story is told of the wonderful dodging ability of Phil King, Princeton 93. He was known throughout the football world as one of the shiftiest runners of his day. Through his efficient work, King had fairly won the game against Yale in 93. The next year the Yale men made up their minds that the only way to defeat Princeton was to take care of King, and they were ever on the alert to watch him whenever he got the ball. The whole Yale team was looking for King throughout this game. On the kickoff, Phil got the ball, and all the Yale forwards began to shout, Here he comes, here he comes! And then, as he was cleverly dodging and evading the Yale players, one of the backs, who was waiting to tackle him low, was heard to say, 
There he goes. Those of the old-timers who study the picture of the flying wedge on the opposite page will get a glimpse of Phil King about to set in motion one of the most devilishly ingenious maneuvers in the history of the game. With all the formidable power behind him, the old reliables of what the modern analytical coaches are pleased to term the farce plays. Balliette, Beef Wheeler, Biffy Lea, Gus Hawley, Frank Morse, Doggy Trenchard, Douglas Ward, Knox Taylor, Harry Brown, Jerry McCauley, and Jim Blake, King, nevertheless, stood out in lonely eminence, ready to touch the ball down, await the thunder of the joining lines of interference, and pick up the tremendous pace, either at the apex of the crashing V, or cunningly concealed and swept along to meet the terrific impact with the waiting line of blue. Great was the crash thereof, and it was a safe wager that King with the ball would not go unscathed. This kind of football brought to light the old-time indomitable courage of which the stalwarts of those days loved to talk at every gridiron reunion. But for the moment let us give Yale the ball and stand the giant Princeton team upon defense. Let us watch George A.D. get the ball from Phil Stillman, and with his wonderful football genius develop a smashing play enveloped in a locked line of blue, grim with the menace of Orville Hickok, Jim McCree, Anse Beard, Fred Murphy, Frank Hinkey, and Jack Greenway. Onward, these mighty Yale forwards ground their way through the Princeton defense, making a breach through which the mighty Butterworth, Bronk Armstrong, and Brink Thorne might bring victory to Yale. This was truly a day when giants clashed. As you look at these pictures, do the players of today wonder any longer that the heroes of the olden time are still loyal to the game of their first love? If you ever happen to go to China, I am sure one of the first Americans you will hear about would be Pop Gailey, once a king of football centers and now a leader in YMCA work in China. Lafayette first brought Pop Gailey forth in 93 and 94, and he was the champion All-American center of the Princeton team in 96. He had a wonderful influence over the men on the team. He was an example well worth following. His manly spirit was an inspiration to those about him. After one of the games, a newspaper said, Old Gailey stands firm as the eternal Calvinistic faith, which he intends to preach when his football scrimmages are over. To Charlie Young, the present professor of physical instruction of the Cornell University Gymnasium, I cannot pay tribute high enough for the fine football spirit and the high regard with which we held him while he was at the Princeton Seminary. He certainly loved to play football, and he used to come out and play on the scrub team against the Princeton varsity. He was not eligible to play on the Princeton team, as he had played his allotted time at Cornell. The excellent practice he gave the Princeton team, yes, more than practice, it was oftentimes victory for him as well as the scrub. He made Poe and Palmer ever alert, and did much to make them the stars they were, as Charlie's long suit was running back punts. His head work was always in evidence. He was a great field general. One of his most excellent qualities was that of punting. His was an ideal example for men to follow. Princeton men were the better for having played with, and against, a high-type man like Charlie Young. An Evening with Jim Rogers Jim Rogers gave all there was in him to Yale athletics. Not a single year has passed since he played his last game of football, but has seen him back at the Yale field, coaching and giving the benefit of his experience. Jim Rogers was captain of the 97 team at New Haven, and the traditions that can be written about a winning captain are many. No greater pleasure can be afforded any man who loves to hear an old football player relate experiences than to listen, while Rogers tells of his own playing days, and of some of the men in his experience. It was once my pleasure to spend an evening with Jim in his home, really a football home. Mrs. Rogers knows much of football, and as Jim enthusiastically and with wonderfully keen recollection tells of the old games, a twelve-year-old boy listens, as only a boy can, to his father, his great hero, and as Jim puts his hand on the boy's shoulders, he tells him the ideal of his dreams is to have him make the Yale team some day, and an enthusiastic daughter who sits near hopes so too. His scrapbooks and athletic pictures go to make a rare collection. Many of us would like to have seen Jim Rogers begin his football career at Andover when he was sixteen years old. It was there that his one hundred eighty pounds of bone and muscle stood for much. It was at Andover that Bill Odin, that great Dartmouth man, coached so many wonderful prep school stars, who later became more famous at the colleges to which they went. Rogers went to Yale, with a big rep. He had been captain of the Andover team. In the fall of ninety-two, Andover beat Brown twenty-four to zero. Jim Rogers was very conspicuous on the field, not only on account of his good playing and muscular appearance, but because his blonde hair, which he wore very long as a protection, was very noticeable. From this Yale player, whose friends are legion, 
let us read some experiences and catch his spirit. I was never a star player, but I was a reliable. In my freshman year I did not make the team, owing to the fact that I had bad knees and better candidates were available. This was the one year in Yale football, perhaps in all football, when the team that played the year before came back to college with not a man missing. Frank Hinkey had been captain the year before, and then came through as senior captain. There was not a senior on Frank Hinkey's team. The first team, therefore, all came back. Al Jerems and Lewis Hinkey were the only additions to the old team. Perhaps the keenest disappointment that ever came to me in football was the fact that I could not play in that famous Yale-Harvard game my freshman year. However, I came so very near it that Billy Rhodes and Heffelfinger came around to where I was sitting on the sidelines, after Fred Murphy had been taken out of the game. They started to limber me up by running me up and down the sideline, but Hinky, the captain, came over to the sideline and yelled for Chadwick, who went into the game. I had worked myself up into a highly nervous condition anticipating going in, but now I realized my knees would not allow it. The disappointment that day, though, was very severe. To show you what a hold these old games had on me, many years after this game Hinky and I were talking about this particular game when he said to me, you never knew how close you came to getting into that Springfield game, Jim. Then I told him of my experience, but he told me that he had it in his mind to put me in at halfback, and ever since then, when I think of it, cold chills run up and down my spine. It absolutely scared me stiff to think how I might have lost that game, even though I never actually participated in it. The Yale football management, however, on account of my work during the season, decided to give me my Y, gold football, and banner. The banner was a blue flag with the names of the team and the position they played in the score, 12-6. to 6. It was a case where I came so near winning that they gave it to me. Jim Rogers played three years against Gary Cochran, and this great Princeton captain stands out in his recollections of the Yale-Princeton games. He goes on to say, If it had not been for Gary Cochran, I might be rated as one of the big tackles of the football world today. I used to dream of him three weeks before the Princeton game, how I was going to stand him off, and let me tell you, if you got in between Doc Hillerbrand and Gary Cochran, you were a sucker. Those games were a nightmare to me. Cochran used to fall on my foot, box me in, and hold me there, and keep me out of the play. Jim Rogers is very modest in this statement. The very reason that he is regarded as a truly wonderful tackle is on account of the great game he played against Cochran. How wonderfully reliable he was, football history well records. He was always to be depended upon. In the fall of 1897, when I was captain of the Yale team, Rogers continues, perhaps the most spectacular Yale victory was pulled off, when Princeton, with the exception of perhaps two men, and virtually the same team that had beaten Yale the year before, came on the field, and through overconfidence or lack of training did not show up to their best form. We were out for blood that day. I said to Johnny Baird, Princeton quarterback, Princeton is great today. We have played ten minutes, and you haven't scored. Johnny, with a look of determination upon his face, said, You fellows can play ten times ten minutes, and you'll never score. But the Princeton football hangs in the Yale trophy room. I have always claimed that Charlie DeSalles put the Yale 97 team on the map. Charlie DeSalles, with his three wonderful runs, which averaged not less than sixty yards each, really brought about the victory. Frank Butterworth, as head coach, will always have my highest regard. He did more than anyone alive could have done to pull off an apparently impossible victory. One great feature of this game was Ad Kelly's series of individual gains, aided by Hillebrand and Edwards, through Rogers and Chadwick. Kelly took the ball for forty consecutive yards up the field in gains of from one to three yards each, when, fortunately for Yale, a fumble gave them the ball. When the fumble occurred, I happened at the time to break through very fast. There lay the ball upon the ground, and nobody but myself near it. The great chance was there to pick it up, and perhaps, even with my slow speed, gained twenty to thirty yards for Yale. No such thought, however, entered my head. I wanted that ball, and curled up around it, and hugged it as a tortoise would close in its shell. My recollection is now that I sat there for about five minutes before anybody deigned to fall on me. At all events, I had the ball. Gordon Brown played as a freshman on my team. He had a football face that I liked. He weighed a hundred and eighty-five pounds, and was six feet four inches tall. Gordon went up against Bove in the Harvard game, and the critics stated that Bove was the best guard in the country that year. I said to Gordon, "'Play this fellow the game of his life, and when you get him let me know, and I'll send some plays through you.' After about sixty minutes of play Gordon came to me and said, "'Jim, I've got him.' And he had him all right, for we were then successful in gaining through that part of the Harvard line. Gordon Brown was a very earnest player. 
He would allow nothing to stop him. He got his ears pretty well bruised up, and they bothered him a great deal. In fact, he did have to lay off two or three days. He came to me and said, Do you think this injury will keep me out of the big game? Well, I'll see if the trainer cannot make a headgear for you. Well, I'll tell you this, Jim, said Gordon. I'll have him cut off before I'll stay out of the game. This amused me, and I said, Gordon, you have nothing of beauty to lose. You will keep your ears, and you will play in the big games. Gordon Brown's team, under Malcolm McBride as head coach, was a wonder. This eleven, to our minds, was the best ever turned out by Yale University. They defeated Princeton 29-5, to and the powerful Harvard team 28-0. to Their one weakness was that they had no long punter, but, as they expressed it to me afterward, they had no need of one. At one time during the game with Harvard they took the ball on their own ten-yard line and, instead of kicking, marched it up the field, and in a very few rushes scored a touchdown. Harvard men afterwards told me that after seeing a few minutes of the game, they forgot the strain of Harvard's defeat in their admiration of Yale's playing. This team showed the highest coordination between the Yale coaching staff, the college, and the players, and they set a high watermark for all future teams to aim at, which was all due to Gordon Brown's genius for organization and leadership. It has been my experience in talking of football stars with some of the old-timers that Frank Hinkey heads the list. I cannot let Frank Hinkey remain silent this time. He says, I think it was in the fall of 95 that Skim Brown, who played the tackle position, was captain of the scrubs team at New Haven. Brown was a very energetic scrub captain. He was continuously urging on his men to better work. As you recall, the cry, tackle low and run low, was continuously called after the teams in those days. Brown's particular pet phrase in urging his men was, run low, so that he, whenever the halfback received the ball, would immediately start to holler, run low, and would keep this up until the ball was dead. He got so in the habit of using this call when on the offense, that one day, when the quarterback called upon him to run with the ball from the tackle position, even before he got the ball he started to cry, run low, while carrying the ball himself, and continued to cry out, run low, even after he had gained ground for about fifteen yards and until the ball was dead. It was in the fall of 92, when Vance McCormick was captain of the Yale team, and Diney O'Neill was trying for the guard position. As you know, the linemen are very apt to know only the signals on offense which call for an opening at their particular position, and even then a great many of them never know the signals. Now Diney was bright enough, but like most linemen did not know the signals. It happened one day that McCormick, at the quarterback position, called several plays during the afternoon that required O'Neill to make an opening. O'Neill invariably failed because he didn't know the signals. McCormick, suspecting this, finally gave O'Neill a good calling down. The calling down fell flat in its effects on O'Neill, as his reply to McCormick was, "'To hell with your mystic signs and symbols. Give me the ball!' The real founder of football at Dartmouth was Bill Odlin, writes Ed Hall. Odlin learned his football at Andover, and came to Dartmouth with a class of ninety, and it was while he was in college that football really started. He was practically the only coach. He was a remarkable kicker, certainly one of the best, if not the best. In the fall of 89, Odlin was captain of the team and playing fullback. Harvard and Yale played at Springfield, and on the morning of the Harvard-Yale game, Dartmouth and Williams played on the same field. It was in this game in the fall of 89 that he made his most remarkable kick, in which the wind was a very important element. In the second half, Odlin was standing practically on his own ten-yard line. The ball was passed back to him to be kicked, and he punted. The kick itself was a remarkable kick, and perfect in every way, but when the wind caught it, it became a wonder, and it went along like a balloon. The wind was really blowing a gale, and the ball landed away beyond the Williams quarterback, and the first bounce carried it several yards beyond their goal line. Of course, any such kick as this would have been absolutely impossible except for the extreme velocity and pressure of the wind, but it was easily the longest kick I ever saw. Three times during Odlin's football-playing days he kicked goals from the 65-yard line, and while at Andover he kicked a placed kick from a mark in the exact center of the field, scoring a goal. When brown men discuss football, their recollections go back to the days of Hopkins and Millard, of Robinson, McCarthy, Fultz, Everett Colby, and Gammons, Fred Murphy, Frank Smith, the giant guard, that great spectacular player, Richardson, and other men mentioned elsewhere in this book. In a recent talk with that sterling fellow, Dave Fultz, he told me something about his football career. It was, in part, as follows. I played at Brown in 94, 95, 96, and 97, captaining the team in my last year. Gammons and I played the, in the backfield together. He was unquestionably a great runner with the ball, 
one of the hardest men to hurt I think I ever saw. I have often seen him get jolts, go down, and naturally one would think go out entirely, but when I would go up to him he would jump up as though he had not felt it. I think Everett Colby was as good a man interfering for the runner as I have seen. He played quarterback and captained the Brown team in 96. I don't think there was ever a better quarterback than Willis D. Richardson, rich as we used to call him. Dave Fultz is very modest, and when he discusses his football experiences, he sidetracks one and talks of his fellow college players. Now that I have pinned him down, he goes on to say, The day before we played the Indians one year, my knee hurt me so much that I had to go to the doctor. He put some sort of ointment on it. Two days before this game, I could hardly move my leg. The doctor threatened me with water on the knee. He told me to go to bed and stay there, but I told him we had a game in New York and I had to go. He said, All right, if you want water on the knee... I said, I've got to go, if I am at all able. Anyway, I went on down to New York with the team and played in the game. All I needed was to get warmed up good, and I went along in great shape. Those who remember reading the accounts of that game will recall that Dave Fultz made some miraculous runs that day, and was a team in himself. Fred Murphy, who was captain of the 98 team at Brown and played end rush, says, I think Dave Fultz played under more difficulties than any man that ever played the game. I have seen him play with a heavy knee brace. He had his shoulder dislocated several times, and I have seen him going into the game with his arm strapped down to his side, so that he could just use his forearm. He played a number of games that way. That happened when he was captain. He was absolutely conscientious, fearless, and a good leader. End of chapter 9, part A Chapter 9B of Football Days this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter 9. The Nineties and After, Part B. In 1904, Fred Murphy coached at Exeter. Fred says, This was probably the best team that Exeter had had up to that time. The team was captained by Tommy Thompson, who afterwards played at Cornell. Eddie Hart at that time stripped at about 195 pounds. This was the famous team on which Donald Mackenzie McFadden played and later made the Princeton varsity. Tad Jones was quarterback the first year he came to school. In those days they took to football intuitively, without much coaching. You never had to tell Tad Jones a thing more than once. He would think things out for himself. He showed great powers of leadership and good football sense. Howard Jones and Harry Vaughn played on this team. Charlie McCarthy of Brown will long be remembered for his great punting ability, says Fred Murphy. He had a great many pet theories. McCarthy is one of the best football men in the Brown list. In a letter which I have received from Charlie McCarthy, as a result of a wonderful victory over Minnesota one year, McCarthy writes, The students of the university gave me a beautiful gold watch engraved on the inside, to our friend Mac from the students of the University of Wisconsin. This shows how highly McCarthy is held at this university. McCarthy continues, I go out every fall and kick around with the boys still, and I hope to do so the rest of my life if I get a chance. I think the greatest football player I ever saw was Frank Hinkey. Speaking of my own ability as a player, I haven't much to say. I was not much of a football player, but I got by some way. I neither had the physique nor the ability, but tried to do my best. I am glad to say no one ever called me a quitter. I am proud to say that Brown University gave me a beautiful silver cup at the end of my four years for the best work in football, although the said cup belongs by rights to ten other men on the team. As one visits the dressing room of the New York Giants and sees the attendant work upon the wonderful physique of Christy Mathewson, one cannot help but realize what a potent factor he must have been on Bucknell's team. When Christy played, he was six feet tall and weighed 168 pounds stripped. He prepared at Keystone Academy, playing in the line. In 1898, when he went to Bucknell, he was immediately put at fullback and played there three years. Fred Crolius says of him, Of all the long-distance punters with hard kicks to handle, Percy Houghton and Christy Mathewson stand out in his memory. Mathewson had the leg power to turn his spiral over. That is, instead of dropping where ordinary spirals always drop, an additional turn seemed to carry the ball over the head of the back who was waiting for the ball, often carrying some fifteen or twenty yards beyond. Football has no more ardent admirer than Christy Mathewson. It will be interesting to hear what he has to say of his experience in the game of football. I like to play football, says Mathewson. I was a better football player than a baseball player in those days. 
I was considered a good punter. I was not much as a linebacker. The captain of the team always gave me a football to take with me in the summer. I occasionally had an opportunity to practice kicking after I was through with my baseball work. At Taunton, Massachusetts, my first summer, I ran across a fellow who was playing third base on the team for which I was pitching. McAndrews was his name. He was a Dartmouth man. He showed me how to kick. He showed me how to drop a spiral. I liked to drop kick and used to practice it quite a little. I remember how tough it was for me when Bucknell played Annapolis the year before when the Navy team had a man who could kick such wonderful spirals. They were terribly hard to handle, and I was determined to profit by his example. So I just hung on for dear life, punting spirals all summer. Later, I used to watch George Brooke punt a good deal when he was coaching. At that time, drop kickers were not so numerous. I had some recollection of a fellow named O'Day, who had a great reputation as a drop kicker, as did Hudson of Carlisle. In 1898 we were to play Pennsylvania. Our team served as a preliminary game for Pennsylvania. They often beat us by large scores. Since then we have had teams which made a 6-5 to five score. But they had good teams in my time. We never scored on Penn, as I recall. Our coach said one day at the training table, I'll give a raincoat to the fellow who scores on Penn today. The manager walked in and overheard his remark and added, Yes, and I'll give a pair of shoes to the man who makes the second score against Penn. That put some pep into us. Anyway, we were on Penn's 35-yard line, and I kicked a field goal. After this, we rushed the ball and got up to Penn's 40-yard line, and from there I scored again, thereby winning the shoes and the raincoat. I went up to Columbia one day to see them practice. It was in the days when Foster Sanford was their coach. He saw me standing on the sidelines, came over to where I was, looked me over once or twice, and finally said, "'Why aren't you trying out for the team? I think you'd make a football player if you came out.' I said I guessed I would not be eligible. Why? asked Sandy. Well, I said, because I'm a professional. Then some fellows around me grinned and told Sanford who I was. I love to think of the good old football days and some of the spirit that entered collegiate contests. Once in a while in baseball, I feel the thrill of that spirit. It was only recently that I experienced that get-together spirit, where a team full of life with everybody working together wrought great results. That same old thrill came to me during one of the Giants' trips in the West, in which they won seventeen straight victories. There is much good fellowship in football. I played against teams whose cheerleaders would give you a rousing cheer as you made a good play. Then again, you would meet the fellow who, when you were down in the scrimmage, or after you had kicked the ball, would try to put you down and out. One of the pleasantest recollections I have of playing was my experience against the two great academy teams, West Point and Annapolis. Never shall I forget one year when Bucknell played West Point. At an exciting moment in the game, Bucknell players made it possible for me to be in a position to kick the goal from the field from a difficult angle. After the score had been made, the West Point team stood there stupefied, and when the crowd got the idea that a goal had been kicked from a peculiar angle, they gave us a rousing cheer. Such is the proper spirit of American football, to see some sunshine in your opponent's play. Cheering helps so much to build up one's enthusiasm. Al Sharp was one of the greatest all-round athletes that ever wore the blue of Yale. He, too, recalls the Yale-Princeton game of 1899 at New Haven, but the memory comes to him as a nightmare. When I think about the 11-10 to 10 game at New Haven, which Princeton won, said Sharp the last time I saw him, I remember that after I had kicked a goal from the field and the score was 10-6, to 6, Skim Brown rushed up to me and nearly took me off my feet with one of his friendly slaps across my back. Well, I do remember the joy of the great Yale player at this stage of the game. Later, when Poe made his kick and I saw that the ball was going over the bar, I remember that the thing I wished most was that I could have been back up in the line where I might have had a chance to block the kick. My recollections of making the Yale team centered chiefly around three facts, none of which I was allowed to forget. First, that I was not any good. Second, that I couldn't tackle. And third, that I ran like an ice wagon. Since then, I have seen so many really good players upon my different squads that I must admit the truth of the above statement, although at the time I am frank to say I took exception to it. Such is the optimism of youth. Jack Munn, a former Princeton halfback, tells the following story. My brother, Edward Munn, was the manager of the Princeton team in 1893. In the spring of that year there was a conference with Yale representatives to decide where the game was to be played the following fall. Berkeley Oval, Brooklyn, Manhattan Field, and the respective fields of the two colleges all came under discussion, and I believe that some of the newspapers must have taken it up. One afternoon, in the Murray Hill Hotel, 
when representatives of Yale and Princeton were discussing the various possibilities, a bellboy knocked at the door and handed my brother an elaborately engraved card on which, among various decorations, the name of Colonel Cody was to be distinguished. Buffalo Bill was invited to come up, and it seems that, reading or hearing of the discussion about the field for the game, he came to make a formal offer of the use of his tent. After setting forth the desirability of staging the game under the auspices of his Wild West show, he brought his offer to a close with his trump card. For, gentlemen, he said, besides all the other advantages which I have mentioned, there is this further attraction. My tent is well and sufficiently lighted, so that you can not only hold a matinee, but you can give an evening performance as well. And those were the days of the flying wedge, and two forty-five-minute halves, with only ten-minute intermission. Walter C. Booth Walter C. Booth, a former Princeton center rush, was one of the select coterie of Eastern football men that wended its way westward to carry the Eastern system into institutions that had had no opportunity to build up the game, yet were hungry for real football. Booth's trip was a successful one. In the autumn of 1900, after graduating from college, I arrived at Lincoln, Nebraska, in the dual role of law student and football coach of the State University, says Booth. This was my first trip west of Pittsburgh, and I viewed my new duties with some apprehension. All doubts and fears were soon put at rest by the hearty encouragement and support that I received and retained in my Nebraska football relations. Most of the faculty were behind football, and H. Benjamin Andrews, at that time the head of the university, was a staunch supporter of the game. Dr. Roscoe Pound, later dean of Harvard Law School, was the father of Nebraska football. He had as intimate an acquaintance with the rule book as any official I have ever known. His advice on knotty problems was always valuable. James I. Wire, afterwards State Librarian of New York, was our first financial director, and it was largely by reason of his unflagging zeal that football survived. Football spirit ran high in the Missouri Valley, and there were many hard-fought contests among the teams of Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska. Those who saw these games, or played in them, will never forget them. Many amusing things happened in that section as well as in the East. The Haskell Indians were a picturesque team. They represented the government school at Lawrence, Kansas, an institution similar to that of Carlisle. In fact, many of the same players played on both teams at different times. We always found them a hard nut to crack, and Redwater, Archiquette, Hauser, and other Indian stars made their names well known on our field. John Outland, the noted Pennsylvania player, had charge of the Indians when I knew them. He was a great player and a fine type of man, who succeeded in imparting some of his own personality to his pupils. He once showed me a dark-faced Indian in Lawrence, who must have been at least six feet four inches tall, and of superb physique. He was a full-blooded Cheyenne, and went by the name of Bobtail Billy. Outland tried hard to break him in at guard, but as no one understood Bobtail's dialect, and he understood no one else, he never learned the signals, and proved unavailable. We traveled far to play in those days, west to Boulder, Colorado, handicapped by an altitude of five thousand feet south to Kansas City, and north as far as St. Paul and Minneapolis. We were generally about five hundred miles from our base. We were not able to take many deadheads. Harry Kersberg is one of the most enthusiastic Harvard football players I have ever met. He played guard on Harvard in 1904, 05, and 06, and is often asked back to Cambridge to coach the center men. From his playing days, let us read what he prizes in his recollections. My college career began at Lehigh with the idea of eventually going to Harvard. As a football enthusiast, I came under the observation of Dr. Newton, who was coaching Lehigh at that time. Doc taught me the first football I ever knew. In one of the games against Union College, Doc asked me before the game whether, if he put me in, I would deliver the goods. I said I would try and do my best. He said, That won't do. I don't want any men on my team who says, I'll try. A man has got to say, I'll do it. From that time on I never said I'll try, but always said I'll do it. I shall never forget the day I played against John DeWitt. I did not know much about the finer points of football then. I weighed about 165 pounds, with my football clothes on, was 5 feet 9 inches tall, and 16 years old. I shall always remember seeing that great big hawk of a man opposite me. I did not have cold feet. I knew I had to go in and give the best account of myself I could. It was like going up against a stone wall. John DeWitt certainly could use his hands, with the result that I resembled paper pulp when I came out of that game. DeWitt did everything to me but kill me. After I got my growth, weight, and strength, plus my experience, I always had a desire to play against DeWitt to see if he could do the same thing again. 
In a Harvard-Yale game one year, I remember an incident that took place between Carr, Shevlin, and myself, says Harry. Tom Shevlin usually stood near the goal line when Yale received the kickoff. As a matter of fact, he caught the ball most of the time. The night before the Yale game in 1905, Bill Carr and myself were discussing what might come up the following day. Inasmuch as we always lined up side by side on the kickoff, we made a wager that if Harvard kicked off, we would each be the first to tackle Shevlin. The next day Harvard won the toss and chose to kick off, and as we had hoped, Shevlin caught the ball. Carr and I raced down the field, each intent on being the first to tackle him. I crashed into Shevlin and spilled him, upsetting myself at the same time. When I picked myself up and looked around, Carr had Shevlin pilled securely to the ground. After the game we told Shevlin of our wager, and he said that under the circumstances all bets were off as both had won. Former U.S. Attorney General William H. Lewis, who was one of the leading representatives of the colored race, needs no introduction to the football world, says Kersberg. Bill, or Lou as he is familiarly known to all Harvard men, laid the foundation for the present system of line play at Cambridge. He was actively engaged in coaching until 1907, when he was obliged to give it up due to pressure of business. In 1905, Hooks, Burr, and I played the guard positions. Lou seemed to center his attention on us, and we always received more calls after each game than the other linemen for doing this, that, or the other thing wrong. In the Brown game of this year, Hooks played against a colored man who was exceptionally good, and who, Hooks admits afterward, put it all over him. The Monday following this game we received our usual call. After telling me what a rotten game I had played, he turned on Burr and remarked, "'What the devil was the matter with you on Saturday, Hooks? That guard on the Brown team smeared you.' Burr replied, "'I don't know what was the matter with me. I used my hands on that nigger's head and body all through the game, but it didn't seem to do any good.' Several of us who were listening felt a bit embarrassed that Hooks had unwittingly made this remark. The tension was relieved, however, when Lou drawled out, "'Why the devil didn't you kick him in the shins?' A burst of laughter greeted this sally. Donald Grant Herring, better known to football men in and out of Princeton as Hef, is one of the few American players of international experience. After a period of splendid play for the Tigers, he went to England with a Rhodes scholarship. At Merton College he continued his athletic career, and it was not long before he became a member of one of the most famous rugby fifteens ever turned out by Oxford. Hef has always said that he enjoyed the English game, but whether the brand he played was American or English, his opponent usually got little enjoyment out of a hard afternoon with this fine Princeton athlete. In the late summer of 1903, I was on a train coming east from Montana, Hef tells me, after a summer spent in the Rockies. A companion recognized among the passengers Doc Hillebrand, who was coming east from his ranch to coach the Princeton team. This companion, who was still a Lawrenceville schoolboy, had the nerve to brace Hillebrand and tell him in my presence that I was going to enter Princeton that fall, and that I was a star football player. You can imagine what Doc thought, and how I felt. However, Doc was kind enough to tell me to report for practice, and to recognize me when I appeared on the field several weeks later. I soon drifted over to the freshman field, and I want to admit here what caused me to do so. It was nothing more nor less than the size of Jim Cooney's legs. Jim was a classmate of mine whom I first saw on the football field when he and another tackle candidate were engaged in that delicate pastime known to linemen as breaking through. I realized at once that, if Jim and I were ever put up against one another, I would stand about as much chance of shoving him back as I would if I tried to push a steamroller. So I went over to the freshman field, where Howard Henry was coaching at the time. He was sending ends down the field, and I remember being thrilled, after beating a certain bunch of them, at hearing him say, "'You, in the brown jersey, come over here in the first squad.' DeWitt's team beat Cornell 44-0. For years there hung on the walls of the Osborne Club at Princeton a splendid action picture of Dana Kafer making one of the touchdowns in that game. It was a mass-on-tackle play, and Jim Cooney was getting his Cornell opponent out of the way for Kafer to go over the line. The picture gave Jim dead away. He had a firm grip of the Cornell man's jersey and arm. Ten years or more afterward, a group, including Cooney, was sitting in the Osborne Club. In a spirit of fun, one man said, Jim, we know now how you got your reputation as a tackle. We can see it right up there on the wall. The next day the picture was gone. After I was graduated from Princeton in 1907, I went to Merton College, Oxford. There are 22 different colleges in Oxford, and 18 in Cambridge. Each one has its own teams and crews, and plays a regular schedule. From the best of these college teams, the university teams are drawn. Each college team has a captain and a secretary, who acts as manager. At the beginning of the college year, early October, 
the captain and secretary of each team go around among the freshmen of the college and try to get as many of them as possible to play their particular sport, mine rugby football. After a few days the captain posts on the college bulletin board, which is always placed at the porter's lodge, a notice that a squash will be held on the college field. A squash is what we would call practice. Sometimes, for a few days before the game, an old blue may come down to Oxford and give a little coaching to the team. Here, often the captain does all the coaching. The Cambridge match is for blood, and, while friendly enough, is likely to be much more savage than any other. In the match I played in, which Oxford won 35-3, the record score in the whole series, which started in 1872, we had three men severely injured. In the first three minutes of the game one of our star backs was carried off the field with a broken shoulder, while our captain was kicked in the head and did not come out of his days until about seven o'clock that evening. He played throughout the game, however. Our secretary was off the field with a kneecap out of place for more than half the game. A game of rugby, by the way, consists of two forty-five-minute halves with a three-minute intermission. There are no substitutes, and if a man is injured, his team plays one man short. We beat Cambridge that year with thirteen men the greater part of the game, twelve for some time against their full team of fifteen. Their only try, touchdown in plain American, was scored when we had twelve men on the field. We were champions of England that year, and did not lose a match through the fall season, though we tied one game with the great Harlequins Club of London, whom we afterward beat in the return game. Of the fine fellows who made up that great Oxford team, six are dead, five of them are somewhere in France. Carl Flanders was a big factor in the Yale rush line. Foster Sanford considers him one of the greatest defensive centers that ever played. He was six feet three and one-fourth inches tall, and weighed two hundred two pounds. In 1906, Flanders coached the Indian team at Carlisle. Let us see some of the interesting things that characterize the Indian players, through Flanders' experience. The nicknames with which the Indians labeled one another were mostly those of animals or a weapon of defense. Mount Pleasant and Libby always called each other knife. Bill Gardner was crowned chicken legs. Charles, one of the halfbacks, and a regular little tiger, was called bird legs. Other names fastened to the different players were whalebone, shoestring, tommyhawk, and wolf. The Indians always played cleanly as long as their opponents played that way. Dillon, an old Sioux Indian, and one of the fastest guards I ever saw, was a good example of this. If anybody started rough play, Dillon would say, Stop that, boys, and the chap who was guilty always stopped. But if an opponent continually played dirty football, Dillon would say grimly, I'll get you. On the next play or two, you'd never know how, the rough player would be taken out. Dillon had got his man. Wallace Denny and Bemis Pierce got up a code of signals, using an Indian word which designated a single play. Among the Indian words which designated these signals were water bucket, wateni, kukuhi. I never could find out what it all meant, and following the Indian team by this code of signals was a task which was too much for me. Bill Hoare, renowned in Colgate and Syracuse, writes, Colgate University and Colgate Academy are under the same administration, and the football teams were practicing when I entered school. I went out for the team, and after the second practice I was put into the scrimmage. I was greatly impressed with the game, and continued for the afternoon practice, and played at tackle in the first game of the season. In four years of winning football, I became acquainted with such wonderful athletes as Riley Castleman and Walter Runge of the Colgate varsity team. In the fall of 1905, I entered Syracuse University and played right tackle on the varsity team for four years and was captain of the victorious 1908 team. In the four years, I never missed a scrimmage or a game. I think that one of the hardest games I ever played was in the game against Princeton in 1908, when they had such stars as Siegling, McFadden, Eddie Dillon, and Tibbet. The game ended in a scoreless tie, with the ball seesawing back and forth on the forty-yard line. I had been accustomed to carry the ball, and had been successful in executing a forward pass of fifty-five yards in the Yale game the week before, placing the ball on the one-yard line, only to lose it on a fumble. I had the reputation of being a good-natured player, and indirectly heard it rumored many times by coaches and football players that they would like to see me fighting mad on the football field. The few Syracuse rooters who journeyed to Easton the day we played Lafayette had that opportunity. Dowd was the captain of the Lafayette team. Next to me was Barry, a first-class football player, who stripped in the neighborhood of two hundred pounds. Just before the beginning of the second half, I was in a crouching position ready to start when someone dealt me a stinging blow on the ear. I was dazed for the time being. I turned to Barry and asked him who did it. He pointed to Dowd. From that instant I was determined to seek revenge. 
I was ignorant of the true culprit until about a year afterward, when Anderson, who played center, and was a good friend of mine, told me about it. It seemed that just before we went on the field for the second half, Buck O'Neill, who was coaching the Syracuse team, told Barry to hit me and make me mad. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Moscato. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter Ten. College Traditions and Spirit. College life in America is rich in traditions. Customs are handed down class by class and year by year, until finally they acquire the force of law. Each college and university has a community life and a character of its own. The spirit of each institution abides within its walls. It cannot be invaded by an outsider or ever completely understood by one who has not grown up in it. The atmosphere of a college community is conservative. It is the outcome of generations of student custom and thought which have resolved themselves into distinct grooves. It requires a thorough understanding of the customs of college men, their antics and pranks, to appreciate the fact that the performers are simply boys carrying on the traditions of those gone before. Gray-haired graduates, who know by experience what is embodied in college spirit, join feelingly in the old customs of their college days and in observing the new customs which have grown out of the old these traditional customs some of them humorous and others deeply moving in their sentiment are among the first things that impress the freshman he does not comprehend the meaning of them at once nor does he realize that they are the product of generations of students but he soon learns that there is something more powerful in college life than the brick and mortar of beautiful buildings or high passing marks in the classroom. When he comes to know the value and the underlying spirit of the traditions of his college, he treasures them among the enduring memories of his life. The businessman who never enjoyed the advantage of going to college is puzzled as he witnesses the demonstration of undergraduate life, and he fails to catch the meaning. He does not understand. It has played no part in his own experience. College customs seem absurd to him and he fails to appreciate that in these traditions our american college spirit finds expression as an outsider views the result of a football victory he sees perhaps only the bitter look of defeat on the losers faces and is at a loss to understand the loyal spirit of thousands of graduates and undergraduates who stand and cheer their team after defeat such a sight undoubtedly impresses him but he turns his attention to the triumphant march of the victorious sympathizers around the field and watches the winners being borne aloft by hero worshippers, while hats by the thousands are being tossed over the crossbar of the goalpost that carried the winning play. The snake dance of thousands of exulting students enlivens the scene. The spirit of glorious victory breaks loose. After the Harvard victory in 1908, in the midst of the excitement, a Harvard graduate got up from his seat climbed over the fence, put his derby hat and bulldog pipe on the grass, walked solemnly out a few paces, turned two complete handsprings, walked back, put on his hat, picked up his pipe, climbed solemnly over the fence again, and took his place in the crowd. He was very businesslike about it and didn't say a word. He had to get it out of his system. That was all. Nobody laughed at him. One sees gray-haired men stand and cheer, sing and enthuse over their alma mater's team. For the moment, the rest of the world is forgotten. Tears come with defeat to those on the grandstand, as well as to the players, and likewise happy smiles and joyous greetings come when victory crowns the day. In the midst of a crisis in the game, men and women, old and young, break over the bounds of conventionality, get acquainted with their seatmates, and share the general excitement. The thrill of victory possesses them, and the old grads embrace each other after a winning touchdown. There may be certain streets in a college town upon which a freshman is never seen. It may be that a freshman has to wear a certain kind of cap. His trousers must not be rolled up at the bottom. And if you should see a freshman standing on a balcony at night, singing some foolish song, with a crowd of sophomores standing below, you smile as you realize that you are witnessing the performance of some college custom. 
and if you see a young man dressed in an absurd fantastic costume going about the streets of a city or a quiet college town it may mean an initiation into a certain society or club and you will note that he does his part with a quiet earnest look upon his face realizing that he is carrying on a tradition which has endured for years you hear the seniors singing on the campus while the whole college listens it is their hour at games you see the cheerleaders take their places in front of the grandstand as they bend and double themselves into all sorts of shapes they bring out the cheers which go to make college spirit strong if you were at yale on what is known as tap day you would view in wonderment the solemnity and seriousness of the occasion an election to a senior society is yale's highest honor as you sit on the old yale fence you realize what it means to yale men in the secret life of the campus men yearn most for this honor and the traditional gathering of seniors under the oak tree for receiving elections is a college custom that has all the binding force of a most rigid law alumni parades then come the alumni parades at commencement the old-timers head the procession those who came first are first in line and so on down to the youngest and most recent graduate there are many interesting things in the parade which bring out specific class peculiarities in one college you may see gray-haired men walking behind an immense sacred bird as it is called this bird the creation of an ingenious mind is the size of an ostrich and has all the semblance of life with many lifelike tricks and habits men dress in all sorts of costumes this is a day in which each class has some peculiar part and all are united in one big thought that it is a cherished college custom you may see some man with the letter of his college on his sweater another may have his class numerals another may wear a gold football these are not ordinary things to be purchased at sporting goods stores they are a reward of merit the college custom has made it so and if in some college town the traditions of the university are such that a man as he passes the ma newell gateway at cambridge raises his hat in honor of his great harvard hero it is a tradition backed up by a wonderful spirit of love towards one who has gone and then on commencement day when the seniors plant their class ivy that is a token to remain behind them and flourish long after they are out in the wide wide world college tradition makes it possible for a poor boy to get an education the poor fellow may wait on the table where sit many rich men's sons but they may be all chums with him they are on the same footing the campus of one is the campus of the other and all you can say is it is just the way of things just the way it must be more power to the man who works his way through college it may be as fellow college man you are now recalling some custom that is carried out on a college street in a dormitory in a fraternity house perhaps or a club perhaps in some boarding house where you had your first introduction to a college custom maybe in the cheapest rooming house in town you got your first impression of a bold bad sophomore you probably could have given a good trouncing had he been alone and yet you were prepared to take smilingly the hazing imposed upon you maybe some of you fondly recall a cannon struck in the ground behind a historical building where once george washington had his headquarters around about this traditional monument cluster rich memories as you review the many college ceremonies enacted there some of you owing allegiance to a new england alma mater may recall with smiles and perhaps mischievous satisfaction the checkered career of the sculptured sabrina in her various appearances and disappearances since the day now long gone by when in pedestalled repose she graced the college flower gardens the sabrina tradition is one of the golden legacies of amherst life in the formation of college spirit and traditions i am not unmindful of the tremendous moulding power of the college president or the popular college professors this is strikingly illustrated in the expression of an old college man who said in his connection i don't remember a thing professor blank said but i remember him when the graduate of a college has sons of his own he realizes more fully than at any other time the great influence of personality upon youth he understands better the problems that are faced by boys and the great task and responsibility of the faculty i know that there are many football men who at different times in their career have not always praised the work of the college professors but now that the games are over they probably look back affectionately to the men who made them toe the mark and by such earnestness helped them through their college career 
it is undoubtedly true that the headmasters and teachers in our preparatory schools and colleges generally appreciate the importance of developing the whole man mental moral and physical schoolmaster and boy indeed it is a wonderful privilege to work shoulder to shoulder with the boys in our preparatory schools as well as in our colleges at a recent dinner i heard dr s j mcpherson of the lawrenceville school place before an alumni gathering a sentiment which i believe is the sentiment of every worthy schoolmaster in our land schoolmasters have attractive work and they can find no end of fun in it i admit that in a boarding school they should be willing to spend themselves eight days in the week and twenty-five hours a day but no man goes far that keeps watching the clock there may be good reasons for long vacations but i regard the summer vacation as usually a bore for at least half the length of it to be worth his salt a schoolmaster must of course have scholarship the more the better but that alone will never make him a quickening teacher he must be apt to teach and must lose himself in his task if he is to transfuse his blood into the veins of boys above all he must be a real man and not a mannequin and he must enjoy his boys love them without being quite conscious of the love or at least without harping on it the ideal schoolmaster needs five special and spiritual senses common sense the sense of justice the sense of honor the sense of youth and the sense of humor these five gifts are very useful in every worthy occupation gentlemen none of us schoolmasters has reached the ideal however we reach after it nevertheless we neither need nor desire your pity we do not feel unimportant personally i would not exchange jobs with the richest or greatest among you i like my own job it really looks to me bigger and finer i should rather have the right mold and put the right stamp on a wholesome boy than to do any other thing it counts more for the world and is more nearly immortal it is worth any man's life another factor in the formation and development of college traditions and college spirit is the influence of the men who shape the athletic policy when one of the graduates returns to direct the athletic affairs of his alma mater or those of another college he naturally becomes a potent influence in the life of the students great is his opportunity for character making the men all look up to him and the spirit of hero worship is present everywhere such athletic directors are chosen largely because of their success on the athletic field and when one can combine athletic directorship with scholastic knowledge the combination is doubly effective by association they know the real spirit and patriotic sentiment of the college men they appreciate the fact that success in athletics like success in life depends not merely upon training the head but upon training the will huxley said that the true object of all education was to develop ability to do the thing that ought to be done when it ought to be done whether one felt like doing it or not prompt obedience to rules and regulations develop character and the athletic director becomes therefore one of the most important of college instructors a boy may be a welcher in his classroom work but when he gets out on the athletic field and meets the eye of a man who is bound to get the most out of every player for the sake of his own reputation as well as the reputation of the school or college that boy finds himself in a new school it is the school of discipline that resembles more nearly than anything else the competitive struggle in the business life of the outside world that he is soon to enter another exceedingly valuable trait that athletic life develops in a student is the spirit of honorable victory the player is taught to win to be sure but he is also taught that victory must never overshadow honor who misses or wins the prize go lose or conquer as you can but if you fail or if you rise be each pray god a gentleman this tradition and atmosphere cannot be retained in institutions merely by the efforts of the students the cooperation of the alumni is necessary upon this account it is unfortunate that the point of view of too many college men regarding their alma mater is limited to the years of their own school and college days our universities especially are beginning to learn that this has been a great mistake and that the continued interest and loyalty of the alumni are absolutely essential to ensure progress and maintain the high standard of an institution there is in other words a real sense in which the college belongs to the alumni 
the faculty is engaged for a specific purpose and their great work is made much more profitable by the hearty cooperation of the old and young graduates who keep in close touch with the happenings and the spirit of their different alma maters one of the best assets in any seat of learning is the constructive criticism of the alumni broad-minded faculties invite intelligent criticism from the graduate body and they usually get it but after all the real power of enthusiasm behind college traditions abides in the student body itself how is this college patriotism aroused what are its manifestations what is it that awakens the desire for victory with honor which is the real background of the great football demonstration that tens of thousands of americans witness each year as i think back in this connection upon my own college experiences the athletic mass meeting stands out in my memory and records the moment when all that was best and strongest in my fighting spirit and manhood came out to meet the demand of the athletic leaders it was at that time that the thrill and power of college spirit took mighty possession of me it might have been the inspiring words of an old college leader addressing us or perhaps it was the story of some incident that brought out the deep significance of the coming game indeed i have often thought that the spirit of loyalty and sacrifice aroused in the breast of the young man in a college mass meeting springs from the same noble source as the highest patriotism mass meeting enthusiasm how well do i recall the mass meeting held by the undergraduates in alexander hall thursday night before the yale game in eighteen ninety eight the team and substitutes sat in the front row of seats there was singing and cheering that aroused every man in the room to the highest pitch of enthusiasm all eyes were focused on the cheerleader as he rehearsed the cheers and songs for the game and as the speakers entered behind him on the platform they received a royal welcome there was johnny poe alex moffat some of the professors including jack hibben since professor of princeton in addition to the coaches i can almost hear again their words as they addressed the gathering fellows we are here to-night to get ready to defeat yale on saturday you men all know how hard the coaches have worked this year to get the team ready for the last big game captain hillebrand and his men know that the college is with the team to a man we are not here to-night to make college spirit but we are here to demonstrate it those of you who saw last year's team go down to defeat at new haven realize the princeton team this year has got to square that defeat gary cochran and the other men who graduated are not here to play the burden rests on the shoulders of the men in front of me this year's team and we know what they're going to do it is going to take the hardest kind of work to beat yale on our own grounds we must play them off their feet the first five minutes i wonder if you men who are in princeton to-day truly realize the great tradition of this dear college thousands and thousands of young men have walked across the same campus you travel the princeton of years gone by is your princeton to-day so let us ever hold a high regard for those whose places we now occupy already from far-off points princeton men are starting back to see the yale game back to their alma mater they are coming back to see the old rooms they used to live in and it is up to us to make their visit a memorable one you can do that by beating yale george k edwards many of you men have perhaps heard of the great love for princeton shown in the story of the last days of horse edwards princeton eighty nine he will never return to princeton again he used to live in east college long since torn down some years after he left college he was told that he had but a few short months to live he decided to live them out at princeton one friday afternoon in the summer of eighteen ninety seven horse edwards arrived in princeton from colorado he was very weak from his illness he could barely raise his hand to wave to the host of old friends who greeted him as he drove from the station to east college where his old room had been arranged as in his college days for his return there he was visited by many friends of the old days who had come back for commencement old memories were revived that night he attended his club dinner and the following day was wheeled out to the field to see the baseball game princeton beat yale sixteen to eight and his cup of happiness was overflowing on the following monday horse edwards died he told his close friends that as long as he had to go he was happy that he had been granted his last wish to die there at princeton and his memory is a treasured college tradition job e hedges among the men who are always welcome at princeton mass meetings and dinners is job e hedges 
i remember what he said at a mass meeting at princeton in eighteen ninety six he was then secretary to mayor strong in new york in which city the game with yale took place that year the scene was in the old gymnasium every inch of space was occupied on the front seats sat the team and substitutes around them and in the small gallery were the students in mass before the team were prominent alumni trustees and some members of the faculty earnest appeal had been made by the various speakers tending to rouse the team to a high point of enthusiasm and courage and the interest of their alma mater and of the alumni had been earnestly pictured mr hedges was called on as he frequently is at princeton gatherings and as the usual field had been fairly covered his opportunities were limited without repetition of what had been said he addressed the team and substitutes in typical princeton fashion and concluded so far as a record is made of it somewhat as follows there is a feeling in the public mind that football games breed dissipation and are naturally followed by unseemly conduct we all know that much of the excitement following football games in new york is due largely not to college men but others who take the game as an excuse and at the time as an opportunity to indulge in more or less boisterous conduct than freedom from interference usually accorded at that time i wish it thoroughly understood that in no way as a princeton man do i countenance dissipation intemperance boisterous or unseemly conduct it may be a comfort for you men to know however that i am personally acquainted with every police magistrate in the city of new york while i do not claim to have any influence with them nor would i try to exercise it improperly nevertheless if the team wins and any man should unintentionally and weakly yield to the strain consequent upon such a victory i can be found that night at my residence any delinquent will have my sympathetic and best efforts in his behalf if however the team loses and any one goes over the line of propriety he will have from me neither sympathy nor assistance and i shall be absent from the city it is related that on that night following the victory several daring spirits decorated themselves with cards hung from their necks bearing this legend don't arrest me i am a friend of job hedges with these they marched up and down broadway and though laboring under somewhat strange conditions were not molested a full account of this expeditionary force appeared in the daily papers the next morning and it is related that there was a brisk conversation between mr hedges and the mayor when the former arrived at the city hall which took on not an orange and black hue but rather a lurid flame of which mayor strong was supposed to be but was not the victim the net result of the scene however was that the team won there was a moderate celebration and no princeton man was arrested End of chapter ten recording by pam moscato chapter eleven of football days this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org football days by william edwards chapter eleven johnny poe's own story johnny poe was a member of the black watch that famous Scotch regiment whose battles had followed the English flag. On the graves of the Black Watch heroes the sun never sets. Johnny Poe's death came on September twenty fifth, 1915, in the Battle of Luce. Nelson Poe has given me the following information regarding Johnny's death. It comes direct from Private W. Faulkner, a comrade who was in the charge when Johnny fell. In the morning during the attack we went out on a party carrying bombs. Poe and myself were in this party. We had gone about halfway across an open field when Poe was hit in the stomach. He was then five yards in front of me and I saw him fall. As he fell he said, Never mind me. Go ahead with our boxes. On our return for more bombs we found him lying dead. Shortly after he was buried at a place between the British and German lines. I have seen his grave which is about a hundred yards to the left of Lone Tree on the left of Luce. Lone Tree is the only landmark near. The grave is marked with his name and regiment. Just what Johnny Poe's heroic finished on the battlefield meant to us here at home is the common knowledge of all football men, and indeed of all sportsmen. There is ample evidence, moreover, that it attracted the attention of the four corners of the earth. Life in London or Paris was not all roses to the Americans compelled to remain there at the height of the war. Paul McWhelan, a Yale man and a football writer, had occasion to be in London shortly after the news of Poe's death in battle was received there. 
Talking with Whelan after his return, he impressed upon me the place that Poe had made for himself in the hearts of at least one of the fighting countries. "'You know,' said he, "'that about that time Americans were not very popular. There seemed to be a feeling everywhere that we should have been on the firing line. This feeling developed the fashion of polite jeering to a point that made life abroad uncomfortable, until Johnny Poe fell fighting in the ranks of the Black Watch on the plains of Flanders.' In the dull monotony of the casualty list, his name at first slipped by with scant mention. It was the publication in the United States of the story of his fighting career, which stimulated newspaper interest not merely in England, but throughout the British Empire, to Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa, to the farthest corners of the earth, went the tale of the death of a great American fighter. I met one man, a lawyer, on his way to do some piecework, and he told me that he thought Poe had no right to be in the ranks of a foreign army. Probably most of the pacifists would have returned the same verdict, regardless of Poe's love for the cause of the Allies. Yet among the thousands of Americans in Europe in the month following Poe's death, there was complete unity of opinion that the old Princeton football star had done more for his country than all the pacifists put together. "'A toast to the memory of Poe,' said one of the group of Americans in the Savoy, that famous gathering place of Yankees in London. "'His death has made living a lot easier for his countrymen,' who have to be in France and England during the war. There is not an army on the continent in which Americans have not died, but no death in action, not even that of Victor Chapman, the famous American aviator in France, gave such timely proof of American valor as that of Poe. In London, for a month after his death, there was talk among the Americans and in the university clubs about raising funds for some permanent memorial in London to Poe. There are many memorials to Englishmen in America, and it would seem that there is a place and a real reason for erecting a memorial in London to a fighting American who gave his life for a cause to England. I have always treasured in my football collection some anecdotes which Johnny Poe wrote several years ago while in Nevada. In fact, from reading his stories after his death, I got the inspiration that prompted me to write this book. The following stories were picked up by me, says Johnny, through the course of college years and after. Some of the incidents I have actually witnessed, of others my brothers have told me, when we talked over Princeton victories and defeats, with the reasons for both, and still others I have heard from the lips of Princeton men as they grew reminiscent, sitting around the cozy fireplace in the trophy room at the varsity clubhouse, with the old footballs, the scores of many a hard-fought Princeton victory emblazoned upon them, and the banners with the names of the members of the winning teams thereon inscribed, looking down from their places on the walls and ceilings. How the undergrads long to have their names enrolled on the victorious banner, knowing that they will be looked up to by future college generations of the sons of old Nassau. These banners have much the same effect upon Princeton teams as did the name of Horatius upon the young Romans, and still his name sounds strong unto the men of Rome, as a trumpet blast which calls them to charge the Volsian home and waves still pray to Juno for boys with hearts as bold as his who kept the bridge so well in the brave days of old. Well do they know that Mother Princeton is not chary of her praise, when she knows that they have planted her banner on the loftiest tower of her enemy's stronghold. The evening spent in the trophy room, the grill room of the Princeton Inn, and in the hallways around a cheerful fire of the numerous Princeton clubs, make me think of nights in the mess-room of crack British regiments, so graphically described by Kipling. The general public cannot understand the seriousness with which college athletes take the loss of an important game. There is a Princeton football captain who was so broken up over a defeat by Yale, that months after on the cattle range of New Mexico, as he lay out at night on his cowboy bed, and thought himself unobserved, he fell to sobbing as if his heart would break. A football victory to many men is as dearly longed for as any goal of ambition in life. How else would they strive so fiercely, one side to take the ball over, the other to prevent them doing so? Very few of the public hear the exhortation and cursing as the ball slowly but irresistibly is rushed to the goal of the opponent. Billy, if you do that again, I'll cut your heart out. Yale, if you ever held, hold now. How the calls to victory come back. As Hughes says in Tom Brown's school days, a scrimmage in front of the goalposts or the consulship of Plancus is no child's play. My earliest Princeton football hero was Alex Moffat, 84. 
My brother Johnson was in his class and played on the same team, and would often talk of him to my brothers and me. He used to give us a sort of, "'Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere,' etc. Though my brother is a small man, I thought all other Princeton players must be nine cubits and a half, or, as a reporter once said of Sims, ninety-two, center rush in Princeton team of ninety and ninety-one, an animated whale, broad as the moral law and heavy as the hand of fate. I consider Alan Moffat the greatest goal-kicker college football has produced. One football in the Princeton trophy room has on it Princeton 26, Harvard 7. In that game, Moffat kicked five goals from the field, three with his right and two with his left foot, besides the goals from the touchdowns. A Harvard guard made the remark after the third goal, We came here to play football, not to play against phenomenal kicking. Princeton men cannot help feeling that Moffat should have been allowed a goal against Yale in his postgraduate year of 84, which was called before the full halves had been played and decided a draw, Yale being ahead 6-4. to four. Princeton claimed it, but the referee said he didn't see it, which caused Moffat to exclaim, something. An amusing story is told in connection with this decision. Quite a number of years after Jim Robinson, who was trainer of the Princeton team in 84, went down to the dock to see his brother off for Europe. Looking up, he beheld on the deck above the man who had refereed the 84 game, and whom he had not seen since. "'Smith,' he said, "'I have a brother on this boat, but I hope she sinks.' Tilly Lamar's name is highly honored at Princeton, not only because he won the 85 game against Yale by a run of about 90 yards, but because he died trying to save a girl from drowning. Only a few months later, in the summer of 91, Fred Brokaw, 92, was drowned at Elberon while trying to save two girls from the ocean. Both Lamar and Brokaw's pictures adorn the walls of the varsity clubhouse. The first game I ever saw the Princeton team play was with Harvard in 88 which the former won, 18-6. to six. I was in my brother's, 91, room about three hours and a half before the game, and Jer Black and Channing, the halfbacks, were there. As Channing left, he remarked, "'Something will have to happen before I get back to this room again,' referring to the game, which doubtless made him a bit nervous. I believe he was no more nervous ten years after, when in the Rough Riders he waited for word to advance up the bullet-swept hill before Santiago." Eighty-one was the year so many divinity students played on the varsity. Hector Cowan, the great tackle, Dick Hodge, the strategist, Sam Hodge, Bob Spear, and I think Irvin, men all, who, as McCready Sykes said, feared God and no one else. Hector Cowan is considered one of the best tackles that ever wore the orange and black jersey. While rough, he was never a dirty player. In a game with Wesleyan, his opponent cried out angrily, Keep your hands for pounding on your Bible. Don't be sticking them in my face. One day, in a game against the scrub, Cowan had passed everyone except the fullback and was bearing down on him like a tornado, when within a few feet of the fullback the latter jumped aside and said politely, Pass on, sir, pass on. Cowan played on two winning teams, 85 and 89. In 89 the eligibility rules at the college were not as strict as now. So as Princeton needed a tackle, Walter Cash, who had played on Pennsylvania the year before, was sent for and came all the way from Wyoming. He came so hurriedly that his wardrobe consisted of two six-shooters and a Monte deck of cards, on account of which he was dubbed Monte Cash. Cash was not fond of attending lectures, and once the faculty had him up before them and told him what a disgrace it would be if he were dropped out of college. It may be in the East, but we don't think much of a little thing like that out West, was his reply. Cash was in the Rough Riders and was wounded at San Juan. Sport Donnelly was a great end that year. Heffelfinger, the great Yale guard, who was probably the best that ever played, said of Donnelly that he was the only player he had ever seen who could slug and keep his eye on the ball at the same time. The following story is often told of how Donnelly got Rhodes of Yale ruled off in 89. Rhodes had hit Channing of Princeton in the eye, so that Donnelly was laying for him, and when Rhodes came through the line, Donnelly grabbed up two hands full of mud, it was a very muddy field, and rubbed them in his face and hollered, Mr. Umpire, so that when Rhodes, in a burst of righteous indignation, hit him, the umpire saw it and promptly ruled Rhodes from the field. Snake Ames and House Janeway played that year, and as the latter was big, 210 pounds stripped, and good-natured, 
Ames thought if they could only get Janeway angry he would play even better than usual. So, with Machiavellian craft, he said to him before the Harvard game, "'House, the man you are going to play against tomorrow insulted your girl. I heard him do it, so you want to murder him.' "'All right,' said House, ominously, and as Princeton won forty-one to fifteen, Janeway must certainly have helped a heap. George played center for Princeton four years, and for three years Pa Corbin and George played against each other, and as cowboys would say, sure did chew each other's mane. I don't mean slugged. My brother Edgar, ninety-one, was a great admirer of George. In eighty-eight Edgar was playing in the scrub, and George broke through, and was about to make a tackle, when the former knocked one of his arms down as it was outstretched to catch it. George missed the tackle but said nothing. A second time almost identically the same thing occurred. This time he remarked grimly, "'Good trick, that, Poe!' But when the same thing happened a third time on the same afternoon, he exclaimed, "'Poe, if you weren't so small, I'd hit you.'" In eighty-nine, Thomas, ninety, substitute guard, was highly indignant at the way some Boston newspaper described him. The Princeton men were giants. One, in particular, was picturesque in his grotesqueness. He was six feet five, and when he ran, his arms and legs moved up and down like the piston rods of an engine. In ninety, Buck Irvin, eighty-eight, brought an unknown team to Princeton, Franklin and Marshall, which he coached, and they scored sixteen points against the Tigers. And though the latter won thirteen to sixteen, still that was the largest score ever made against Princeton up to that time. They did it, too, by rushing, which was all the more to their credit. Victor Harding, Harvard, and Yup Cook, Princeton, eighty-nine, had played on Andover and Exeter, respectively, and had trouble then, so four years later when they met, one on Princeton and the other on Harvard, they had more trouble. Both were ruled off for rough work. Cook picked Harding up off the ground and slammed him down and then walked off the field. In a few minutes Harding, after trying to trip Ames, was also ruled off. That was the net result of the old Andover-Exeter feud. In ninety-one Princeton was playing Rutgers. Those were the days of the old V-trick in starting a game. When the orange and black guards and centers tore up the Rutgers V, it was found that the captain of the latter team had broken his leg in the crush. He showed great nerve, for while sitting on the ground waiting for a stretcher, he remarked in a nonchalant way, "'Give me a cigarette. I could die for old Rutgers,' his tone being me first and then Nathan Hale. One version, quite prevalent around Princeton, has it that a Tiger player rushed up and exclaimed, "'Die, then!' This is not true, as I played in that game, and I know whereof I speak. Fifteen years after that had happened, I met Phil Brett, who had captained the Rutgers team that day, and he told me that his life had been a burden to him at times, and like Job, he felt like cursing God and dying, because often, upon coming into a café or even a hotel dining-room, some half-drunken acquaintance would yell out, "'Hello, Phil, old man, could you die for dear old Rutgers?' Several years ago, while in the Kentucky militia, in connection with one of those feud cases, I was asked by a private if I were related to Edgar Allan Poe, to mug what used to write poetry, and when I replied yes, he was my grandmother's first cousin, he, evidently thinking I was too boastful, remarked, Well, man, you've got a swell chance. So, knowing that the football season is near, I think I have a swell chance to tell some of the old football stories handed down at Princeton from college generation to generation. If I have hurt any old Princeton player's feelings, I do humbly ask pardon, and assure them that it is unintentional. For as the Indians would put it, my heart is warm toward them, and when I die, place my hands upon my chest and put their hands between my hands. With apologies to Kipling in his poem when he speaks of the parting of the colonial troops with the regulars, there isn't much we haven't shared, for to make the Ellis run, the same old hurts, the same old breaks, the same old rain and sun, the same old chance which knocked us out, or winked and let us through. The same old joy, the same old sorrow. Good-bye. Good luck to you. End of chapter 11Please visit LibriVox.org. When the Navy meets the Army, when the friend becomes the foe, when the sailor and the soldier seek each other to overthrow, 
When old veterans gray and grizzled elbow, struggle, push, and shove, that they may cheer on to victory, each the service of his love. When the maiden fair and dainty lets her dignity depart, and, all breathless, does her utmost for the team that's next her heart. When you see these strange things happen, then we pray you to recall that the Army and Navy stand firm friends beneath it all. There's a distinctive flavor about an Army-Navy football game, which irrespective of the quality of the contending 11s and of their relative standing among the high-class teams in any given season, rates these contests annually as among the big games of the year. Tactically and strategically, football bears a close relation to war. That's a vital reason why it should be studied and applied in our two government schools. On the part of the public, there is general appreciation of the spirit which these two academies have brought into the great autumn sport, a spirit which combines with football per se, the color, the martial pomp, the elan of the military. The merger is a happy one, because football in its essence is a stern, grim game, a game that calls for self-sacrifice, for mental alertness, and for endurance. All these are elements, among others, which we commonly associate with the soldier's calling. If West Point and Annapolis players are not young men, who after graduation will go out into the world in various civil professions or other pursuits relating to commerce and industry, they are men, on the contrary, who are being trained to uphold the honor of our flag at home or abroad, as fate may decree, fighting men whose lives are to be devoted to the national wheel. It would be strange, therefore, if games in which those thus set apart participate were not marked by a quality peculiarly their own. To far-flung warships, the scores are sent on the wings of the wireless, and there is elation or depression in many a remote ward room in accordance with the aspect of the news. In lonely army posts wherever the flag flies, word of the annual struggle is flashed alike to colonel and the budding second lieutenant, still with down on lip, by them passed to the top sergeant and so on to the bottom of the line. Every football player who has had the good fortune to visit West Point or Annapolis, there to engage in a gridiron contest, has had an experience that he will always cherish. Every team, as a rule, looks forward to out-of-town trips, but when an eleven is to play the Army or the Navy, not a little of the pleasure lies in anticipation. Mayhap the visitor even now is recalling the officer who met him at the station and his hospitable welcome, the thrill that resulted from a tour under such pleasant auspices of the buildings and the natural surroundings of the two great academies. There was the historic campus, where so many great Army and Navy men spent their preparatory days. An inspiration unique in the experience of the visitor was to be found in the drill of the battalion as they marched past, led by the famous academy bands. There arose in the heart of the stranger, perhaps, the thought that he was not giving to his country as much as these young men. Such is the contagion of the spirit of the two institutions. There is always the thrill of the military, whether the cadets and midshipmen pass to the urge of the martial music in their purely military duties, or in equally perfect order to the ordinary functions of life, such as the daily meals, which in the colleges are so informal and in the mess hall are so precise. Joining their orderly ranks in this big dining room, one comes upon a scene never to be forgotten. In the process of developing college teams, an eleven gets a real test at either of these academies. You get what you go after. They are out to beat you. Their spirit is an indomitable one. Your cherished idea that you cannot be beaten never occurs to them until the final whistle is blown. Your men will realize after the game that a bruised leg or a lame joint will recall hard tackling of a player like Mustin of the Navy or Arnold of West Point, souvenirs of the dash they put into their play. Maybe there comes to your mind a recollection of the Navy's fast offense, their snappy play, the military precision with which their work is done. Possibly you dream of the wriggling open field running of Snake Lizard 
or the bulwark defense of Nichols, or in your West Point experiences you are reminded of the tussle you had in suppressing the brilliant Cromer, that clever little quarterback and field general, or the task of stopping the forging king, the army's old captain and fullback. Not less vivid are the memories of the spontaneous, if measured, cheering behind these men, a whole-hearted support that was at once the background and the incentive to their work. The siren cheer of the Navy and the long corps yell of the Army, still ringing in the ears of the college invader, were proof of the drive behind the team. I have always counted it a privilege that I was invited to coach at Annapolis through several football seasons. It was an unrivaled opportunity to catch the spirit that permeates the atmosphere of this great service school and to realize how eagerly the progress of football is watched by the heroes of the past who are serving wherever duty calls. It was there that I met Superintendent Wainwright. His interest in Annapolis football was keen. Another officer whose friendship I made at the academy was Commander Grant, who later was Rear Admiral, Commander of the Submarine Flotilla. His spirit was truly remarkable. The way he could talk to a team was an inspiration. It was during the intermission of a Navy Carlisle game when the score was 11-6 to six in Carlisle's favor that this exponent of fighting spirit came into the dressing room and in a talk to the team spared nothing and nobody. What he said about the white man not being able to defeat the Indian was typical. As a result of this unique dressing room scene when he commanded the Navy to win out over the Indians, his charges came through to victory by the score of 17 to 11. There is no one man in Annapolis who sticks closer to the ship and around whom more football traditions have grown than Paul DeShiel, a professor in the academy. He bore for many years the burden of responsibility of Annapolis football. His earnest desire has been to see the Navy succeed. He has worked arduously, and whenever Navy men get together, they speak enthusiastically of the devotion of this former Lehigh hero, official, and role maker. Players have come and gone. The call in recent years has been elsewhere, but Paul DeShiel has remained, and his interest in the game has been manifested by self-denial and hard work. Defeat has come to him with great sadness, and there are many games of which he still feels the sting. These come to him as nightmares in his recollections of Annapolis football history. Great has been his joy in the Navy's hour of victory. It was here at Annapolis that I learned something of the old Navy football heroes. Most brilliant of all, perhaps, was Worth Bagley, a marvelous punter and a great fighter. He lost his life later in the war with Spain, standing to his duty under open fire on the deck of the Winslow at Cardenas, with the utter fearlessness that was characteristic of him. I heard of the deeds on the football field of Mike Johnson, Trench, Pearson, McCormick, Cavanaugh, Reeves, Macaulay, Craven, Kimball, and Bookwalter. I have played against the great Navy guard Halligan. I saw it develop the Navy players Long, Chambers, Reed, Nichols, and Chip Smith, who later was in charge of the Navy athletics. He was one of the best quarterbacks the Navy ever had. I saw Doug Howard grow up from boyhood in Annapolis and develop into a Navy star saw him later coach their teams to victory, witnessed the great playing of Dougherty, Piersall, Grady, and Bill Carpenter, who is no longer on the Navy list. All these players, together with Norton, Northcroft, Daig, Halsey, Ingram, Douglas, Jerry Land, Babe Brown, and Dalton, stand out among those who have given their best in Army and Navy games. Young Nichols, who was quarterback in 1912, was a most brilliant ground gainer. He resigned from the service early in 1913, receiving a commission in the British Army. He was wounded, but later returned to duty only to be killed shortly afterward. Another splendid man. In speaking of Navy football, I cannot pass over the name of W.H. Staten, a man whose whole soul seemed to be permeated with Navy atmosphere and who is always to be depended upon in Navy matters. The association that I formed later in life with McDonough Craven and other loyal Navy football men 
gave me an opportunity to learn of Annapolis football in their day. The list of men who have been invited to coach the Navy from year to year is a long one. The ideal method of development of an undergraduate team is by a system of coaching conducted by graduates of that institution. Such alumni can best preserve the traditions, correct blunder of other years, and carry through a continuous policy along lines most acceptable. Graduate coaching exclusively is nearly impossible for Navy teams, for the graduates, as officers, are stationed at far distant points, mostly on board ship. Their duties do not permit of interruption for two months. They cannot be spared from turret and bridge, from the teamwork so highly developed at present on shipboard. Furthermore, their absence from our country sometimes for years keeps them out of touch with football generally and it is impossible for them to keep up to date, hence the coaching from other institutions. Lieutenant Frank B. Berrien was one of the early coaches and an able one, immediately after Doug Howard for three years coached the team to victory. The Navy's football future was then turned over to Jonas Ingram with the idea of working out a purely graduate system in the face of such serious obstacles as have already been pointed out. One of the nightmares of my coaching experiences was the day that the Army beat the Navy through the combined effort of the whole Army team plus the individual running of Charlie Daly. This run occurred at the very start of the second half. Doc Hillebrand and I were talking on the sidelines to Everett's Wren, the umpire. None of us heard the whistle blow for the starting of the second half. Before we knew it, the Army sympathizers were on their feet cheering and we saw Daly hitting it up the field, weaving through the Navy defense. Harmon Graves, who was coaching West Point that year, has since told me that the Army coaches had drilled the team carefully in receiving the ball on a kickoff, with Daly clear back under the goalposts. On the kickoff, the Navy did just what West Point had been trained to expect. Belknap kicked a long high one direct to Daly, and then and there began the carefully prepared advance of the Army team. Mowing down the oncoming Navy players, the West Point forwards made it possible for Clever Daly to get loose and score a touchdown after a run of nearly the entire length of the field. This game stands out in my recollection as one of the most sensational on record. The Navy, like West Point, had had many victories, but the purpose of this book is not to record year by year the achievements of these two institutions, but rather catch their spirit as one from without looks in upon a small portion of the busy life that is typical of these service schools. Scattered over the seven seas are those who heard the reveille of football at Annapolis. From a few old-timers, let us garner their experiences and the effects of football in the service. C. L. Poor, one of the veterans of the Annapolis squad, Varsity and Hustlers, has something to say concerning the effect of football upon the relationship between officers and men. Generally speaking, he says, it is considered that the relationship is beneficial. The young officer assumes qualities of leadership and shows himself in a favorable light to the men who appreciate his ability to show them something and do it well. The average young American, whether himself athletic or not, is a bit of a hero worshiper towards a prominent athlete and so the young officer who has good football ability gets the respect and appreciation of the crew to start with. J.B. Patton, who played three years at Annapolis, says of the early days, I entered the academy in 1895. In those days, athletics were not encouraged. The average number of cadets was less than 200, and the entrance age was from 14 to 18, really a boys' school. So when an occasional college team appeared, they looked like old men to us. Match games were usually on Saturday afternoon, and all the cadets spent the afternoon at sail drill on board the Wyoming in Chesapeake Bay. I can remember spending four hours racing up and down the top gallant yard with Stone and Hayward, losing and furling sail and then returning to a roast beef dinner, followed by two 45-minute halves of football. One of our best games, as a rule, was with Johns Hopkins University. Paul DeShiel, then a Hopkins man, usually managed to smuggle one or more pose to Annapolis with his team. We knew it, but at that time we did not object because we usually beat the Hopkins team. Another interesting match was with the deaf mutes from Kendall College. 
it was a standing joke with us that they too frequently smuggled good football players who were not mutes these kept silent during the game and talked with their hands but frequently when i tackled one hard and fell on him i could hear him cuss under his breath m m taylor brings us down to navy football of the early nineties in my day the principal quality sought was beef being embryo sailors we had to have nautical terms for our signals and they made our opponents sit up and take notice when i played halfback i remember my signals were my order relating to the foremast for instance four top-gallant clue lines and hands by the halyards meant that i was the victim on the conclusion of the order if the captain could not launch a play made at once he had to lengthen his signal and sometimes there would be a string of jargon intelligible only to a sailor which would take the light yard men aloft furl the sail and probably cast reflections on the stowage of the bunt anything connected with the anchor was a kick the main mast was consecrated to the left half and the mizzen to the full back in one game our lack of proper uniform worked to our advantage i was on the sick list and had turned my suit over to a substitute i braved the doctor's disapproval and went into the game in a pair of long working trousers and a blue flannel shirt the opposing team pennsylvania hailed me as little boy blue and paid no further attention to me so that by good fortune i made a couple of scores then they fell upon me and at the close all i had left was the pants j w powell captain of the ninety seven team tells of the interim between army navy games our head coach was johnny poe he says and he and paul dashell took charge of the squad some of our good men were russ white bill tardy halligan and fisher holding over from the year before a t graham and jerry landis in the line a wild irishman in the plebe class patty shea earned one ed position in short order while a h mccarthy went in at the other wing jack asterson bobby henderson lewis richardson and i made up the backfield in ninety five princeton had developed their famous ends back system which was adopted by johnny poe and the game we played that year was built around this system johnny was a deadly tackler and nearly killed half the team with his system of live tackling practice this was one of the years in which there was no army navy game and our big game was the thanksgiving day contest with lafayette barclay bray and reinhardt made lafayette's name a terror in the football world the game resulted in an eighteen to six victory for lafayette my most vivid recollections of that game are mccarthy's plucky playing with his hand in a plaster cast due to a broken bone stopping barclay and bray repeatedly in spite of this handicap and my own touchdown after a twelve-yard run with reinhardt's two hundred fifty pounds hanging to me most of the way i recall a trip that the princeton team of eighteen ninety eight made to west point it was truly an attack upon the historical old school in a fashion deluxe alex van rensselaer an old princeton football captain invited doc hillebrand to have the tiger eleven meet him that saturday morning at the pennsylvania ferry slip in jersey city en route to west point that morning this old princeton leader met us with his steam yacht the may boyhood enthusiasm ran high as we jumped aboard good fellowship prevailed we lunched on board dressed on board upon our arrival at west point we were met by the academy representative and were driven to the football field the snappy work of the princeton team that day brought victory and we attributed our success to the van rensselaer transport returning that night on the boat doc hillebrand and arthur poe bribed the captain of the may to just miss connecting with the last train to princeton and as a worried manager sat alongside of van rensselaer wondering whether it were not possible to hurry the boat along a little faster van rensselaer himself knew what was in doc's mind and so helped make it possible for us to rest at the murray hill hotel overnight and not allow a railroad trip to princeton more the luxury of the day i have a lot of respect for the football brains of west point my lot has been very happily cast with the navy i have generally been on the opposite side of the field i knew the strength of their team i have learned much of the spirit of the academy from their cheering at army and navy games playing against west point our princeton teams have always realized the hard difficult task which confronted them 
and victory was not always the reward. Football plays a valued part in the athletic life of West Point. From the very first game between the Army and the Navy on the Plains when the Middies were victorious, West Point set out in a thoroughly businesslike way to see that the Navy did not get the lion's share of the victories. If one studies the businesslike methods of the Army Athletic Association and reads carefully the bulletins which are printed after each game, one is impressed by the attention given to details. I have always appreciated what King, 96, meant to West Point football. Let me quote from the publication of the Howitzer in 1896, the estimated value of this player at that time. King, of course, stands first. Captain for two years, he brought West Point from second class directly into first. As fullback, he outplayed every fullback opposed to him and stands in the judgment of all observers second only to Brooke of Pennsylvania. Let us read what King has to say of a period of West Point football not widely known. I first played on the 92 team, he says. We had two Navy games before this, but they were not much as I look back upon them. At this time, we had for practice that period of Saturday afternoon after inspection that gave us from about 3 p.m. on. We also had about 15 minutes between dinner and the afternoon recitations, and such days as were too rainy to drill, and from 5.45 a.m. to 6.05 a.m. Later in the year, when it grew too cold to drill, we had the time after about 4.15 p.m., but it became dark so early that we didn't get much practice. We practiced signals, even by moonlight. Visiting teams used to watch us at inspection, 2 o'clock. We were in tight full dress clothes, standing at attention for 30 to 45 minutes just before the game, a fine preparation for a stiff contest. We had quite a character by the name of Stacy, a Maine boy. He was a thick-set chap, husky and fast. He never knew what it was to be stopped. He would fight it out to the end for every inch. Early in one of the Yale games, he broke a rib and started another, but the more it hurt, the harder he played. In a contest with an athletic club in the last non-collegiate game we ever played, the opposing right tackle was bothering us. In a scrimmage, Stacy twisted the gentleman's nose very severely and then backed away as the man followed him, calling out to the umpire. Stacy held his face up and took two of the nicest punches in the eyes that I ever saw. Of course, the umpire saw it and promptly ruled the puncher out, just as Stacy had planned. Just before the Spanish War, Stacy became ill. Orders were issued that regiments should send officers to the different cities for the purpose of recruiting. He was at this time not fit for field service, so was assigned to this duty. He protested so strongly that in some way he was able to join his regiment in time to go to Cuba with his men. He participated in all the work down there, and when it was over, even he had to give in. He was sent to Montauk Point in very bad shape. He rallied for a time and obtained sick leave. He went to his old home in Maine, where he died. It was his old football grit that kept him going in Cuba until the fighting was over. No mention of West Point's football would be complete without the name of Dennis Michy. He is usually referred to as the father of football at the academy. He was captain of the first two teams we ever had. He played throughout the Navy game in 91 with 10 boils on his back and neck. He was a backfield man and one of West Point's main linebackers. He was most popular as a cadet and officer and was killed in action at San Juan, Cuba. One of the longest runs when both yards and time are considered ever pulled off on a football field was made by Duncan, 95, in our Princeton game of 93. Duncan got the ball on his five-yard line on a fumble and was well under way before he was discovered. Lott, 96, later a captain of cavalry, followed Duncan to interfere from behind. The only Princeton man who sensed trouble was Doggy Trenchard. He set sail in pursuit. He soon caught up with Lott and would have caught Duncan, but for the latter's interference. Duncan finally scored the touchdown, having made the 105 yards in what would have been fast time for a Weffers. We at West Point often speak of Balliot's being obliged to call on Phil King to back him up that day, as Ames, one of our greatest centers, was outplaying him, and of the rage of Phil King, because on every point, 
Nolan, 96, tackled him at once and prevented King from making those phenomenal runs which characterized his playing. Harmon Graves of Yale is a coach who has contributed much to West Point's football. Harmon Graves is too well known as coach to need our praise, says a West Pointer, but it is not only as a successful coach, but as a personal friend that he lives in the heart of every member of the team and indeed the entire corps. There will always be a sunny spot at West Point for Graves. In a recent talk with Harmon Graves, he showed me a beautifully engraved watch presented to him by the Cadet Corps of West Point, a treasure prized. Of the privileged days spent at West Point, Graves writes as follows. Every civilian who has the privilege of working with the officers and cadets at West Point to accomplish some worthy object comes away a far better man than when he went there. I was fortunate enough to be asked by them to help in the establishment of football at the academy, and for many years I gave the best I had and still feel greatly their debtor. At West Point, amateur sport flourishes in its perfection, and a very high standard of accomplishment has been attained in football. There are no cross-cuts to the kind of football success West Point has worked for. It is all a question of merit based on competency, accuracy, and fearless execution. Those of us who have had the privilege of assisting in the development of West Point football have learned much of real value from the officers and cadets about the game and what really counts in the makeup of a successful team. It is fair to say that West Point has contributed a great deal to football generally and has, in spite of many necessary time restrictions, turned out some of the best teams and players in the last 15 years. The greatest credit is due to the Army Officers Athletic Association, which, through its football representatives, started right and then pursued a sound policy which has placed football at West Point on a firm basis, becoming the standing and dignity of the institution. There have been many interesting and amusing incidents in connection with football at West Point, which helped to make up the tradition of the game there and are many times repeated at any gathering of officers and cadets. I well remember when Daly, the former Harvard captain, modestly took his place as a plebe candidate for the team and sat in the front row on the floor of the gymnasium when I explained to the squad and illustrated by the use of a blackboard what he and everyone else there knew was the then Yale defense. There was, perhaps, the suggestion of a smile all around when I began by saying that from then on we were gathered there for West Point and to make its team a success that season and not for the benefit of Harvard or Yale. He told me afterwards that he had never understood the defense as I had explained it. He mastered it and believed in it as he won and kept his place on the team and learned some things from West Point football as we all did. The rivalry with the Navy is wholesome and intense, as it should be. My friend Paul Daschle, who fully shares that feeling, has much to do with the success of the Navy team and the development of football at the Naval Academy. After a West Point victory at Philadelphia, he came to the West Point dressing room and offered his congratulations. As I took his hand, I noted that tears were in his eyes and that his voice shook. The next year, the Navy won, and I returned the call. I was feeling rather grim, but when I found him surrounded by the happy Navy team, he was crying again, and hardly smiled when I offered my congratulation, and told him that it really made no difference which team won, for he cried anyway. The sportsmanship and friendly rivalry which the Army and Navy game brings out in both branches of the service is admirable and unique, and reaches all officers on the day of the game, wherever in the world they are. Real preparedness is an old axiom at West Point, and has been applied to football. There I learned to love my country and respect the manhood and efficiency of the Army officers in a better way than I did before. I recall the seasons I have spent there with gratitude and affection, both for the friends I have made and for the Army spirit. Siding with the Navy has enabled me to know West Point's strength. Any mention of West Point's football would be incomplete without the names of some officers who have not only safeguarded the game at West Point, but have been the able representatives of the Army's football during their service there. Such men are Richmond P. Davis, Palmer E. Pierce, and W. R. Richardson. This is the end of Chapter 13, recorded by Lynn Handler.
Chapter Twelve B of Football Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Football Days by William Edwards. Chapter Twelve, Army and Navy, Part B. The way they have in the army. If there is any one man who has permanently influenced football at West Point, that man is H. J. Kohler, for years master of the sword at the academy. Under his active coaching, some of the Army's finest players were developed. In recent years, he has not been a member of the coaching staff, but he nonetheless never loses touch with the team, and his advice concerning men and methods is always eagerly sought. By virtue of long experience at the academy, and because of an aptitude for analysis of the game itself, he has been invaluable in harmonizing practice and play with peculiar local conditions. Any time the stranger seeks to delve either into the history or the constructive coaching of the game at the academy, the younger men, as well as the older, will always answer your questions by saying, Go ask Kohler. Always a hard worker and serious thinker, he is apt to give an almost nightly demonstration during the season of the foundation principles of the game. Not only West Pointers, but also Yale and Princeton men, who had to face the elevens under Kohler's coaching, will remember Roman, who, had he been kicking in the days of Felton, Mahan, and the other long-distance artillerists, might well have held his own, in the opinion of army men. Nesbitt, Waldron, and Scales were among the other really brilliant players whom Kohler developed. He was in charge of some of the teams that played the hardest schedules in the history of West Point football. One year the cadets met Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Syracuse, and Penn State. Surely this was a season's work calculated to develop remarkable men, or break them in the making. Bettison, center, King Boyers at guard, and Bunker at tackle and half, were among the splendid players who survived this trial by fire. Cassad, Clark, and Phillips made up a backfield that would have been a credit to any of the colleges. Soon, however, the Army's strength was greatly to be augmented by the acquisition of Charles Dudley Daly, fresh from four years of football at Harvard. Reputations made elsewhere do not count for much at West Point. The coaches were glad to have Plebe Daly come out for the squad, but they knew, and he knew quite as well as they, that there are no shortcuts to the big A. Now began a remarkable demonstration of football genius. Not only did the former Harvard captain make the team, but his aid in coaching was also eagerly sought. An unusual move this, but a tribute to the new man. Daly was modesty itself in those days, as he has been ever since, even when equipped with the yellow jacket and peacock feather of the head coach. As player and as coach, and often as the two combined, Daly's connection with West Point football covered eight years, in the course of which he never played on or coached a losing team. His record against the Navy alone is seven victories and one tie, 146 points to 33. His final year's coaching was done in 1915. From West Point he was sent to Hawaii, whence he writes me as follows. There are certain episodes in the game that have always been of particular interest to me, such as Eli's game-playing with broken ribs in the Harvard-Yale game of 1898, Charlie DeSalle's great playing with a sprained ankle in the Yale-Princeton game of the same year, the tackling of Bunker by Long of the Navy in the Army-Navy game of 1902, the hardest tackle I have ever seen, and the daring quarterback work of Johnny Cutler in the Harvard-Dartmouth 1908 game, when he snatched victory from defeat in the last few minutes of play. Undoubtedly, Daly's deep study of strategy and tactics, as used in warfare, had a great deal to do with his continued ascendancy as a coach. Writing to Herbert Reed, one of the pencil-and-paper football men, with whom he had many a long argument over the generalship of the game, he said in part, Football within the limitations of the rules and sportsmanship is a war game, Either by force or by deception, it advances through the opposition to the goal line, which might be considered the capital of the enemy. It was in Daly's first year that a huge southerner with a pleasant drawl turned up in the plebe class, 
It was a foregone conclusion almost on sight that Ernest, better known to football men throughout the country as Pot Graves, would make the eleven. He not only played the game almost flawlessly from the start, but he made so thorough a study of line play in general that his system, even down to the most intimate details of face-to-face -face coaching, filed away for all time in that secret library of football methods at West Point, has come to be known as Graves' Bible. Daly, still with that inextricable love for his own alma mater, lent a page or two from this tome to Harvard, and even the author appeared in person on Soldier's Field. The manner in which Graves made personal demonstration of his teachings will not soon be forgotten by the Harvard men who had to face Pot Graves. Graves has always believed in the force mentioned in Daly's few lines quoted above on the subject of military methods as applied to football. While always declaring that the gridiron was no place for a fist fight, he always maintained that stalwarts should be allowed to fight it out with as little interference by rule as possible. As a matter of fact, Graves was badly injured in a game with Yale, and for a long time afterwards hobbled around with a troublesome knee. He knew the man who did it, but would never tell his name, and he contents himself with saying, I have no ill will. He got me first. If he hadn't, I would have got him. A story is told of Graves' impatience with the members of a little luncheon party, who in the course of an argument on the new football, were getting away from the fundamentals. Rising and stepping over the window of the officers' club, he said with a sleepy smile, Come here a minute, you fellows and pointing down to the roadway added there's my team looking out of the window the other members of the party saw a huge steamroller snorting and puffing up the hill among the men who played football with graves and were indeed of his type were doe and bunker like graves bunker in spite of his great weight was fast enough to play in the backfield in those years when the army elevens were relying so much upon terrific power those were the days when substitutes had very little opportunity. In the final Navy game of 1902, the same eleven men played for the Army from start to finish. In this period of Army football, other first-class men were developed, notably Torney, a remarkable back, Thompson, a guard, and Tom Hammond, who was later to make a reputation as an end coach. Bunker was still with this aggregation, an eleven that marched fifty yards for a touchdown in fifteen plays against the midshipmen. The Army was among the early Eastern teams to test Eastern football methods against those of the West, the cadets defeating a team from the University of Chicago on the Plains. The West Pointers had only one criticism to make of their visitors, and it was laconically put by one of the backs who said, They're all fired fast but it's funny how they stop when you tackle them. In this lineup was A.C. Tipton, at center, to whom belongs the honor of forcing the Rules Committee to change the code in one particular, in order to stop a maneuver which he invented while in mid-career in a big game. No one will ever forget how, when chasing a loose ball and realizing that he had no chance to pick it up, he kicked it again and again until it crossed the final chalk mark, where he fell on it for a touchdown. Tipton was something of a wrestler, too, as a certain Japanese expert in the art of jiu-jitsu can testify, and indeed did testify on the spot after the doctors had brought him to. There was no lowering of the standards in the succeeding years, which saw the development of players like Hackett, Prince, Farnsworth, and Davis. Those years, too, saw the rise of such wonderful forwards as W. W. Red Irwin and that huge man from Alaska, D. D. Pullen. Coming now to more recent times, the coaching was turned over to H. M. Nelly, assisted by Joseph W. Beecham, fresh from chasing the little brown brother in the Philippines. Beecham had made a great reputation at Cornell, and there was evidence that he had kept up with the game at least in the matter of strategic possibilities, even while in the tangled jungle of Luzon. He brought with him even more than that an uncanny ability to see through the machinery of the team and pick out its human qualities upon which he never neglected to play there have been few coaches closer to his men than joe whenever i talk football with joe beecham he never forgets to mention von cooper to whom he gives a large share of the credit for the good work of his elevens cooper was of the quiet type whose specialty was defense these two made a great team 
It was in this period that West Point saw the development of one of its greatest field generals. There was nothing impressive in the physical appearance of little H. L. Hyatt. A reasonably good man, ball in hand, his greatest value lay in his headwork. As the West Point trainer said one day, I've got him all bandaged up like a leg in a puttee, but from the neck up, he's a piece of ice. The charts of games in which Hyatt ran the team are set before the squad each year as examples not merely of perfect generalship, but of the proper time to violate that generalship and make it go, a distinction shared by Pritchard, who followed in his footsteps with added touches of his own. One cannot mention Pritchard's name without thinking at once of Merlat, who, with Pritchard, formed one of the finest forward-passing combinations the game has seen. Both at Franklin Field and at the Polo Grounds, this pair brought woe to the Navy. These stars had able assistance in the persons of McEwen, one of the greatest centers the game has seen and who was chosen to lead the team in 1916, Wayand, Nyland, and O'Hare among the forwards, and the brilliant and sturdy Oliphant in the backfield, the man whose slashing play against the Navy in 1915 will never be forgotten. Oliphant was of a most unusual type. Even when he was doing the heaviest damage to the Navy Corps, the midshipman could not but admire his wonderful work. What the hustlers are to Annapolis, the Cullum Hall team is to West Point. It is made up of the leftovers from the first squad and substitutes. One would travel far afield in search of a team with more spirit and greater pep in action, whether playing in outside games, or as their coach would put it, showing up the first eleven. Not infrequently, a player of the highest caliber is developed in this squad and taken to the first eleven. The Cullum Hall squad, whose eleven generally manages to clean up some of the strongest school teams of the Hudson Valley, draws not a little of its spirit, I think, from the late Lieutenant E. M. Zell, better known at the Academy as Joby. It was a treat to see the Cullum Hall team marching down the field against the first eleven with the roly-poly figure of Joby in the thick of every scrimmage, coaching at the top of his lungs even when bowled over by the interference of his own pupils. Since his time, the squad has been turned over to Lieutenants Selleck and Crawford, who have kept alive the traditions and the playing spirit of this unique organization. Their reward for the bruising hard work, with hardly a shadow of the hope of getting their letter, comes in seeing the great game itself. Like the college scrub teams, the hardest rooters for the varsity are to be found in their ranks. Now for the game itself. Always hard fought, always well fought. There is perhaps no clash of all the years that so wakes the interest of the general public, that vast throng which, without college affiliations, is nevertheless hungry for the right of allegiance somewhere, somehow. While the service elevens are superbly supported by the men who have been through the exacting mill at West Point and Annapolis, their sweethearts and wives, not to mention sisters, cousins, uncles, and aunts, they are urged on to battle by that great impartial public, which believes that in a sense these two teams belong to it. It is not uncommon to find men who have had no connection with either academy in hot argument as to the relative merits of the teams. Once in the stands, some apparently trifling thing begets a partnership that this class of spectator is wont to wonder at after it is all over. Whether in Philadelphia, in the earlier history of these contests on neutral ground, or in New York, Army and Navy Day has become, by tacit consent, the nearest thing to a real gridiron holiday. For the civilian who has been starved for thrilling action and the chance to cheer through the autumn days, the jam at the hotels used as headquarters by the followers of the two elevens satisfies a yearning that he has hitherto been unable to define. There, too, is found a host of old-time college football men and coaches who hold reunion and sometimes even bury hatchets. Making his way through the crowds and jogging elbows with the heroes of a sport that he understands only as organized combat, he becomes obsessed with the spirit of the two fighting institutions. Once in possession of the coveted ticket, he hies himself to the field as early as possible, if he is wise, in order to enjoy the preliminaries which are unlike those at any other game. Soon his heart beats faster, attuned to the sound of tramping feet without the gates. The measured cadence swells draws nearer, and the thousands rise as one when first the long gray column and then the solid ranks of blue swing out upon the field. 
the precision of the thing the realization that order and system can go so far as to hold in check to the last moment the enthusiasms of these youngsters thrills him to the core then suddenly gray ranks and blue alike break for the stands there to cut loose such a volume of now orderly now merely frenzied noise as never before smote his ears it is inspiration and it is novelty the time the place and the men that wake the loyalty dormant in every man which sad to say so seldom has a chance of expression around the field are ranged diplomat dignitary of whatsoever rank both native and foreign in common with those who came to see as well as to be seen and who does not boast of having been to the army navy game they rise uncovered as the only official non-partisan of football history enters the gates the president of the united states throughout one half of the game he lends his support to one academy and in the intermission makes triumphal progress across the field welcomed on his arrival by a din of shouting surpassing all previous effort there to support their side it is perhaps one of those blessed hours in the life of a man upon whom the white light so piteously beats when he can indulge in the popular sport to him so long denied of being merely human men methods moods pass on the years roll by taking toll of every one of us from highest to lowest yet whether we are absorbed in the game of games or whether we look upon it as so many needs must merely as a spectacle the army navy game will remain a milestone never to be uprooted i have spoken elsewhere and at length of football traditions the army navy game is not merely a football tradition but an american institution it is for all the people every time may this great game go on forever serene in its power to bring out the best that is in us and when the great bugler sounds the silver-sweet call of taps for all too many there will still be those who in their turn will answer the call of reveille to carry on the traditions of the great day that was ours End of chapter twelve part b recording by patty cunningham